Why in the world do Russian tanks keep doing this? Since the start of the war in Ukraine, the West has discovered a critical vulnerability in Russian tanks. But the reason why Russian tanks keep blowing their tops comes down to two reasons, and they're both pretty dumb. The mighty T-72 and T-80 were developed to take on Western tanks in a nuclear battlefield on a NATO versus Warsaw Pact grudge match to the death. The winner would inherit an irradiated world, and the future of the global wasteland could only be one of two things, a capitalist utopia with a McDonald's in every super mutant camp, or communist workers' paradise, where you and all your ghoul friends would own the means of production. In the inevitable struggle for the fate of all humanity, both sides knew that it would come down to a slugfest between their mightiest tanks. The West took one approach to tank design, the Soviet Union took a different, far dumber approach. For the West, it was all about technology, with Eastern Europe giving every citizen the option of either queuing up for the most basic necessities or serving in the army. The Soviet bloc fielded a terrifyingly massive army that the West simply couldn't match. To neutralize the Soviet numbers, the West decided that it would double down on technology and pack its tanks with as many fancy sensors, the most sophisticated armor, ultra-smart firing computers, and tea kettles. Looking at you, Britain. This resulted in some of the most legendary tanks ever built. Names you might recognize today, like the M1 Abrams, the British Challenger, and the German Leopard. The Soviets looked at Western tanks and said, Niet, manpower is cheap. Quality is better than quantity anyway and then decided to take an altogether different approach. Rather than field technologically comparable tanks, the Soviets would instead focus on making many tanks, thousands upon thousands of tanks, because to the Soviet Union there wasn't a problem in the world that couldn't be solved with the application of judicious levels of tanks and armored personnel carriers, especially pesky little things like revolutions by citizens yearning to be free of the Soviet yoke. Now, to be fair, the Soviets were sort of forced to make many cheap tanks, as they were typically several steps behind the West in the development of different key technologies. Thus, the Stalin adage of quantity is a quality all its own was adopted, and when asked how many tanks he wanted, each Soviet premier simply kept answering yes. But what's this got to do with Russian tanks taking gold at the turret-tossing Olympics today? In the West, crew survivability was given a premium, however Soviet forces were almost expendable by design. Russia's notoriously poor logistics aren't just a modern accident, it's basically baked into the post-Russian military. The Soviet military also suffered from bad logistics. To this day, Russian forces still haven't palletized their supplies, meaning instead of using forklifts to move large amounts of conveniently packaged supplies around, they do it pretty much by hand in boxes. In the Soviet playbook, they figured they were going to take massive losses anyway, so why bother keeping units resupplied? Private Conscriptovich and his mates would fight until they were either dead, out of ammo, or both. If they managed to limp back to friendly lines, then great, they could do it all again tomorrow. Thus, when some Soviet engineer pointed out a critical design flaw in Soviet tanks that would end with the crew dead or exploded into orbit, he was promptly ignored. In order to protect the crew, Western tanks included blowout panels for the tank's onboard store ammo. That way, in case of a direct hit to the vulnerable ammo storage, the resulting explosion would be funneled via the blowout panel harmlessly out of the tank. Designers were happy, crews were happy, nobody got turned into an involuntary astronaut. The Soviets saw the design of blowout panels and said, hold my potato vodka. Not only did they decide not to include blowout panels, they basically did everything they could to turn every single Soviet tank crew into volunteer cosmonauts. The West has also made some confounding moves themselves, like the Germans deciding the best place for their ammo storage was in the left front of the tank. Now, on one hand, this kind of makes sense. The front of the tank is the most heavily armored and thus the most likely to survive a direct hit. On the other hand, tanks are meant to drive head on to enemy fire, so we think you see the problem here. The Leopard's armor is rated to survive at least one, possibly two hits in near vicinity to the same spot from anything Russia can throw at it. But at the same time, any penetration to the front left flank of the tank is going to result in the driver probably getting turned into overcoat bratwurst. However, the Soviets took the cake in terrible design decisions. If the West could endanger one of their tank crew's members, well, then by Stalin's whiskers, the Soviets could do better and just straight up murder their entire crew. Thus, the Soviets decided to put their ammunition basically ringing the turret floor, in effect seating most of the tank's crew directly over the highly explosive ammunition. This has termed the fatal design flaw the jack-in-the-box flaw. 
because the moment that ammo cooks off, the tank commander and one other crew member are going to enjoy a brief but very intense career in the Soviet Air Force. But the design does make some amount of sense. Placing the ammunition low and centrally to the tank means it's best protected from penetration at any angle. Ammo stored in the turret itself is vulnerable to rear or flank shots, while the position of ammunition low in the tank and center to the body itself means it's much less likely to take a direct hit. However, the widespread use of two different weapons has turned this carousel system into a hilarious spring-loaded death trap for modern Russian crews. The first is the use of anti-tank guided missiles. In the old days, anti-tank missiles would try to bore straight through the tank armor itself to kill the crew inside. Today, though, ATGMs instead are usually fired in high trajectories that see them come down on the tank from above forming an explosively shaped penetrator milliseconds before impact that disables the tank. Surprisingly, while the tank commander is usually toast, the rest of the crew has a chance of surviving, as explosively formed penetrators or EFPs are not explosive themselves. It's meant to simply tear into the tank and disable the turret as well as destroy mechanical and electronic components in the way. Because tanks can't be well armored from everywhere or they'd be so heavy they can barely move, tank designers have been historically forced to sacrifice armor plating on the top of the tank, which is statistically the least likely part of a tank to get hit. However, having a superheated slug of explosively shaped metal tearing into your tank from above directly over the turret has obvious implications for any tank where the ammunition is stored directly under the turret. The second weapon being used in Ukraine are large anti-tank mines, which are designed to detect the vibration of tank treads and after a short delay, fire an explosive blast upwards. Once more, the underside of the tank is not very well armored, because if other tanks are firing at the bottom of your tank, you've done something terribly, terribly wrong. But tanks are designed to literally drive over minefields, so they do have some protection from mines, which is why anti-tank mines are between 5 to 10 times the size of an anti-personnel mine. And here we can see the problem with Russian tanks again, because in essence you're having an explosion go off directly under your ammo storage. While the crew is likely to survive rolling over an anti-tank mine, even if their tank is probably going to be disabled, there's little hope for survival when your tush is just inches away from dozens of pounds of explosive primer. Russia is aggressively winning the turret toss Olympics in Ukraine, with some turrets calculated to have been blown as high as 250 feet in the air. Turrets have been even found lodged in the upper floors of Ukrainian apartment buildings. But it's not just bad design, it's the Russians just being bad at war in general. Tanks are pretty terrifying things. If you've never been around one, having 70 plus ton armored behemoths thundering past you is pretty terrifying, even if they're on your side. They're meant to take the worst punishment an enemy can dish out, then break the teeth of enemy defenses while shoving themselves down the enemy's throat. But in modern war, tanks have a pretty bad allergy to anti-tank guided missiles, and the primary destroyer of Russian tanks in Ukraine has been manned portable ATGMs. It isn't a threat unique to Russia. During both invasions of Iraq, US and coalition tanks faced the threat of ATGMs, and yet for some reason Western tank crews didn't become voluntary astronauts during the conflict. And that's because of infantry, as the best way to protect tanks from enemy infantry with anti-tank missiles is not more tanks. Seriously, Russia, get with the program, and yes, we're talking about you, Terminator. In the West, armored assaults are backed up with infantry, whose job is to neutralize enemy anti-tank teams. Yet, despite learning absolutely nothing from having their tanks and BMPs absolutely wrecked by Chechnya in the First Chechen War, Russia continues to fail to use infantry and armor side by side. Actually, we take that back. Russia did learn something from losing hundreds of tanks and armored vehicles to a rebel force with none of their own, and it was to build even more tanks to protect their tanks. Once more, here's looking at you, Terminator. Without infantry support, Russian tanks have been getting mauled by Western ATGMs, and the only reason that Russia's attempts to break turret-tossing world records have slowed down in recent months is not because they've learned their lesson, but because reports from the Ukrainian frontline state that the Russians are having to consolidate the remaining tanks and use them only sparingly. In the US Marines, there's a saying, every Marine, despite their job, is a rifleman. In Russia, thanks to bad design, every tanker is also, briefly, an airman. 24 hours before launch. Russia has threatened NATO to cease providing Ukraine with weapons and ammunition for weeks, and at last it's made good on its promise to take military action against any NATO convoys bringing such aid into the country. Just inside the Ukrainian border, a convoy of NATO vehicles is strafed by two Russian Su-25s. The unarmed transports are decimated by gunfire and rockets deployed by the Russian jets. There are no survivors. 23 hours before launch. 
Verification of the deserted convoy has finally reached the desk of the President of the United States. The convoy was being manned by Polish soldiers who'd help their Ukrainian counterparts unload American C-130s and pack up the much-needed war supplies inside of Polish territory. The shipment of modern weapons was safe as long as it remained outside of Ukraine, but immediately upon crossing the border, Russia declared it a legal military target. Now the President of the US has a very difficult decision to make, and he immediately sets up a secure call with the heads of several NATO nations. 19 hours 24 minutes before launch Earlier in the war, NATO warned Russia that an attack on any of its convoys would constitute an Article 5 response. After a lengthy and heated discussion, the United States, Great Britain, France, Spain, Norway, Germany, and Poland all invoke Article 5 of the alliance. An attack on one is an attack on all. Other NATO members are being brought up to date as their leadership is being informed of the attack. Because the attack was not directly inside NATO territory, some members of the alliance, like Turkey, are having serious reservations. Two hours before launch the United States, Great Britain, France, Poland, and Germany have all been prepared for the possibility of an attack by Russia either into Poland or on Polish transports and logistics personnel assisting the Ukrainians. The five states decide to send Russia a strong message, and combat planes kept on alert for such an eventuality have been taking to the skies already for the last half hour. A massive lightning strike force of NATO planes is approaching various Russian military targets in Kaliningrad, Ukraine, and even along Russian borders itself one hour, 18 minutes before launch. NATO planes overwhelm Russian defenses, who are completely unprepared for NATO's massive response. The attack purposely avoids striking Russian troop concentrations and instead lays waste to supply and fuel depots, runways, logistics hubs, and air defense sites. The Russian military giant has proved itself to be clumsy and inept in modern combat. And while a few NATO jets are lost to Russian air defenses, the attack is an overwhelming success. It's hoped that the attack will be enough to deter Russia from further aggression, and the targets were specifically picked in order to avoid large casualties for just this reason. NATO is still hoping to avoid all-out war with Russia, but the attack against a Polish convoy carrying NATO weapons simply cannot be ignored. 19 minutes before launch Reports of NATO airstrikes have been rolling into Russia's general staff for the last hour and eight minutes. The attack was a complete and total humiliation for Russia, as its much-vaunted air defense network was easily suppressed by a massive quantity of highly capable NATO planes. The resulting chaos has produced few military casualties, but opened up serious vulnerability gaps along the Russian border, inviting further incursion of NATO air power. Perhaps worst of all, it's shown that the nation cannot simply match the overpowering technological and doctrinal superiority of NATO's professional militaries. But the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, has been prepared for this. He has only one last card left to play. The only thing keeping NATO from absolutely steamrolling his forces in Ukraine and relegating Russia to a third-rate world power for the next century – nuclear weapons. Putin will send a message of his own. If he fails to, NATO will understand that it has near-complete impunity to attack Russia from the air by exploiting the gaps it created in its first assault along the Russian air defense network. An aide rushes over to President Putin carrying the Cheget, Russia's equivalent to the nuclear football. Much like the American version, the Cheget carries inside of it sealed authorization codes that relay President Putin's orders to his general staff. Putin selects his desired option and transmits the code to the general staff. The signal is uplinked directly to the Kafka's secret communications network that links the senior-most Russian leadership together. Verified as authentic by the general staff, which had already been gathered beforehand, the signal is then relayed directly to local weapons commanders. This is one of two ways for Russia to launch its nuclear arsenal, the second being its dead hand or perimeter system. This command system allows Russia to launch its nukes even if its entire senior leadership is eliminated in one sudden decapitation strike. Dead Hand was developed in response to US advances in submarine-launched nuclear weapons, which in the 1980s became capable of the precision required for a decapitation strike with only a three-minute warning thanks to the Trident D-5. Using a network of seismic light radioactivity and pressure sensors, Dead Hand can trigger a full-scale retaliatory response even if the entire senior Russian leadership is annihilated in one strike. To get the alert out, a specially modified ICBM is launched which carries a powerful transmitter instead of a nuke and relays a mass launch order across the entire Russian nuclear triad. 13 minutes before launch A single launch order has been relayed to an RS-12M1 Topol M ICBM unit. The road mobile launcher is harder to destroy in a first strike than ICBMs based on static missile fields, and this particular missile is based far in Russia's east, inside the Kamchatka Peninsula. 
The missile is already resting in an erected launch configuration, so it only takes a crew a few minutes to authenticate the order and make last-minute preparations for launch. When everything's ready to go, the launch order is given by the senior launch officer as the crew seeks shelter behind a rocky outcropping in case the aging missile experiences a launch failure. Russia's nuclear arsenal is getting into ever-worsening disrepair as the years go by, and the Russian Federation tries to live up to the old glory of the Soviet Union. Launch The cone at the top of the Tobol M container is blown off by a series of small explosive charges. Then the massive missile roars to life. The solid-fuel rocket shudders as its engine comes online and lifts the 104,000-pound missile into the sky. Even as it's lifting off, the missile's guidance computer begins to connect to Russia's GLONASS satellite network. It's guided by both the inertial guidance and GLONASS satellite uplink, giving it some of the greatest precision of any missiles in the Russian arsenal. Uplink to GLONASS is critical, as the Topol M isn't targeting a major city, which it could achieve with fair but not precision accuracy with only its inertial guidance systems. Instead, the Russian nuclear missile is targeting an American carrier strike group currently in transit south of Japan. Russia aims to teach the US a lesson with the only weapon it can effectively bring to bear against its military superpower. 15 seconds after launch Just 15 seconds after launch, a satellite belonging to the United States space-based infrared system detects the massive thermal signature of a large rocket lifting off into the sky. US early warning satellites have been extremely good at detecting missile launches and have even been used to track the launch of much smaller cruise missiles in Russia's conflicts in Ukraine and Syria. The massive Topol M rocket lights up the early warning satellite's thermal sensor like a blowtorch in the middle of a blizzard. The satellite immediately links up with multiple American Milstar satellites and sends a flash alert to the second space warning squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado, as well as other units across the entire web of the US missile defense. 25 seconds after launch Punching through cloud cover, the eyes of multiple American early warning satellites are picking up the telltale thermal plume of a massive intercontinental ballistic missile. Internally, the satellites compare the thermal plume and other telemetry, such as speed, to positively identify the Russian missile as a Topol M. 30 seconds after launch. The Russian missile is now entering the upper atmosphere in a highly inclined trajectory. To watching satellites, this is indicative of a strike somewhere far closer to Russian shores than the American homeland. The missile is also moving in the wrong direction for a strike in the US, as in that case it should be moving north to fly over the Arctic Circle. 1 minute 15 seconds after launch. The President of the United States has been made aware of the missile launch. America's space-based surveillance network confirms no additional launches. New telemetry also confirms that this missile is not being fired toward the American homeland. There is hope that this is simply a show of strength, an unannounced missile test with a dummy payload. However, the trajectory of the missile leaves Japan and the US base in Guam under threat. 1 minute 45 seconds after launch. An emergency alert is broadcast via Milstar satellites to every combat command and deployed carrier strike group around the world. Ballistic missile defenses are activated in Japan and Guam, as the Japanese Prime Minister is being alerted to the threat. However, the missile's trajectory makes it very unlikely that a strike is incoming toward the Japanese islands. Guam is a suspected target, but so is a transient carrier strike group even now crossing south of Japan toward the South China Sea for routine freedom of navigation exercises. If the strike is against the US carrier, there are only minutes for it to prepare to defend itself against a nuclear attack. 2 minutes 33 seconds after launch. The gravity of the threat has been relayed to the transiting American carrier and her escorts. Orders are immediately given for the ships in the formation to begin to spread out and put even more distance than normal between themselves. This is so that a strike against the group may damage most of the ships but actually only sink a few. 3 minutes after launch. Jets are ordered to be cleared from the deck of the carrier and rushed below. It's a lengthy process to move a combat aircraft from the deck of a carrier to below decks via the massive aircraft elevators, and unlikely that more than one or two planes could be successfully transferred from a busy deck to below. But all attempts to minimize the loss of personnel and all valuable aircraft must be made. Any non-essential crew to the current threat is ordered to brace. Damage control teams are ordered to begin to assemble. Even a glancing blow will likely still cause significant damage to the ship. 3 minutes 22 seconds after launch. The carrier's Aegis-equipped missile cruiser begins preparations for a ballistic missile defense. Its powerful AN SPY-1 radar begins sweeping the skies above for the incoming threat, though for now the missile is still far outside of its detection capabilities. 6 minutes 41 seconds after launch. Nearly 7 minutes after launch, the Topolim missile separates the warhead delivery vehicle from the tree stage rocket. This now splits open in a cloud of chaff meant to confuse American radar, 
and four warheads are jettisoned. Only one of the warheads is real. The other three are cleverly designed decoys meant to lure in interceptors and allow the real warhead to hit its target. The Russian missile has been experiencing some difficulties to date, however. American electronic attacks against the GLONASS system as well as space-based radar satellites have forced the missile to rely largely on inertial guidance as it makes its way to the last known location of the carrier strike group. Given that the carrier now has increased to its classified top speed, estimated to be well over 30 knots, this missile's accuracy is decreasing by the minute, 6 minutes 43 seconds after launch. American space-based satellites blast the cloud of chaff hiding the three decoys and one real warhead with high-powered radar, as powerful computers crunch through the data to work to reduce the effect of electronic noise created by the highly reflective chaff. In a few seconds, they have the telltale signature of at least four warheads. Using classified sensor technologies, the American satellites attempt to discern the real warhead from the fakes by measuring very subtle variations in the four warheads. Luckily, the Aegis missile defense cruiser waiting below has numerous interceptors ready to defend the strike group. But time will be of the essence, and the task of intercepting a ballistic missile is still incredibly difficult. In testing under realistic conditions, U.S. missile defenses have had a spotty record to date. Another spot on that record today will mean the death of thousands and the loss of over $15 billion in military hardware, 8 minutes 33 seconds after launch. The warheads have only a short flight time in space due to the proximity of the launcher versus its target, which is adding to the difficulty in interception. Data is of the greatest importance in successful missile interception, and gathering data takes time, time which is officially about to run out. The warheads begin their terminal descent down into the atmosphere. The Aegis cruiser's powerful Spy-1 RAR lights them up from below. On the ship's deck, multiple SM-6 missiles fire off into the pre-dawn sky. A few seconds later, a second volley of missiles lights up, followed a few seconds later by yet a third. The cruiser is taking zero chances and maximizing its odds of successful interception with multiple volleys. If they fail, thousands of sailors will die. 9 minutes 55 seconds after launch. The ship's ANSPG-62 X-band radar illuminates the incoming warheads and helps provide terminal guidance to the SM-6 interceptors. The ability to directly network with both seaborne and space-based sensors allowed the Aegis cruiser to cut through most of the electronic noise caused by the massive cloud of chaff released as a countermeasure. There are still doubts about which warhead is the real target, and thus each warhead is assigned multiple interceptors. This increases the chances of targeting the right warhead but reduces the chances of successfully intercepting it. The crew holds its breath as the incoming tracks quickly merge with the ship's defenses, 10 minutes 5 seconds after launch. Closing in at a speed of 1,700 meters a second, the first wave of interceptors managed to knock out one of the decoys with a near hit by the SM-6's explosive fragmentation warhead. The warhead suffers severe structural damage from the shrapnel and explosion and tumbles out of control at thousands of miles an hour, destroying itself in the lower atmosphere. 10 minutes 9 seconds after launch, the second volley of SM-6 missiles failed to hit a single target. 10 minutes 13 seconds after launch, the third volley of interceptors knock out a second dummy warhead. 10 minutes 15 seconds after launch, 60 miles below the two incoming warheads, there is no way for the strike group's crews to know if they've knocked out a real warhead or only dummies. Orders have already been given for all to brace for impact and damage control crews are on standby to immediately pounce on any fires or see to fixing hull breaches and flooding. 10 minutes 20 seconds after launch, a massive fireball explodes 3,000 meters above the sea somewhere south of Japan. The massive explosion sends out a wave of electromagnetic and thermal radiation that temporarily overpowers satellite sensors. Gradually, the noise fades and these electronic eyes in the sky begin to frantically scan for signs of the strike group. The strike has been off by just over a mile meaning that the carrier strike group has avoided the most lethal part of the nuclear attack. However, a massive pressure wave slams into the strike group and causes moderate structural damage. On the big carrier, most of the planes left on the deck, even though secured by tie-downs, are blown off and into the ocean by the hurricane gale winds smashing into the strike group. With crews ordered below decks, the initial release of radiation is largely harmless to the strike group's personnel. This is helped by the fact that the strike group was just outside the most lethal radius of the nuclear explosion. Despite this, numerous crew are killed across the strike group from the effect of the pressure wave. Several of the ships are flooding, but damage control crews are already on their way to enact repairs. Compartments too damaged for effective flood control are simply sealed off to keep the rest of the ship from also flooding. This dooms several sailors to a drowning death as their comrades make the impossible choice of trapping them inside flooding sections in order to save the ship. The Russian nuclear strike has effectively rendered an entire strike group combat ineffective, 
as the ships must now limp to the nearest friendly port for immediate repairs. Decontamination must also be undertaken even before the ships arrive at port, and damage to the flight deck of the carrier repaired to make air operations impossible. However, things could have been far worse if Russia had used more than one missile, as they would in a serious attempt at sinking an American carrier and her accompanying escorts. The fact that Russian nuclear command and control systems as well as their space surveillance and guidance and even the missiles themselves are in great disrepair helped limit possible damage as well. Russian guidance networks such as GLONASS are very vulnerable to disruption, making Russian weapons far from precise. Despite only suffering moderate damage, however, Russia has just launched a nuclear weapon against the armed forces of the United States of America. A full NATO Article 5 response is now inevitable, as is a state of war against a greatly outmatched Russian Federation. Faced with the certainty of losing a war against superior NATO forces, President Vladimir Putin must now contemplate expanding the use of nuclear weapons to defend his hold on power inside the Kremlin and fend off NATO attacks. Yet in the American White House, the President of the United States is now even reviewing options for a similar attack against a Russian military facility. The world stands on the brink of full-scale nuclear war in what might be the greatest and final conflict of the human race. A NATO airborne early warning aircraft flies slow, lazy patrols over the northern Polish border. Suddenly, at a distance of several hundred miles, it picks up the unmistakable radar return of a Russian fighter. The aircraft is closing fast at supersonic speeds, which puts it only minutes away from getting a good weapons lock on the big AWACS aircraft. The plane immediately banks and turns to put distance between itself and the Russian fighter. Simultaneously, an alert is issued to Poland's air defense network. A patrol of American F-15s have been in the air for three hours, flying a deterrent patrol, and are immediately vectored in. An alarm is sounded in the alert lounge of a Polish aircrew station on standby, and the two pilots rush to strap on their flight gear as the F-16s are prepped for flight. Since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Poland has kept air crews on alert just in case of further Russian aggression. Meanwhile, the F-16's wing pylons are loaded with live air-to-air -air missiles. Within minutes, the pilots are climbing into their F-16s and screaming into the sky, ready to support their American allies. Thousands of feet in the sky and over a hundred miles to the north, the big American F-15s are now picking up the unknown contact, presumed to be Russian, on their own radars. The F-15s are speeding toward the unknown contact, gaining airspeed so as to retain the advantage should this turn into a hostile encounter. The Russians have the distance advantage, with the R-77 Beyond Visual Range missile exceeding the range of the American AIM-120s by about 10 miles. However, the American fighters have better sensors, ensuring a higher probability of a kill, even if doing so requires putting themselves inside the kill envelope of the Russian fighter. There's a chance the Russian fighter is armed with R-37Ms with a range of over 300 kilometers. In that case, the F-15s will be well inside the Russian threat envelope in minutes, though the missiles are primarily meant to target less maneuverable aircraft such as the AWACS and tankers. The nimble F-15s would be a hard kill for the bulky R-37Ms. On the ground, the NATO AWACS plane sends targeting data to Patriot batteries stationed toward the north of Poland. While the Russian fighter is not yet within range of high-resolution targeting radar, the ability to link up with airborne assets makes Patriot air defense batteries deadly to interloping aircraft even at long ranges. Soon, Poland's Aegis Ashore facility will be online and bring the same powerful tracking and targeting capabilities of the most advanced Aegis systems to ground-based air defenses. However, the facility is not yet complete after four years of construction delays. As a very likely target for Russian air or missile strikes, though, it is well protected by a ring of air defenses just in case the Russians seek to neutralize the multi-million dollar facility before it's online and able to defend itself. The intercepting F-15s attempt radio contact with the Russian fighter, which is now identified as a Su-35, one of Russia's more capable fighters. The American Air Patrol warns the Su-35 that it's approaching Polish airspace and that it must turn back before crossing. The situation is tense, but not overly so. Russia is fond of pushing NATO's buttons by coming close to but not actually crossing into NATO airspace. In the Baltics, though, where NATO forces are weaker, Russian aircraft will occasionally and briefly cross into NATO airspace, only to shortly exit soon after. It's a common provocation that's picked up intensity over the last decades as relations between Russia and NATO have deteriorated. Using afterburners, the Polish F-16s are now in a position to support the American allies if necessary, though the plane seems to be taking no hostile actions. Its altitude and speed remain steady around 32,000 feet. 
If it was truly preparing to threaten the American F-15s, it would climb for altitude in order to give its missiles a height and speed advantage. Where the atmosphere is thinner, air-to-air -air missiles can travel faster for longer due to a lack of air resistance. Plus, once their fuel is spent, they can pounce on targets below, building additional speed from their downward trajectory. That's why in air-to-air -air engagements, modern missiles first perform steep upward climbs, gaining thousands of feet in altitude versus their targets before pouncing on them from above. The F-15s make it clear they mean business by climbing altitude, though the Russian plane remains on course. There's no response in their radio hails, again, this is fairly routine. For now, the Russian Su-35 is in Belarusian airspace. After the war in Ukraine began, Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko has allowed Russia to base pretty much any forces it wanted inside the former Soviet Republic. This has dramatically increased the frequency of air encounters between NATO and Russian air forces near Poland's northeast border. Though rare, NATO has even shadowed Russian aircraft flying strike missions into northwest Ukraine from just across the border. As the distance to the Polish border shrinks, the F-15s change their course, turning their noses toward the Su-35. This lets the Russians know that the Americans are looking straight down the barrel at them in an optimal targeting angle for their electronically scanned array radars, which guide missiles to their target. While the F-15s radars can still guide missiles to target at a variety of angles, the head-on angle is optimal and lets the Russians know that the Americans aren't messing around. Any sign of hostility will be met with immediate and lethal force. Now with the airspeed and height advantage, and well within the threat envelope of the Eagle's AIM-120's AMRAMs, the Russian Su-35 is in dire straits if it decides it wants to pick a fight. To make matters worse, ground-based air defenses are now in the game. Patriot air defense batteries use their powerful AN-MPQ-65 radars to track and target the Russian fighter. The big phased array radar provides the Patriot system with classified range, believed to be in excess of 100 kilometers. It's a formidable air defense radar that uses a second traveling wave tube to boost the strength of the signal. This makes the AN-MPQ-65 difficult to jam or spoof, even at a long range. The attack network to the U.S. military's Link-16 command and control network allows the Patriot battery to share information with a vast array of U.S. assets. Software upgrades throughout the 2000s and 2010s give the Patriot a greater capability to conduct TBM, or theater ballistic missile searches, a necessity spurred on by the growing danger from long-range ballistic missiles fielded by both Russia and China. The system can also engage targets at predetermined altitudes so as to neutralize the effects of chemical weapons or early release submunitions, which would otherwise be released across a wide area. The combination of software and radar is even able to tell if a contact is manned or unmanned, and if incoming ballistic objects re-entering the atmosphere are carrying ordnance or not. This makes the Patriot capable of resisting at least some of the most common countermeasures employed by ballistic missiles, such as releasing dummy warheads to lure in intercepting missiles. What makes the Patriot system work, however, is the Pac-2 and Pac-3 missiles. The Pac-3 missiles are the newest iteration of Patriot air defense missiles, but designed almost solely for the interception of ballistic missiles. The Pac-3 missile is slower and has a smaller range than the Pac-2, as it's intended to destroy ballistic missiles in their terminal phase. They also employ a hit-to-kill kinetic warhead armed with active radar that can be disconnected from ground stations and guide itself to a target, being smart enough to target the warhead portion of the missile. The kinetic kill warhead does employ a small explosive charge called a lethality enhancer, which launches 24 tungsten fragments in a radial direction to enhance kill probability. This makes the Pac-3 a much more sophisticated missile than the Pac-2, but also gives it extremely poor capabilities against a fast-flying and agile enemy fighter like the incoming Su-35. That's why Patriot batteries carry a mix of missiles, and it's the Pac-2's job to destroy incoming aircraft, which might threaten the Patriot battery itself. To do this, the Pac-2 employs a large fragmentation warhead, which is designed to shred enemy aircraft. A direct hit is not required to neutralize a fighter jet or a bomber, as these delicate machines require thousands of precisely engineered parts, all working perfectly to stay in the air. Damage to even some of these systems can be lethal to the aircraft and the Pac-2 creates a vast cloud of high-speed shrapnel that shreds even the most armored enemy plane. In a wartime situation, a firing solution would have already been achieved, and the incoming Russian Su-35 would be facing threats from both airborne and ground-based missiles. But NATO and Russia are not at war, yet. 
Thus, the F-15 pilots are told not to engage unless they themselves are engaged, and instead are directed to intercept the Russian plane within visual range. It's a show of force with the F-15s placing themselves between the Su-35 and any further penetration into Polish territory. As expected, the Su-35 briefly crosses into Polish airspace, is met by the American F-15s, but doesn't push its luck and quickly turns its nose parallel to the F-15s. After a few minutes, the Russian fighter once more turns back for safe airspace, leaving the F-15 to loiter near the border and watch from a distance. It's yet another microaggression by Russia meant to simply show NATO that it's not afraid of it, though it very much should be. Russia's aging air fleet puts it in serious doubt that it could actually threaten NATO airspace in any significant manner, and the current sanctions against Russia has left it unable to procure the more sophisticated electronic components it relied on for producing its air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles. This means that as the war in Ukraine rages on, Russian stockpiles of weapons diminish daily, and it couldn't possibly hope to compete against the vast quantities of missiles NATO still holds in reserve. It's a possibility that NATO is eyeing war as an increasing likelihood given the invasion of Ukraine. What was once thought impossible is now at the forefront of every member of NATO. Could Russia really declare war on the alliance? And could it win? To answer the question, we have to imagine an alternate timeline where Russia forces weren't bogged down in a never-ending fight for Ukraine, and instead opted for a more direct provocation against NATO. February 24, 2022, Russian forces have been involved in a large-scale exercise with their allies in Belarus, but this has been a front to allow Russian forces to stage closer to the NATO countries of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. At 0600 local Moscow time, Russian autocrat Vladimir Putin releases a pre-recorded message relaying his intention to declare a special military operation meant to bring NATO aggression to heel. Right on cue, Russian missile strikes begin to rain down across Lithuania and Latvia. The first targets are military bases and airfields. The attack isn't a complete surprise to NATO, though, and the missile defense systems begin to knock Russian missiles out of the air. The Russian volley is overwhelming, and with a hit rate of 60%, missile strikes saturate military targets across the Baltic nations. Dozens of NATO's forward-deployed supply caches are destroyed, along with several key supply depots. Russia's long-range targeting capabilities, however, are deficient due to the 2014 sanctions against it and the banning of dual-use technology that crippled its space surveillance network. While many missiles hit their targets, many don't, often hitting civilian targets instead. After a blistering barrage lasting half an hour, Russia has failed to completely cripple the command and control or air defense networks of the two countries, and over half of the airfields remain operational. In the air, Russian planes piggyback on the missile assault. Thanks to NATO's superior long-range surveillance capability, its air forces are not caught completely off guard, and several combat air patrols have been on constant rotation ever since the military buildup along Russia's western military district and Belarus. But the the coming wave of air power is overwhelming for the few defenders in the sky, and from damaged airfields across the Baltics, NATO fighters are being rushed for combat. Their pilots, however, have to be recalled to base from their home or barracks, adding to the response time. The few fighters NATO manages to get in the air engage Russian targets with standoff attack long-range air-to-air missiles. These missiles allow NATO forces to operate from well outside the envelope of Russian ground-based air defenses, which ring the Baltic states. The first combat casualties of the Russian-NATO war are Russian planes, but there are too few defenders and too many attackers to significantly stem the incoming air attack. With long-range missiles expended, NATO fighters are forced to move to positions just outside the threat range of the Russian S-400s and other mobile air defenses. Engaging Russian forces sent to neutralize them until forced to retreat to airfields in Latvia. With the missile onslaught and Russian air defenses in Kaliningrad on Lithuania's southern border, any surviving NATO aircraft can only be guaranteed some measure of safety further north in Latvia. But NATO has plenty of air defenses left operational, even after the opening missile barrage. In our real world, Russia proved unable to neutralize Ukraine's air defenses in its opening wave of attacks, despite having far superior air and long-range striking power. In this scenario, Russia is committing far more forces to the attack, but also facing far more sophisticated and better equipped defenses. As Russian planes are blotted out of the sky by air defenses, the Russian air offensive is briefly halted. Instead, more limited strikes against air defense networks are carried out by long-range standoff weapons. However, Russia has a limited availability of smart weapons, and its targeting capabilities are far inferior to NATO. Many air defense sites are destroyed or heavily damaged, with anti-radiation missiles taking out all important air defense radars, but defenses on the more western parts of the Baltics remain intact. Within minutes of hostilities, NATO's very high readiness response force has been activated. Soldiers on leave or at home are being recalled and a 5,000-strong response force of special forces, infantry, armor, and artillery is being assembled for immediate deployment. Within 48 hours, they'll be on the ground in the Baltics, ready to help stem the Russian onslaught. 
A few days later, they could be joined by NATO's response force, a rapid response force of 40,000 that includes combat air power and air support components. NATO maintains a contingent of around 1,000 strong of forward-deployed forces in the Baltics, and with the military buildup by Russia in recent weeks, this has been strengthened by an additional few thousand, along with several dozen aircraft. However, this is far insufficient to stop a Russian onslaught of 150,000 troops, even with Latvia and Lithuania's approximately 50,000 strong military. Of that number, not all are actual combat troops, with many being support and logistical personnel, so NATO's actual combat power in the ground numbers at barely over 12,000. Of more critical concern is the lack of tanks, though Latvia and Lithuania both field nearly a thousand armored vehicles with some anti-tank capabilities. As Russian troops cross the border, NATO forces are ordered to retreat rather than engage the invaders. NATO's top general, Supreme Allied Commander General Todd D. Walters, is aware of the massive mismatch of forces across the Baltics. This exact scenario has been wargamed extensively, and the only chance NATO has of holding off the Russian military long enough for its response force to arrive is to force the Russians into fighting in major cities where the terrain favors the defender and Russia's overwhelming firepower can be largely neutered. However, it's always been accepted that it was strategically impossible to guarantee the security of the Baltic members of NATO, given that stationing enough troops to do so would have required massive commitments of forward-deployed soldiers from across the alliance, a costly proposition, and a hugely destabilizing move that would have guaranteed a conflict between Russia and NATO much sooner than this. NATO will fight as best it can to hold the Baltics open for as long as possible, but its main response force already has plans to launch a counterattack from Poland, planning for the fall of Latvia and Lithuania within the first few days of fighting. Already Polish troops are digging in for an assault, either from Kaliningrad or Belarus, but such an assault won't be forthcoming. Russia's strategy to break NATO is to target the relatively undefended Baltic states, and then simply dig in. NATO will then have to decide if it wants to invoke Article 5 of the alliance's charter, stating that an attack on one is an attack on all, knowing that they'll be fighting an offensive war against an entrenched enemy in a conflict that could turn nuclear. Russia is betting that NATO's resolve is weak and it won't risk escalating the war. The assurance of mutual defense is a bedrock principle of NATO and should it fail, the alliance could be splintered. The United States, Poland, and the United Kingdom are staunchly committed to invoking Article 5 in any case of hostilities, but other member nations might not be as committed to waging war for countries that many of them weren't happy about joining NATO anyway. Some of them, like Germany, have deep financial ties to Russia already, and an end to Russian energy for Germany will be economically catastrophic. Only the coming days will determine if NATO invokes Article 5 in full. But for now, what is sure is that even if Russia is facing just Poland, the UK, and the US, it's still facing a significantly powerful force. The US just has to get its firepower to Europe first, a process that will take weeks to fully mature. In our fictional scenario, though, the US hasn't been blind to Russia's buildup of forces along its western military district and in Belarus. In this scenario, an invasion of Ukraine was possible, but the buildup of forces and supply depots along the borders with the Baltic states tipped Russia's hand weeks ago. Still, the US has delayed in deploying the bulk of its firepower to Europe in hopes of not destabilizing the situation further. But that doesn't mean it hasn't taken steps to move a significant force to its bases in Germany. A large contingent of its air power has also been moved to bases in mainland Europe and the UK and is now preparing for combat with the Russian Air Force. This has been a conflict the US Air Force has been waiting for for a very long time. Its F-15 Fighting Eagle was designed to kill Soviet MiGs, but today it's more than capable of sweeping the skies clear of Russian fighters. The US's F-35 fleet isn't fully operational yet, but dozens of the advanced stealthy planes are ready for combat, and as the Russians will soon find out, are absolutely game-changing. NATO's strategy is simple. Draw the Russians into NATO territory and away from their logistics hubs inside Russia and Belarus. Logistics has always been the Russian military's weakest point, and in our real world, a lack of logistical support has severely affected the Russian military's ability to fight in Ukraine. This is because Russian forces are simply not capable by design of fighting major land offensives far from their own borders. This sounds strange, given that Russia's greatest potential conflict was a major land war in Europe, so it seems like it should be something that the Russian military would be prepared for. Yet, for all the focus on new hypersonic missiles, overwhelming amounts of artillery, thousands of tanks and APCs, etc., etc., the Russian military has failed to learn the lesson it's been forcibly taught over and over again throughout history. A military can't fight without fuel, food, and ammo. Russian logistics focus on rail transportation with an incredible capability to move troops and equipment within their own borders quickly and efficiently. 
Russian internal logistics are probably some of the best in the world, and they even have an entire corps dedicated to railway transportation, its building, repairing, and maintenance. But Russian railways stop at the Soviet Union's old borders. That's because Russia uses a wider gauge railroad track than the rest of Europe, meaning that their plan to resupply forces via railroads stop at the Baltics in Ukraine. Adjustable carriages do exist, but engines cannot be made adjustable to fit both the Soviet rails and newer European rails. Thus, Russia would have to seize European engines to drive their railroad carriages into Europe proper. But NATO would never allow those engines to fall into the hands of the Russians for this exact reason. But whether delivering supplies to a railhead their trains can actually reach, or deeper into Europe with seized European engines, Russia still has a serious problem with logistics. Mainly, there aren't enough logistics personnel or equipment for the job of supplying all of its forces. Each Russian combined arms army is allotted a single material technical support brigade. Each material technical support brigade has two truck battalions with a total of 150 general cargo trucks with 50 trailers and 260 specialized trucks per brigade. The further an army moves from the railhead, the less trips that its resupply trucks can undertake, increasing the total length of time for resupply. At the current number of trucks available, there are simply not enough trucks for the operation more than a few dozen miles from a railhead, and that's before taking into account losses due to enemy activity and equipment breakdown. Take for instance Russia's heavy use of rocket artillery. Each Russian army has approximately 56 to 90 multiple launch rocket systems, and resupplying a single launcher takes up the entire bed of a truck. So if the entire MLRS force fired just one volley, it would require up to 90 trucks solely for resupplying ammunition. Those trucks then could could not be used for anything else, like for example ferrying the fuel the MLRS needs to drive to a new location, or food or water or ammunition for the men manning the systems. Just a Russian Army MLRS attachment is already taking up a significant amount of Russia's logistical capabilities, leaving the rest of its forces – tanks, APCs, infantry, tube artillery – with much fewer trucks for their own resupply needs. And again, this is before taking into account the fact that Russian logistics will be under constant enemy attack, or that resupplies further diminish the further from a safe railhead the Russian offensive moves. In our hypothetical scenario, NATO understands this all too well. And that's why, as their forces retreat to pull the Russians deeper into NATO territory, special operations forces launch raids against Russian supply convoys before melting back into the countryside. NATO's strategy is to put up a mobile defense that keeps the Russians firing and burning gas, but places a tactical victory always just out of their grasp. Russian units are equipped to be independent of resupply for three to five days, but in intense urban combat, those figures shrink dramatically to just three days at best. By the dawn of the fourth day of fighting, Russian forces are forced to cease their advance toward Riga, starved of ammunition, food, water, and fuel. In Lithuania, though, they have managed to capture Vilnius, though partisan fighters are making the Russians suffer in street-to-street -street fighting. With superior reconnaissance capabilities, NATO was able to pinpoint Russian air defenses and send wild weasel aircrafts on a mission to destroy them. Taking from the example of Russian performance in Ukraine today, these suppression of enemy air defense missions succeed with astounding success. For longer-range S-400 and older S-300 batteries, F-35s equipped with glide bombs are able to overwhelm their missile defenses and destroy them without the S-400 ever getting off a single shot. Loitering MiGs defending from air attack are likewise unable to pick off the F-35s until they get to within close range, which very few manage to do without getting blown out of the sky. However, the number of F-35s is limited, which is where their capability to network with non-stealthy fourth-generation planes comes into play. With their advanced data links, F-35s are able to guide target bombs and missiles fired by non-stealthy planes who can carry out attacks far outside the threat envelope of Russian defenses. The results are devastating, and though a dozen F-35s are lost in combat, Russian air defenses are savagely mauled. The greatest factor of NATO's success, however, is Russia's own incompetence. Our real-world invasion of Ukraine has proven that the modern Russian military is nowhere near the formidable beast that Europe has feared. In fact, they're barely capable of carrying out modern combat operations, and it's only their overwhelming numbers that are seeing them slowly defeat Ukraine's forces. On the tactical level, we've seen time and again as Russian tank commanders don't make use of dismounted infantry to protect the tanks from anti-tank kill teams, leading to numerous deadly ambushes by Ukrainian forces using NATO anti tank missiles. We've also seen as Russian forces practice no discernible convoy security procedures, with their convoys often coming to a complete stop at crossroads and other danger crossings, 
and without deploying security elements on their flanks to delay an enemy attack and allow the convoy to push through. Even their ability to prevent friendly fire incidents through discipline and communications is under question, as more than once, Russian units have engaged in full-blown battles between each other, much to the observing Ukrainians' delight. Perhaps most baffling of all is the destruction of Russian air defenses inside a convoy by Ukrainian aircraft even when at a complete stop for several hours. Their Russian crews never bothered to turn on their radar and scan for threats. The scenario has also repeated itself numerous times. Lastly, we've seen time and again how Russian forces fail to properly respond to Ukraine Ukrainian ambushes. When caught in an ambush, the proper procedure is to either fight out of the ambush or assault through it. Instead, Russian forces are often seen scattering in a panic, while their comrades who stayed behind actually to assault the ambush are obliterated one by one. Forces outside of the ambush zone are commonly observed to either drive away in a panic or come to a complete stop and begin to back up. Instead, forces outside of an ambush should be deploying for a flanking assault on the ambushing enemy force, neutralizing the threat to their comrades stuck in the kill zone. All we've seen so far in Ukraine is indicative of one thing. The Russian military is largely poorly trained. But they're also operating equipment in various stages of disrepair. Some units enjoy more modern, well-maintained equipment and are appropriately deadly, but many others seem to be suffering from serious maintenance and modernity problems. Russian tanks, for instance, are being savaged by Ukrainian infantry armed with anti-tank missiles not just because of poor tactics in their deployment, but also because they lack active protection systems such as Trophy, which an increasing number of US combat vehicles are equipped with. They seem to also lack environmental sensors to help them pinpoint the source of the attack, leading to confusion and panic after an attack only made worse by poor discipline, training, and ever-shrinking morale. Often vaunted for its electronic warfare capabilities, the Russian military has proven itself incapable of securing its own communications in its invasion of Ukraine. As it turns out, an astonishing number of Russian units operate on completely unsecured radios. This has allowed the Ukrainian military and even amateur radio operators to interfere with and jam Russian radios. Ukrainians have hopped onto Russian frequencies to insult their invaders, play the Ukrainian national anthem on repeat for days at a time, and even jammed the frequency with white noise, revealing messages or images when analyzed digitally. Against NATO, unsecured communication spelled disaster for the Russian military, as NATO electronic warfare operatives don't just jam Russian communications, but actively use them for sabotage. False orders are relayed over unsecured radios, causing entire Russian units to move out of formation or even launch attacks against phantom targets. Fluent Russian speakers wreak havoc on Russian forces simply by hijacking their unsecured comms. But because they must be very close to the front line to do so, their effectiveness is limited. As NATO's response force finally prepares for a proper engagement against Russian forces, their air forces launch a devastating assault from the air. American B-2 stealth bombers penetrate into Russian air defenses to destroy important communication hubs and surveillance radars, throwing air defenses into disarray. Much like in the first Gulf War when Iraq used air defense networks modeled after Russia's own, these precision strikes by stealthy aircraft proved to be crippling for the air defense capabilities of Russian units. Add in serious resupply problems after constant missile and air attacks against Russian railways and strategically important bridges, and the Russian army's capability to defend itself in the air falls largely to its aerospace forces. But here too, NATO has the advantage. Russian pilots struggle to keep a 120-hour flight time minimum per year, while NATO pilots regularly fly nearly twice as many hours to maintain their proficiency. Maintenance problems also affect the Russian aerospace forces. In our real world, we saw two Russian aircraft simply fall out of the sky on the first day of Ukrainian invasion due to maintenance issues, and across the broader Russian Air Force we can expect similar levels of unreadiness. But it's better avionics, sensors, and longer-range anti-air missiles coupled with a sprinkling of F-35s that prove decisive in the sky. In the largest air battle since World War II, NATO forces wrestle control of the skies over the front away from the Russians, resulting in dozens of casualties on both sides. This opens up the greater use of air support to attack Russian army formations, though. And here again, another of NATO's strengths over Russia comes into play. Very few Russian pilots have multi role experience, while NATO pilots regularly fly both air superiority and airstrike missions. For a NATO plane, switching from shooting down MiGs to blowing up tanks is as simple as switching the plane's munitions, but Russian air forces must use dedicated aircraft and crews for each mission. The lack of flexibility hurts Russian forces badly in Ukraine, especially in the opening days of the war, and this is why historically Russia relies heavily on artillery for fire support, not aircraft. Logistic problems have starved Russian artillery of ammunition, though, and even when fully supplied, Russian artillery is not very flexible. Needing to always stay under an umbrella of ground-based fire support has also significantly slowed Russia's advance. While NATO forces can better exploit tactical opportunities, thanks to their reliance on air power for fire support. Now NATO is on the offensive on the ground, not just in the air, and the final critical weakness of the Russian military is revealed. NATO attacks Russian formations across multiple fronts with smaller but much more maneuverable forces. This 
exploits an inherent weakness of the Russian battalion tactical group, which is its inability to coordinate fire support against attacks coming from multiple directions. A lack of maneuver forces held in reserve also limits the Russian BTG's ability to respond to various new fronts at the same time. NATO's aggressive attacks across multiple fronts throws Russian commanders into disarray due to an inherent limitation in their command and control systems. Their electronic warfare and direct fire assets are formidable but incapable of focusing across a wide front. By comparison, the decentralized command structure of NATO forces allows them to maneuver three times as many units simultaneously, with each formation acting semi-autonomously and pursuing objectives and opportunities as they arise. The result is like a giant trying to swat away hundreds of bees attacking simultaneously. Where Russian blows land, they're devastating, and numerous NATO units are annihilated in fierce close-quarter combat. But while one front is being reinforced, a completely different front is being attacked, causing confusion and chaos at the command level. NATO's own electronic warfare assets and fire support only add to the quickly gathering fog of war that the Russian chain of command is suddenly finding itself fighting in. As nighttime rolls around, though, things go from bad to worse for Russian forces. As observed in Ukraine, Russian night attack capabilities are uneven and sporadic. Many soldiers lack basic night vision, and NATO tanks and armored vehicles have on the whole more capable sensors and imagers. This allows NATO vehicles to open up first and from further away. American Abrams silver bullets prove particularly deadly versus Russian armor, just like they did against Russian tanks in the first Gulf War. T-72s make up the bulk of Russian armor, and while domestic models are better protected than export models provided to Iraq, the results are largely the same. T-90s fare better against NATO's more modern tanks, but there's simply too few of them and the front is too wide. The vaunted T-14, which was supposed to revolutionize tank warfare, never made it to full-scale production thanks to sanctions against Russia and its sputtering economy. The fight is not bloodless for NATO forces, though, and casualties quickly climb into the thousands after days of fierce fighting, with hundreds of armored vehicles lost on both sides. However, NATO operational superiority, high morale, better training, and largely more capable equipment proves to be decisive. Perhaps more than anything else, though, it's Russia's logistics that doom its military offensive into the Baltics. NATO forces have been savagely attacking Russian supply convoys, even at the cost of foregoing attacks against tank and artillery positions. NATO knows it's far more important to disrupt Russia's ability to resupply its forces than to actually destroy said forces. And now with Russian troops deep in the Baltics and far from their rail network, their supply difficulties increase exponentially with each truck lost. The Russian military has been pressing civilian trucks into service, but ongoing attacks against supply convoys and even the destruction of public roads makes resupply increasingly impossible. By a week of proper ground fighting between the two sides, Russian troops are surrendering in mass and abandoning their vehicles. We saw this in our real world in Ukraine, and continue to see it as Russia struggles to fix its logistics problems. Ukrainian forces have discovered entire convoys of Russian tanks and APCs abandoned due to a lack of fuel or food, their crews trying to hike back to friendly lines. Against a far more capable force such as NATO, these logistical problems become critical vulnerabilities that spell disaster for the Russian military. It's the same story across every facet of the Russian military that has proven to be, in the words of the retired American Major General Paul Eaton, unexpectedly incompetent and incapable of combined arms warfare. Stalin had a famous adage when asked about the West's technological superiority, quantity is a quality all its own. That might have been true back in his day, but today no amount of quantity can make up for the Russian military's complete lack of basic fundamentals. While a NATO-Russian war would be devastating for both sides, in a non-nuclear scenario Russia has proven in its bungled invasion of Ukraine that it has no hope of victory against the obviously superior North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Snipers – bodyguards armed with handguns that can punch through body armor, helicopter gunships, and trained attack bears. We only made one of those up. But the protection of the President of Russia is absolutely insane. The American President has the Secret Service, and his counterpart in Russia has their own elite bodyguard unit, the Presidential Security Service. Part of the Federal Protective Service, this arm of the Russian government is responsible for protecting high-ranking Russian government figures and has a whopping 50,000 employees. The PSS, though, is only responsible for protecting the Russian president and prime minister, and they are very good at their job. Much of the way the PSS operates is similar to the way the American Secret Service operates, but this isn't copycatting, it's simply because the fundamentals of security don't change no matter what country you're in. However, the PSS has at least one additional requirement that the American Secret Service doesn't when dealing with a president as image-conscious as Vladimir Putin. Long before the Russian president steps foot on a plane to a new meeting or a vacation spot, his security team is already hard at work. Every single destination needs to be thoroughly checked for a wide variety of potential threats. 
and this includes every single road to be traveled and potential stop or visit. The first threat analyzed is the criminal one. A large number of organized crime syndicates would profit greatly from the abduction or even assassination of a government leader. Just imagine what Mexican cartels would do to get their hands on the American president. Thus, the Russian president's security detail meticulously analyzes the criminal threat to the president directly or to any asset the president might be using during his travels. The last thing Putin's security detail wants is to accidentally travel down a road well known for frequent gun battles between rival criminal gangs, even if they probably seriously outgun any street gang on planet Earth. Next on the agenda is analyzing any potential for social unrest. The president's security detail will work to make sure that any potential travel route or visit avoids locations that are potentially hot spots for citizen unrest. Imagine what might happen if Xi Jinping had traveled through Hong Kong during the massive riots that rocked the city, or if the American president's travel plans had included a road trip through the city of Ferguson during its own social unrest. However, this part of the screening process includes analyzing the potential for social unrest actually inspired by the president himself. Putin has proven to be a particularly divisive figure in Russia and frequently the target of ire by pro-democracy groups, LGBTQ rights activists, and women's rights activists. Once, Putin was accosted by feminist protesters during a visit to Hanover. While it's doubtful the protesters would have caused any actual harm, his bodyguards were immediately on hand to ensure Putin wasn't harmed or potentially embarrassed. Safeguarding the president from social unrest, he may inspire himself, includes carefully vetting any visitors or attendees to events Putin goes to and even blacklisting individuals or groups from participating. Next is analyzing the possibility of natural disasters in the area the president might be visiting. This is done by looking at historical data and gaining access to good long-range weather forecasting. Some natural disasters can be easily predicted, or at least given a good probability of occurring or not. This includes seasonal events such as flooding and typhoons. Others, however, are completely unpredictable such as earthquakes or Kylie Jenner dropping her own album. In either case, the president's protection detail needs to have a well-established contingency plan that includes the capability to escape a natural disaster entirely before or after it's struck. If escape is impossible, the protection detail must have the necessary tools to shelter in place while the Russian military enacts a plan to extract the president. Lastly is a concern unique to Russia's current and very image-conscious Vladimir Putin. The last thing the president detail can let happen is to let the Russian president be assassinated. The second to last thing is to let him look foolish. For Vladimir Putin, this is especially important, as the current Russian president has worked to carefully cultivate a strong, manly image through various photo shoots which include him sun tanning in the Russian wilderness, riding a horse shirtless, joining an underwater research excursion, swimming in a wild Russian lake, and hunting shirtless for some reason. While these photo shoots have been very successful at growing his popularity with segments of the Russian population, other Russians have fought back by making Vladimir Putin the most memeable world leader. Thus, the Presidential Protective Service has to be ever conscious of how a visit could affect the Russian president's public image. A month out from a potential visit, security experts inspect the location and especially the accommodations where the president will be staying. The location is carefully checked for any potential security vulnerabilities and any employees are carefully vetted by the security team. Lastly, every single item inside the president's accommodations is inspected and repaired well before his arrival. That way, during the stay, there is no need for any technician or repairman to visit. With just a few weeks before the president's stay, technical experts install radio and cell signal jammers. These devices will help prevent any potential IEDs or planted explosives from being detonated via radio or cell phone. However, it also helps to ensure the president isn't potentially spied on by hidden electronics that a sweep might have missed. Unique to the Russian president's security detail is the ability to ping any and all smart devices in proximity to where the president is expected to stay or travel. Russian laws allow the president's security team to use tapping hardware and software on any electronic device they believe will be in proximity to the president. They're also given the authority to execute body searches without the same legal restrictions a police officer might have, gain access to absolutely any building or organization, and seize any vehicle they may deem necessary for the protection of the president or that might pose a threat. So, who gets to protect one of the most powerful men in the world? First, you must be over 21 but younger than 35 at the time of application. You also have to be able to complete a stringent physical exam, so only those in peak physical shape should even think of applying. Next, you must be between 175 and 190 centimeters so that you're physically large enough to shield the president with your own body, but not so tall as to experience difficulty in tight physical confines 
or draw attention to yourself. The requirements to join the Presidential Security Service are surprisingly similar to that of the American Secret Service. Combat experience is not required, and in fact, good candidates are more defensively minded than offensive. That's because, as explained by a former Presidential Security Service employee, a soldier is meant to attack, but a bodyguard is meant to defend and protect. Being a presidential bodyguard can be much more challenging than being a soldier, as most of the threats that a presidential security service member will face are going to be clandestine. A good candidate must have an excellent attention to detail and only the best of situational awareness. Any member in a crowd can be a potential attacker, and even the sweet old lady waiting in line to shake the president's hand could be carrying a hidden gun in her purse. A good bodyguard must keep an eye on a wide variety of potential threat vectors, and yet remain aware enough to react to a completely unexpected threat. Even more important, though, is the psychological component. A president's bodyguard's job is not to apprehend or eliminate an attacker, but to protect the president, even at the cost of their own life. Thus, while a normal police officer or soldier might have the instinct to neutralize an attacker first, a Russian president's bodyguard will instead put themselves between the president and the threat, even before drawing their pistol. This is why defensive thinking is more important than offensive thinking. The Presidential Security Service must also be well-versed in different languages given the Russian president's frequent travel abroad. This is so agents can understand if any threat is present in the area by listening to and understanding the conversations of the locals. Next, they must have a good sense for proper etiquette in politics while remaining tactful at all times. In this video, a security team member tactfully asks UFC fighter Conor McGregor to remove his arm from around Putin's shoulder. A big no-no that could have caused an embarrassing public incident if the bodyguard had overreacted. This is also why only calm and level-headed individuals are allowed to guard the most powerful man in Russia. The last thing President Putin needed here was an over-anxious bodyguard making a scene with a major public figure like McGregor. We have to admit, though, the entire staff of the infographic show would love to have seen a Russian presidential bodyguard go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a UFC champion, and our money is on the bodyguard. That's because of the incredible training they undergo. Details are very scarce given the secrecy of the Russian government, but it's known that much like their American counterparts, Russian presidential bodyguards are experts in hand-to-hand -hand combat and have incredible stamina and tolerance for extreme heat and cold. Even the coldest conditions, these men must be able to tolerate the weather in only light overcoats, since heavy overcoats would hinder their agility and ability to move quickly. Rumors even have it that the Russian presidential bodyguards take a variety of drugs that directly affect their physiology. This could include the use of amphetamines for alertness or perhaps even human growth hormones or steroids to increase strength and endurance. Again, given the secrecy of the Russian government, these remain only rumors. But would you really be surprised to learn that Vladimir Putin is protected by a team of bodyguards jacked up on experimental super soldier serums? While the president is out and about, the PSS operates almost exactly as the American Secret Service. First, the president is closely protected by a team of elite bodyguards who are ever-present and within feet of him at all times. These men are trained to put themselves directly in the path of an attacker and take a bullet for the Russian president if necessary. As such, they carry body armor under their suits or jackets, and even carry special bulletproof briefcases which can be used as shields. They also carry well-concealed handguns capable of punching through body armor at a range of up to 50 meters, and submachine guns. Sometimes they even carry Kevlar umbrellas, which can protect from bullets and shrapnel. Next is the president's second circle of protection, arguably the most important. These individuals are usually invisible and don't look like government agents at all. That's because they're trained to blend into crowds so as to ascertain threats from within. They'll dress like regular civilians and work the crowd, identifying troublemakers and radioing their teammates about potential threats or individuals to be concerned about. They're also meant to act before an attacker has even had a chance to threaten the president. An individual suddenly shoving others out of the way might just be an overeager fan or a deranged gunman and it's the second circle's job to neutralize them before they get a chance to threaten the president. The third circle of protection works along the perimeter of the crowd and carefully checks for threats from the outside. These agents will be dressed like their comrades, both to identify them as security detail members, but also to make themselves a threat and discourage an attack. If the president's security detail is highly visible and in large numbers, it can act as a visual deterrent, discouraging a would-be attacker by making them believe they just fail anyway. The fourth circle of protection is made up of elite spotters and snipers situated in tactically advantageous points around the president's location. Their job is not just to keep an eye on the crowd and act accordingly, but even more importantly to act as counter-snipers. As the greatest threat to the president is going to come from a sniper, the president's own snipers have to be able to identify the most likely threat vectors for a sniper attack and keep tabs on them, and act to accurately and immediately neutralize any threat. 
Lastly, the Russian president is typically escorted by a special unit of heavily armed security personnel. These heavies are responsible for extracting the president from any potential situation or for neutralizing a heavily militarized threat to the president. They are capable of protecting not just from a human threat, but of employing anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons to protect against heavy vehicles and airborne threats. On February 24, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin sought to make his mark on Russian history by restoring Ukraine to a puppet state and pushing NATO back and away from its borders. Instead, President Putin will go down in history as the man who made NATO great again and even added additional countries to its roster. But why is Russia so scared of Finland and Sweden joining NATO? The Russian invasion of Ukraine was provoked in large part by the nation's refusal to submit to the Kremlin authority. After a presidential coup in 2014, Ukraine looked like it was on a path to join the West and leave Russia behind. Enshrined in its constitution was an amendment that Ukraine would pursue NATO membership as a matter of highest priority, and work began on meeting the requirements for entry into the alliance. For Russia's President Vladimir Putin, this was beyond unacceptable. Historically, Russia has suffered greatly from European invaders, ranging from the French during the Napoleonic Wars to the Germans in both world wars. After the Second World War, though, Eastern Europe was severely weakened and an opportunity opened up for the Soviet Union to expand its sphere of influence all the way to Germany itself. This wasn't just a power grab, though. It was a matter of vital national security for the Russians. By creating a slew of client states across Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union had in essence created a buffer between itself and Western Europe. Now any invasion could be met outside of native territory, saving the lives of millions of Russian citizens and preserving the economy of the nation. A buffer between itself and a potential invader is especially important because Russia's strategic position in Europe is extremely weak. The nation sits at the eastern end of the Great European Plain, a vast stretch of flat territory that is impossible to defend. Historically, Russian forces have struggled to hold off invaders coming from its west as the landscape offers few natural defensive features, and with the advent of modern high-speed warfare, the strategic picture only grew grimmer for the Russians. During World War II, the only thing slowing the German advances was sheer grit and determination from the Russian defenders, who tried to choke the mighty German war machine by throwing hordes of men at it. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, freed former client states like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia were all quick to pursue NATO membership. For them, it was a matter of national survival. The Soviet Union might have collapsed, but nobody was foolish enough to think that the new Russian Federation had simply given up on its desire to control Eastern Europe. For existing NATO members, though, the consideration was a difficult one. Technically, the three Baltic states offer very little to the alliance and are more of a liability than an asset, except in one very important regard – their location on Russia's flank. Adopting the three Baltic countries into NATO now opened up a wide front on the Russian northwestern flank which threw Russia's force disposition wildly off balance. For decades, NATO had contended with very real possibilities that, in case of a war, they would be unable to stop a concentrated attack across the infamous Fulda Gap in Germany, with Norway offering no opportunity for NATO to seriously threaten the Soviet Union from its tiny border with the Union. The Soviets were able to concentrate the bulk of their firepower in East Germany for a decisive and brutal attack straight into the heart of NATO. After the adoption of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania into NATO, however, the alliance now could threaten Russia right on its own doorstep, across a very wide front, and this forced the new Russian Federation to more widely disperse its forces. To add to Russia's problems, the terrain across the Baltic front is very poorly suited for defensive operations, requiring even more troops to secure its border in the region. Now Russia's strategic position was greatly weakened, as it was forced to disperse its forces across numerous probable engagement areas. It also put the military enclave of Kaliningrad in serious jeopardy as NATO could threaten it from the south through Poland and from the north through Lithuania. Finally, it severely weakened Russia's position in the Baltic Sea, as NATO ships had friendly ports across the eastern side of the Baltic Sea and could easily bottleneck the Russian fleet, much like the British did the Germans in both world wars. The balance of power in Europe had been irrevocably thrown askew, and now favored the NATO alliance in case of a war. The addition of Ukraine would have been an unmitigated disaster, as now Russia would be flanked by NATO both to the northwest and the south with Moscow just a few hundred miles in either direction for hostile forces. Even more importantly, Ukraine's ascension to NATO would have given the alliance complete and unmitigated control over the Black Sea, shutting Russian Black Sea ports off from the world and giving the alliance incredible control over the sea routes that Russia relies on for both imports and exports. The military invasion of Ukraine has, for now at least, put a stop to Ukraine's joining of either the EU or NATO, 
But in response, Sweden and Finland, two nations that have remained staunchly neutral, are now in very serious discussions about joining the alliance. In fact, by the time you watch this video, they may have already expressed publicly their desire to do so. Finland has a troubled history with Russia. During World War II, the Soviet Union invading Finland under the auspices of increasing security for the important seaport of St. Petersburg. At first, Stalin gave the Finns an ultimatum, grant us several dozen miles of border territory so we can ensure the security of St. Petersburg, then named Leningrad. In exchange, the Soviets would grant Finland several miles of completely useless territory along the northern border. Finland naturally refused, and Stalin used this as an excuse for war. Historians debate whether Stalin ever meant to fully capture Finland or not, though the evidence is strong that he did, given that he enacted a puppet Finnish communist government in occupied territories. Plus, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Germany meant the Soviets didn't need to fear German intervention nor a possible German threat from the south, freeing them up for a full invasion of Finland. The capture of Finland would have granted them access to Finland's natural resources and allowed them to establish greater control over the Baltic Sea. However, Stalin's ambition would never come to pass, as Finland proved to be a lot tougher than the Soviets had thought. Finnish resistance fought a staunch defensive war, and terrain that heavily favored it. However, it was largely the Soviet Union's own military that led to a ceasefire three months later with meager territorial gains. Stalin had, in his paranoia, carried out large purges of the Red Army, eliminating many senior leaders whom he viewed as a threat to his rule. While this might have secured his political office, it left the Soviet army without experienced professional officers, replaced instead with politically indoctrinated and loyal stooges who cared more about ensuring political loyalty than actually discipline and training. The price to the Soviet Union was great in manpower and resources, though it did win approximately 9% of Finland's territory, more than originally asked for. However, its international standing was severely hurt, which in turn affected just how much aid it would later receive in its war against Germany. Perhaps more tragic of all for the Soviets, though, is the fact that the war proved to Hitler that the Soviet Union was a weak and effective power, a clumsy giant with a large military but not good at wielding it. This convinced Hitler that invading the Soviet Union was possible after all, even while at war with the Western Allies, and would cost the Soviets millions of lives. Given its history with the Soviets, Finland remained neutral throughout the Cold War and sought instead to appease Moscow by establishing bilateral relations. While it cooperated with NATO forces and international missions, it did not wish to join the alliance for fear of provoking its next-door neighbor. Sweden likewise had maintained a policy of cooperation but neutrality with the West, believing it to be safer to remain neutral than potentially provoke a Russian retaliation. For 75 years, public opinion polls in both nations showed that the majority of citizens wished to remain neutral. And it isn't hard to see why. In case of war, their countries were right next door to Russia, while most of NATO was still far from the Russian border. The heaviest fighting of any war would be taking place on their soil. However, after February 24th, the security situation in Europe has been completely rewritten, and public opinion polls mirror that, with, for the first time in their history, a majority of Finnish and Swedish citizens wishing to join NATO. The invasion of Ukraine has proven to the two longtime neutral countries that if Russia doesn't like what's going on inside your borders, it's very likely to invite itself in and change matters how it sees fit. Now Finland and Sweden have a reason to fear that their neutrality is no longer a security guarantee, and any prior agreement with Russia is essentially worthless. After all, Ukraine had an agreement with Russia to preserve its independence in exchange for Cold War-era Soviet nuclear weapons left behind on its territory after the fall of the Union. For Russia, Sweden and Finland's accession to NATO would mean that it's essentially blocked from the Baltic Sea in case of hostilities. Now, NATO members would threaten Russian ships on all sides and allow NATO navies to operate right off of Russia's own shores by providing nearby replenishment and resupply. American aircraft carriers could, for instance, operate safely inside the Baltic Sea for the first time in history after a thorough sweep of the Russian Baltic fleet by NATO ships. Having two or more American supercarriers parked right off its own shore is a nightmare scenario for Russia, as it would be for any country, and the accession of the two Nordic countries to NATO would make this possible. Finland and Sweden joining NATO also turns the entire Nordic Peninsula into a NATO enclave, effectively hemming in the Russians on two sides. NATO air defense installations in Finland could seriously threaten deep parts of Russian territory, limiting the use of Russia's air forces in case of a war. It also places dozens of strategically important targets within striking range of NATO aircraft at the immediate onset of war, forcing Russia to more widely disperse its defensive forces and weakening them, while hampering its ability to launch offensive operations. Even more important though, as Vladimir Putin sought to improve Russia's security situation against NATO, Finland's membership would mean that instead, Putin created an additional 800 miles of vulnerability, 
thanks to Finland's shared border with Russia. This now places NATO forces less than 60 miles from St. Petersburg and with easy striking distance of additional Russian targets to the north. While Russia might have difficulty moving a few dozen miles into enemy territory to seize a major city, NATO's swift and agile military would have no similar difficulties, and Putin knows this, which is why he's so terrified of NATO gaining a significant presence so close to vulnerable Russian territory. It's unlikely Sweden and Finland will be deterred from joining NATO thanks to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. NATO itself has vowed to fast-track the two countries' memberships, largely thanks to the fact that both Sweden and Finland already fulfill most of the requirements for membership. NATO's five requirements for membership include new members must uphold democratic values and enshrine protections for minority populations, embracing and tolerating diversity. New members must be making progress toward a market economy. This is a Cold War era leftover, as potential new Eastern European members struggle to throw off the Soviet economic system forced on them. Military forces of new members must be under the firm control of civilian authorities. Military dictatorships need not apply. New members must respect the sovereignty of other nations and be good neighbors. Potential members must be working toward compatibility with NATO forces. This means that their military command structure, training, and equipment must meet strict standards to ensure that a new member is not a liability in time of war. Equipment used by a new member must also show some degree of interoperability with other NATO members to ease the burden of logistics. If 29 of the NATO members are using a specific caliber rifle, but a 30th is using a different caliber, it makes logistics for the 30th member much more difficult. NATO members must be able to share and use equipment in time of war. Sweden and Finland are both vibrant democracies with strong liberal values. Unlike authoritarian Russia, their militaries are both very well equipped and extremely proficient easily meeting NATO training and operational standards. Membership into the alliance can be fast-tracked for both countries, seeing as they so easily fit the NATO mold already. However, there is a fear that Vladimir Putin will retaliate before both countries can formally join NATO and enjoy Article 5 protection of the alliance. He's already stated that there would be severe military and economic consequences if either nation sought out NATO membership. For this reason, NATO has already approved temporary commitment to protect both nations during the application process, which could still take months. This way, Russia cannot bully or intimidate Sweden or Finland as they contemplate this momentous decision, and the two nations are free to choose for themselves what path to take to national security. Given Russia's performance in Ukraine, it's highly unlikely that it will risk war against Finland and Sweden's completely modern militaries in order to prevent them from joining NATO. Right now, Russia can only afford to lose one war at a time, and even without NATO, both Finland and Sweden working together could make a Russian attack against them an extremely costly one that would see little political or territorial gain. Given that the terrain itself is far more suitable for defensive operations, it seems unlikely that Russia will seek to stop both countries' accession via military means. But it does not eliminate the threat of nuclear attack, a recourse many fear Putin is more than capable of turning to in the face of his military's ineptitude. Without NATO membership, Sweden and Finland are not covered under the American nuclear umbrella the way other nations are, and remain vulnerable to this final and most dramatic of intimidation tactics. A recruit forced to live with a fractured neck. Another had his legs and genitals amputated. What do they have in common? They were violently hazed in the Russian military. The Russian armed forces have tried to move away from a conscription service ever since the early 2000s, when it became clear that if they were to compete against professional Western militaries, they would need their own fully volunteer military force. Historically, conscripts have vastly underperformed versus professional soldiers due to worse morale and esprit de corps, but conscription also severely weakens a military in one key area, expertise. When a military over relies on conscripts, it's reduced to a constantly rotating body of soldiers, which leaves that military without any professional veterans. This lack of veterancy severely negatively impacts the performance of any military and leads to a weak non-commissioned or junior officer corps, a problem Russia is intimately familiar with and largely explains its terrible performance in Ukraine. Russia has been unable to transition to an all-volunteer military despite efforts to boost pay and benefits. However, it has managed to reduce its dependency on conscripts greatly. Today, about a third of the Russian military is made up of conscripts. And these conscripts are typically assigned to rear area jobs such as logistics, maintenance, and artillery corps. Russia's frontline forces, at least in theory, are fully professional, and under Russian law, conscripts cannot be used for military action outside of Russia's borders. As we've seen in Ukraine, though, Russian law means little, even for Russians. 
as conscripts make up a significant portion of the forces fighting there. Russia has two conscription drives a year. The first is in the fall and lasts from October to December 31st, and the second is in the spring, lasting from April 1st to July 15th. All men aged 18 to 27 are eligible for conscription, though teenagers as young as 16 have been pressed into service. Corruption is prevalent throughout the length and breadth of the Russian military, however, and conscripts can often pay as much as $5,000 US to avoid service, which inevitably means that most conscripts come from working-class homes, single-parent families, or orphanages. Wealthier Russians need not fear compulsory service, despite the fact that the Russian constitution explicitly states every Russian's job should be to defend the motherland. Would-be conscripts even go so far as to swallow magnesium crystals to give themselves painful stomach ulcers and avoid the draft, or add drops of blood to their urine samples hoping it'll make them seem unfit for service. Conscripts serve for one-year terms, though extensions such as that which many in Ukraine are facing today are not uncommon. Upon enlisting, conscripts go through a one- to two-month-long basic training, which varies depending on location and is not standardized the way it is in the US. After basic training, conscripts undergo a further three to six months of advanced training, depending on their assignment, before being assigned to regular units. Russian conscripts must pass a physical examination similar to that required by many Western militaries. This includes a 3-kilometer run that must be finished in 12.4 minutes, a 10-kilometer march that must be completed in less than 56 minutes, a 100-meter dash in under 14.4 seconds, and 12 pull-ups for any soldier in service less than six months. For their service, they're paid up to $14 US a month, though this varies. Once more, corruption is to blame, as Russia uses a system where unit commanders are directly sent the wages for their soldiers and it's up to them to disseminate pay. Thus, most Russian commanders skim off the top of the incoming pay largely from the conscripts who will be gone in a few months anyway and who have little to no rights inside the Russian military. The curious practice also explains much of the underperformance of the Russian battalion tactical groups in the current war. Officers routinely report their units are fully staffed and fit for combat, despite having suffered combat losses. This way, senior officers can pocket the pay meant for soldiers who have been killed or wounded and removed from the front. Then when the unit is tapped for combat operations because to senior planners it seems like a full-strength unit, it must go to combat with a percentage of its manpower missing. Training during boot camp is split between physical training, weapons training, and unit training. Unlike American boot camp, there's a far less rigid training structure and it seems like a lot of training is focused on physical training to get conscripts and recruits into shape. By comparison, US basic training differs depending on the branch of service, but focuses on weapons training and physical training alongside classroom training on topics ranging from the law of armed conflict to first aid. Russian recruits also tend to have less oversight during basic training and enjoy relaxing evenings after official training hours are over, even being allowed to watch TV or listen to music until lights out at 10.30. But the real challenge for conscripts is in training, it's surviving Dedovshina, the rule of the grandfathers. Russians believe that the rule of the grandfathers makes for tough soldiers. Their performance in Ukraine begs to differ. Hazing inside the Russian military is not limited to conscripts, but conscripts bear the absolute worst of it. The practice is perpetrated by everyone from senior to junior officers, who ignore it or participate in it directly, and even by soldiers just a few years more senior than their victims. No one is safe from hazing in the Russian military, but hazing isn't just about abuse, it's often about outright theft or exploitation. One recruit, Kirill Bobrov, at the Kamenka military base was dragged into a boiler room after his compatriots found out that his grandmother had sent him $14 US in rubles. The drunk soldiers wanted the money for themselves so they could spend it on cigarettes, alcohol, and sweets, and they began to interrogate him on where he'd hidden the money. Bobrov claimed he'd already spent it, but the soldiers didn't believe him so they began to beat him. As he took the beating and refused to give up the money, one soldier picked up a wooden chair and smashed it directly on Bobrov's head, striking his neck. This would lead to a spinal fracture, which would be completely untreated by the military doctors he reported it to after complaining of extreme pain. They chalked it up to nerves and sent him back to his unit. Bobrov describes being continuously beaten on by senior soldiers and junior officers. They would often get drunk and drag recruits out of their bunks for random beatings to entertain themselves. Few stools or chairs were unbroken inside the barracks, as they had all been used to beat the recruits with. On his very first night in the barracks, Bobrov was woken by his sergeant and dragged out of bed only to be punched in the stomach and head several times. When he collapsed on the ground, the sergeant then proceeded to kick him in the stomach. Other soldiers would round up the new recruits and order them to fetch them cigarettes with filters within 30 minutes, which was impossible as the base was remote and nowhere near a shopping center. Plus, conscripts are paid pithy sums each month which is what made the $14 US gift from his grandmother so valuable to Bobrov. 
It was several months' wages at once. Other times, the recruits would be ordered to bring soldiers money. If they failed, which was often, they were severely beaten. Bob Ralph would go on to develop a severe infection in his legs that made marching extremely painful. He attempted to escape from the base three times, finally successfully fleeing and heading to St. Petersburg, where he contacted an advocacy group called the Soldiers' Mothers' Organization. The group sent him to a hospital to get his injuries documented so he could be reported as unfit for service. It's there they found that Bob Ralph suffered from multiple traumas and concussions, as well as the spinal fracture in his neck. Another soldier, Private Andrei Sitchov, described being tied to a chair by his drunk superiors and beaten repeatedly over the course of a night. The only breaks he got was as his seniors returned to their drinking binge, before inevitably coming back to continue the beating. He wisely did not report the situation, but when he reported to the military doctor for treatment of his injuries, the doctor said he was fine. A few days later, gangrene had spread to most of his wounds, and he ended up having both his legs and genitalia amputated. New recruits are often given extremely poor quality uniforms which helps identify them as doohy, or ghosts. Soldiers who have served for at least two years are referred to as old-timers, while anyone past that is known as dede, or grandfather. Without a professional NCO corps, and with most Russian officers too busy working second jobs to pay the cost of their own uniforms and supplies, it's the dedes who are in charge of the barracks, and it's them who are the worst offenders and perpetrators of this systemic abuse. Recruits aren't just abused and have their personal belongings and even wages stolen from them, though. They're also exploited by their superiors. Recruits are often forced to work for locals doing manual labor for which the locals will pay their senior soldiers, who give nothing to the duhi. This is far from the worst fate, as new recruits are often prostituted out, an appalling practice that's been described as endemic inside the Russian military and is ironic for a culture that is so violently anti-gay. New recruits can face some pretty horrifying and disgusting non-physical abuse, though, as well. They can be sleep-deprived for days or weeks at a time, forced to wake up in the middle of the night and go for runs or do push-ups for hours on end. Sometimes they might be forced to run with little clothing in blistering winter conditions, which leads to frostbite, at times severe enough to require amputations. Recruits are often starved, with their food taken by senior soldiers much like school lunch bullies. However, one of the foulest abuses is the practice of forcing recruits to scrub toilets with a toothbrush. But if you're picturing the pristine porcelain thrones of American basic training, think again. These toilets are often simple holes in the ground, which must be scrubbed clean. If the abuser is particularly sadistic, they'll then force the recruit to brush his teeth with the same toothbrush afterwards. Over time, though, the West has become aware of the most common hazing practices. The first is known as the elephant. This ritual gets its name from the older generation Russian gas mask, which has a trunk-like tube through which a soldier breathes. A recruit will be forced to put on the mask and then have the other end sealed off, cutting off the air supply. The recruit is then forced to recite army regulations, sing patriotic songs, or do PT until they physically pass out. When the mask is unsealed and the recruit takes their first breath, they are immediately punched in the solar plexus. The next practice is known as the Batman. This involves a recruit lying on the bottom bunk of a bunk bed style army cot. Then they hang on to the top bunk with both their arms and legs and must hold for as long as possible. Several recruits will do the Batman at once, and the last one to let go is spared physical abuse. The first to let go is given the most abuse. The ritual known as the Crazy Deer involves a recruit being ordered to cross their hands over their forehead and bang their head against a wall repeatedly. Inevitably, this leads to concussions which can be severe. The hazing ritual that led to the amputation of Andrei Sitchov's legs and genitalia is known as the television. Here the recruit sits on a stool while holding another stool with a cup of water balanced on it. The stool he's sitting on is then pulled out from under him, and if the recruit wobbles and lets the cup of water fall, he's severely beaten. The ritual is named the television due to the fact that the recruit intently stares at the cup of water balanced on the stool he's holding while waiting for the stool underneath him to be pulled away. The bicycle involves waiting for a recruit to fall asleep, after which he has pieces of paper rolled together and put between his toes. Then the papers are set on fire. The way the recruit reacts by kicking his legs violently once his feet begin to burn is how the ritual gets its name. The confiscation is simple. Anything that a duha is sent by his family or friends belongs to the older soldiers, who steal everything. The recruit could tell his family and friends to simply send him nothing, except the older soldiers often force them to ask for specific things, and then steal it once it arrives. Next is the dried crocodile, a variation on the Batman. This one involves the recruit suspending himself face down between two bunk beds, then an AK with a bayonet fixed to it is placed pointing up directly under the recruit. The recruit must cling on for dear life or fall onto the bayonet. Often, other soldiers will beat the recruit with pillows trying to get him to fall. The ritual gets its name for the way the suspended recruit looks like a crocodile skin that's been stretched out to dry in the sun. Russian equipment is still largely outdated. 
which makes the birdie possible. In this ritual, the wires of an old 1930s field telephone is wrapped around two big toes of a recruit. The telephones work by hand cranking, which generates an electrical charge and inevitably shocks the recruit. The harder the phone is cranked, the worse the charge. Billiards is a particularly brutal form of torture. Here a recruit is ordered to put a billiards ball in his mouth while a soldier whacks it with a pool cue. This inevitably results in missing or chipped teeth. However, another variant of the torture involves forcing the recruit to bend over and drop their pants, and we'll leave the rest to your imagination. The pheasant, however, marks the final torture ritual one must undergo before graduating out of being a duha. In this ritual, the recruit drops his pants and crouches on the legs of an upside-down bench. The older soldiers will then line up and whip his bare butt with metal belt buckles. A recruit must endure 100 lashes to graduate, and if they fall off the bench, they must undergo the entire ritual all over again. Inevitably, all this torture comes with severe consequences. Recruits face lifelong injuries and even extreme amputations as we saw earlier, with mental disorders not being out of the norm. Suicide is endemic to the Russian armed forces, however, most of it resulting from the practice of Didovshina. But sometimes the recruits turn their weapons on their tormentors. There have been multiple incidents of recruits killing their fellow soldiers before attempting to flee to the countryside. Soviet Union veterans admit that severe hazing was always a practice in the Red Army, but it has increased exponentially in cruelty ever since the fall of the Soviet Union due to the underfunded state of the Russian military. Russia is not just too economically poor to feel the large military that it has, but it's also plagued by rampant corruption, which means funds don't always make it to their designated units. With senior officers too worried about making a living by working a second job, discipline has absolutely crumbled inside the Russian military. The result is not just that life is a living hell for Russian conscripts and even professional soldiers, but that the Russian military is an incompetent mess that is incapable of subduing its far less capable neighbor, Ukraine. Things in the southern region of Ukraine are about to go from bad to worse. Vladimir Putin has just declared martial law in Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. This likely is a desperate attempt to maintain control in the regions, but also has a much darker and sinister purpose. What is happening in these Ukrainian states is reminiscent of Nazi Germany, as Putin is literally trying to change the ethnic makeup of the region. Let's examine what martial law is, why Putin has implemented it in illegally annexed parts of Ukraine, and what it could mean for the future. However, before we dive in, imagine this haunting scenario. Overnight, your freedom is completely revoked. You can't leave your house without permission, and you have to support an enemy in their war efforts. Every day is a worse nightmare than the last. You step outside of your house. The streets are desolate as the sun begins to set over the distant hills. With everything that's been going on, you forgot to buy bread this morning, and without it, your family will starve. You look down the street to make sure no one's there and run down an alleyway. On the other side of the street is your local bakery. You dart out onto the main road where you hear a voice scream, HALT! You freeze, knowing that if you take another step, you could be shot. Three Russian soldiers walk up to you, rifles slung across their shoulders. What are you doing out after curfew? One of the soldiers asks, you explain that you forgot to buy bread and your family is starving. The soldier just laughs, they have no sympathy. Well, if you're headed to the bakery, you must have money on you. And all money should be going to pay the soldiers who are fighting for your freedom, like us. You stare at the soldier with pleading eyes. You ask them to show mercy, as you have two little kids and a wife at home. They just continue to laugh. One of the soldiers grabs your arms and holds them behind your back. Another searches your pockets and finds your wallet. They take the money out of it, throw the wallet to the ground, and just for good measure, punch you in the stomach. Now go back home and don't let us find you out after curfew again, the Russian soldier says, before spitting on you. The soldiers walk away laughing. This is what your country has turned into since Russia invaded. And now that martial law is in place, the military can do anything they want. This is the current reality in parts of southern Ukraine. But what exactly is martial law, and what does it allow Putin to do? If we think back to several months ago when the war had just started, the goals of Vladimir Putin were vague at best, and the ravings of a lunatic at worst. Just to recap how we got to where we are today, Putin proclaimed he wanted to re-establish a former Russian empire. He spewed lies and propaganda, stating that southern Ukraine had been stolen from Russia and that the citizens living there wanted to be reincorporated back to the motherland. Some people living in Ukraine did want this, but the vast majority enjoyed the independence and freedom from the oppressive regime of Russia and the democratic nature of the government. This brings us to the real reasons why Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Yes, he wanted to form a new Russian empire. However, it was the democratic nature of Ukraine and the country becoming more westernized that actually led Putin to invade. He knew that if Ukraine became part of the European Union, NATO, or allied itself with the West, it could threaten his rule in Russia. 
Paranoia is a common trait among ruthless dictators because if citizens realized that their lives could be better if they had a say in the government and then decided to start a revolution, dictators tend to lose their lives. Putin probably always has this thought in the back of his mind, and as Ukraine became more and more westernized, Putin felt that he had to attack to save himself. It's not entirely clear which former Russian empire Putin wants to re-establish, however. When the former Soviet Union collapsed, Russia lost a lot of territory in Eastern Europe, including Ukraine. However, if Putin is hoping to reform the Tsarist Empire of 1914, then there would be a lot more conflict in the future. It's important to remember that the Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia regions were illegally annexed by Russia. In September, a staged referendum was conducted where voters were met at the polls by armed Russian soldiers who held them at gunpoint until they voted for their states to be annexed by Russia. That's right, the Ukrainian people living in the annexed regions of Ukraine were given a choice to vote for their homeland to be incorporated into Russia or die. There's little doubt that many Ukrainians were killed during the referendum for refusing to vote for annexation. The United Nations and the majority of the world do not recognize Russia's authority in these regions, however, this doesn't matter to Putin. Russia has occupied southern Ukraine for several months now, so the question becomes why did Putin declare martial law now? Like many of Vlad's decisions, this one doesn't seem to be completely thought out. Martial law expands the power of the military and law enforcement agents in the region. Occupied Ukraine really didn't have much freedom to begin with. All Putin is doing by declaring martial law is giving a different name to what's already been happening. Under the umbrella of martial law, the military can impose curfews, restrict freedoms, take civilian property, enlist people into the army, and force residents to rebuild any destroyed infrastructure. Again, these things are already happening in the occupied territories. However, since Moscow hasn't declared martial law since the Soviet Union, this may be Putin's first official move to bring annexed parts of Ukraine into his Russian empire. But again, the question is why now? What does Putin get out of declaring martial law? Putin has not just initiated martial law in Ukraine, but in the rest of Russia as well. However, there are different tiers of martial law depending on where you live. In Russia, Putin has called for basic martial law, which means nothing is really going to change but citizens should be prepared to aid the military in its war effort by working in factories or enlisting in the army if asked. In southern Ukraine, the martial law is instated and labeled as maximum readiness, which means that the people in those regions will be asked to make sacrifices immediately to help Russia fight against the rest of Ukraine. Putin has continually said that the reason he needed to implement martial law is that Ukraine's government and its Western allies refused to accept the result of the annexation referendum as legitimate, which of course they weren't. Putin declared in one speech, As is well known, the regime in Kyiv has refused to recognize the will of the people. We are trying to resolve difficult large-scale challenges on providing security to Russia and protecting the future of Russia defending our people. What it really comes down to is that Russia has suffered a number of significant defeats in the war against Ukraine. Most recently, this has happened in the battle to control Lyman, where Ukrainian forces humiliated the Russian military by holding their ground and forcing the Russian army into full retreat. It's also important to note that Ukraine still controls parts of Donbass, where Putin has declared martial law, which means that the citizens living under Russian military control will be asked to not only support Russia but fight alongside them as well. Putin needed to declare martial law so that the military had the authority to use citizens as resources of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia however they deemed fit to defeat Ukrainian forces. Many Ukrainians have fled the Russian-occupied regions in the south, however not everyone was so lucky. Martial law will give the Russian military the authority to compel any civilian under their control to aid the Russian war effort, which is a breach of the Geneva Convention. But Vladimir Putin has no concern over the proper conduct of war or basic human rights, so he's more than happy to formally increase his military's authority in southern Ukraine to allow them to use Ukrainian citizens however they see fit. The crazy thing is that by instituting martial law, Putin may be trying to mobilize a Ukrainian-style territorial defense force made up of Russian officers and part-time reservists, which would be supplemented by civilians. The martial law also allows the military to have greater control over who comes in and out of each region. There's currently a seven-day ban on civilians entering any of the annexed regions. However, since Russia doesn't control all of the territory in the four regions, this ban on movement will be extremely hard to enforce. The martial law declared by Putin also has a propaganda component to it. By stating he has the authority to modify the way things are being run in southern Ukraine, he is reinforcing the false fact that there were elections in the region and that the people living in the region are now happily a part of Russia. The decisions that Putin is making are all part of the narrative that he's just trying to do what's best for the Russian people. However, the rest of the world isn't falling for it, and it seems that Russian citizens might be losing faith in old Vladi and his regime. The implementation of martial law will likely be used to secure more resources for Russia. One main aspect of martial law is that the military can now repurpose any business or manufacturing center that they need. 
For example, metalworking factories that once produced materials for infrastructure can be repurposed into building weapons and war vehicles. Companies that procure natural resources such as fossil fuels or minerals can be forced to give their supply directly to the military. Basically, martial law allows the Russian government to convert any and all parts of its economy into a war machine. However, the most atrocious part of the martial law implemented by Putin is it will allow for easier deportation of certain populations out of Ukraine and into Russia. This is where things get a little too close to how Nazi Germany acted in World War II. It's no secret that Putin wants to enact mass deportation of certain Ukrainian populations to parts of Russia. The reason he wants to do this is to change the ethnic majority in the region. In Putin's eyes, Ukraine and much of Eastern Europe should still be part of the Russian Empire. By deporting problematic people who claim to have a culture separate from Russia's, Putin can create a more homogenous state that's made up of people who are loyal to him. Putin's regime has claimed they're only using force to temporarily resettle people. However, the fact that certain people are being targeted for deportation strongly suggests there is a much more sinister agenda at work. Experts estimate that somewhere between 900,000 and 1.6 million Ukrainians have been deported from their homeland into Russia. It's not entirely clear where these people are being sent or what they're being forced to do, but there's a chance they're being put in camps where they're required to aid the Russian military by working in factories or dangerous mining operations. Obviously, this looks really bad for Putin and his regime, so they released a statement shortly before announcing that martial law would be coming, saying that the residents were free to evacuate from southern Ukraine and the government would not only help them relocate in any part of Russia, but would provide housing vouchers as well. This was a thinly veiled distraction from what was about to happen. Every free-thinking individual knew it was just more propaganda to make Putin look sympathetic as his military forced people onto transports and sent them deep into Russia. Martial law also allows Putin to send more troops to annexed regions of Ukraine without admitting he is losing the war. The Russian people are becoming more and more disheartened. Those who believe in the cause are starting to wane. Hundreds of thousands of Russians have fled the country to make sure they're not conscripted into the military. Putin is losing the support of his own people. However, by declaring martial law, he can ensure that the military keeps Russian citizens in line while also giving him a reason to send more troops to Ukraine. For propaganda purposes, Putin says that martial law will help ensure the ideals of Russia are being upheld in the annexed regions. But the more likely reason why Putin needs more troops in Ukraine is he's afraid he'll lose the war. This also answers the question of why now? Russian forces have been defeated and pushed back several times in recent months. A war that was only supposed to last a month or two is quickly approaching a year. Putin will never admit it, but in the back of his mind, he is likely scared. If Russia loses the war in Ukraine, or if the war gets drawn out for much longer, the people of Russia will see Vladimir Putin as being weak. There's a good chance if this happens, he'll be overthrown and executed by his own citizens. Therefore, Putin must maintain as much control and influence as possible. He's doing this by using his military and giving them more power through martial law. This will force businesses and defense contractors to align with his goals and provide him with the soldiers and resources necessary to continue fighting in Ukraine. It'll also allow Putin to not only control the populations in the annexed regions more easily, but will also allow him to control his citizens at home, especially if they start to become unruly or try to start a revolution against him. Putin and the rest of his regime believe that enacting martial law across Russia and southern Ukraine is a show of strength. However, many think it indicates how desperate they've become. The fact that Vladimir Putin needs to position his military in a way that ensures his citizens will continue to support him in his war effort is a telling sign that things are going very badly for him. The desperate tactics are less strategic and more of an indication that Putin and his allies are losing control. The sad part is that martial law will likely cause more death and despair in occupied Ukraine. As Putin becomes more desperate, he'll continue to escalate his tactics to ensure he remains in power and the war can continue on. However, if Putin ever loses control or Russia is defeated, it will not only be the end of Putin's reign, but likely his life as well. No Instagram, TikTok, or Rocky films. These are some of the craziest consequences if Russia ruled the world. To understand a world where Russia is the dominant power, we first have to understand what it is that Russia wants today. The invasion of Ukraine might have come out of nowhere for many people, but the truth is that this invasion was all but inevitable. And you might be surprised to hear this, but the US and NATO are not blameless in this. Certainly, it was Putin's decision to attack Ukraine, but NATO has seen the possibility of a conflict like this ever since the early 2000s, when they were considered 
considering formally including the Baltic states of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania into NATO. Time and again, Russia had warned after the fall of the Soviet Union against NATO expansion. And time and again, NATO ignored those warnings as it continued to expand east and into former Soviet republics. To be clear, we're not arguing that this was wrong. People should be free to dictate their own fate. And the Baltic nations feared Russia and felt they'd be safer in NATO's hands. Obviously, time has proven them right. The inclusion of the Baltic countries, though, put NATO forces on the doorstep of Russia. And for a brief moment, the world held its collective breath. Would Russia invade in retaliation and kick off a major global conflict? Thankfully, Russia didn't. But it's important to understand that this was a very real possibility, and NATO knew it. Expanding the alliance all the way to Russia's border was a red line all parties involved knew could trigger a military response. Instead, the conflict was delayed by a decade, when in 2014 Russia invaded and annexed Crimea. Eight years later, with Ukraine undeterred from joining NATO and the EU, Russia invaded the country with the intent of conducting a regime change. Vladimir Putin has promised that he does not intend to annex the former Soviet Republic or hold on to any of its territory after the war is over. But given that Russia has lied about preparing for an invasion, then carrying out said invasion, and not targeting civilians, frankly Putin can be trusted about as far as you can throw him at this point. But why was Ukraine ever worth invading in the first place? The Cold War might have ended in the West, but Russia has refused to admit defeat. And no one more so than Vladimir Putin, who still views his relationship with the West as a zero-sum game. There can only be one winner between Russia and NATO as far as he's concerned. This antagonism comes in large part from the shame of the Soviet collapse, but also from what has been perceived across much of Russia as the West infringing on the Russian identity itself. The spread of Western liberal values into the country, such as gender equality, support for LGBTQ communities, and racial harmony are seen by many conservative Russians as a direct attack on their identity as Russians. The West might have moved on from the Cold War social attitudes, but the Russians didn't, and the sting of their defeat in the Cold War only adds to their indignation at what they perceive to be the penetration of their society by Western institutions. This is due in part to extreme conservatism amongst a society that was walled off to the world for nearly 50 years, but also because Putin has used the intrusion of these Western values as a chance to create ultra-nationalist propaganda. Russians under Putin must stand strong against corrupting Western influence that still seeks to destroy Russia, again in the mind of Putin. And thus, by rejecting these values, Russians can strike a blow against the West. For the most part, it's not the Russians that want to reject these values, but they've been made to feel like they have to because of the file propaganda levied against them for decades. If Putin's going to defeat the West, after all, he needs domestic support to remain high, especially when the cost of antagonizing the West has historically been crippling sanctions. Another reason for the hostility between Russia and the West, though, is the matter of Russia's national security. Russia sits at the far end of the European plain, a vast swath of flat country that's notoriously difficult to defend against invasion. That's why Russia has suffered terribly over the centuries from European invasions. If Russia is to remain secure, it needs to keep potential adversaries at arm's length, and that means keeping them off their doorstep. With NATO already on its northwest flank, allowing Ukraine to draw closer to NATO and the EU was strategically unacceptable for Russia. Again, NATO knew this, and yet continued to flirt with the idea of Ukraine joining NATO on purpose. While there's no way to prove it, the invasion of Ukraine is exactly the scenario that NATO was hoping for, as it now gives the West a way to break Russia without directly attacking it. Sadly, the Ukrainians must bear the cost of Russia's defeat. So, what if Russia could achieve all of its foreign policy objectives? What would a world dominated by Russia look like? First, we have to stress, this is going to be pure fiction. Russia is not powerful enough economically or militarily to achieve anything that we're about to lay out. Under Vladimir Putin, Russia has become an isolated hermit kingdom whose economy is shattered and military is incapable of winning a conflict against an exceptionally weaker opponent. So buckle up, because we're about to take a dive into Putin's mind and imagine a world where Santa Claus is real, fairies exist, and Russia is the world's dominant power. First, to become dominant, Russia has to neutralize the military, political, and economic influence of both the United States States and China. A successful war against China is remotely possible for Russia. China's military might be big, but it still lags behind in modernity, and more importantly, it has no experience in modern combat. As poorly as the Russian military has performed in Ukraine, we can expect the Chinese military to perform even worse. But again, this is pure fantasy because, simply put, neither nation has the military might to completely neutralize the other. Instead, a war between Russia and China would drag on to become a multi-year stalemate where neither side makes much progress and both sides declare peace simply because 
because the war has become so costly for them. Economically speaking, Russia has an even worse chance of neutralizing China, as its own economy is a fraction of China's, and shrinking. With the world blacklisting Russia since its invasion, it's lost any leverage it might have possessed over China. Both of those problems are only magnified exponentially when facing off against the United States. But the US has a third advantage – it wields far more political might than either Russia or China. The world currently exists largely under the leadership of the United States, who enjoys the benefits of having allies and strategic partnerships all over the world. But let's just say, somehow, the US and China are both militarily, politically, or economically subjugated by Russia. What now? First, we can expect Russia to export its model of authoritarianism around the world. There is nothing an autocrat like Vladimir Putin fears more than being removed from power, and Russia has a long history of violently removing rulers from power. Thus, to keep the world under Russia's yoke, we would see the end of the age of free, open media. Instead, news outlets would be nationalized exactly the same way they were inside the Soviet bloc during the Cold War. Information would be tightly controlled, and dissenting opinions violently suppressed. Those who defy the state would face steep fines or jail time, though the more closely aligned with Russia a nation is, the more subversive an offender is seen as, worse consequences such as death are not out of the question. Russia currently ranks 10th on the Global Impunity Index for killing of journalists, but that's hardly surprising for a country that sent assassins all the way to Britain to murder a defector who slandered Putin's regime. Modern Russia tightly controls information, and it's learned to be quite good at it. While a few independent media outlets do exist, a rapidly decreasing number ever since the Ukrainian invasion, most of Russia's media is nationalized and gets its talking points directly from the Kremlin. Russia is adept at hiding suppression of free speech, as laws meant to protect the people, such as the current law that promises up to 15 years in prison for anyone speaking about the truth of the Ukrainian invasion. Russia has enacted this law to supposedly combat misinformation that hurt national morale. The right to assembly, one of the West's most cherished values, is also technically non-existent in Russia. So while on paper you are allowed to stage protests, you must receive a permit to do so. Perhaps unsurprisingly, you're never going to get that permit to protest something the state doesn't want you protesting. Russia has the vague appearance of liberal values, but is in fact one of the world's most autocratic states. What's important though is maintaining the illusion to avoid full-blown dissent and revolution. And this is exactly what you could expect to see happening in your own country if Russia ruled the world. If you don't like what Russia is doing, you better keep it to yourself. Because in a world dominated by Russia, your own government will punish you for speaking out. It happened during the Cold War, and it would happen again. To achieve this, Russia would install pro-Kremlin leaders around the world. Much like during the Soviet bloc days, you would still likely be allowed to vote, but only from a pool of candidates approved by your government, which itself would be handpicked by the Kremlin itself. Opposition candidates might even be allowed, much in the same way that they're allowed inside Russia today, but more often than not, these opposition candidates would meet with unfortunate ends. Many would suddenly be accused of tax fraud or similar crimes and imprisoned or disqualified from running for office, while others would simply be murdered. This was Putin's answer to the challenge from Boris Nemtsov, a Russian politician who publicly called for the public to march against Putin's government for his invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Nemtsov was shot by an unknown assailant as he crossed a bridge at 11.30 p.m. on February 27, 2015. Life under Russian global occupation, however, wouldn't be all bad, except for being constantly spied on and having no civil liberties. Unlike the Soviet Union, Putin's Russia is not communist and has fully embraced a free market. After all, it made Putin personally extremely rich, though much of that wealth has simply been stolen from oligarchs that dared to oppose Putin. You could expect to have much of the same luxuries you enjoy today, and the global economy would remain largely undisturbed. However, you can forget about social media apps like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Instead, you'd have the equivalent of their Chinese counterparts heavily monitored and censored platforms where the government can and will punish you for producing material they find unacceptable for public decency. In both Russia and China's case, this happens to involve anything that goes against the official government position. Though thankfully, unlike China, Russia really has no problem with silly dances and K-pop boy bands, so you could still enjoy both. What the world would lose under Russian leadership is not so much its material prosperity, but its freedom of self-determination. The liberal values that Western democracies are built on would be stripped away one by one, because those same liberal values present a challenge to the authoritarian model of rule. Any opinion contrary to the official state position would not be tolerated, and your national government would be made up of Kremlin-approved leadership that works to support a Russian-first agenda. As Putin today gathers much of his support from ultra-conservative Russians, you can also expect to see a dramatic reversal in race and sex equality, as well as the rights of LGBTQ citizens. Nationalism would be on the rise around the world, though ultimately all would swear allegiance to one man and one man alone, your new Vladi Dadi. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin.
Thankfully, to even come close to achieving global hegemony, Putin would first have to neutralize both China and America. If Russia's invasion of Ukraine has proven anything, though, it's that Russia is completely incapable of such a task, and if anything, Putin must accept that he now lives in a world dominated by the West. Ultimately, it's up to the Russian people if they're willing to turn into a modern North Korea-style hermit kingdom, or if they'll remove Putin and his henchmen from power and end Russia's decades-long zero-sum game versus the world. Because while Putin is busy telling his own population that the West hates them, us Westerners are too busy enjoying euphoria, stupid TikTok dances, and the latest Pokemon game to care about a rivalry with Russia. It's the most advanced stealth fighter ever developed, capable of defeating any radar ever invented, and it can kill 10 American F-22 Raptors with just one missile, at least if you listen to the Russian Ministry of Defense. But why is an aircraft the Russians claim is more advanced than the American F-22 and F-35 conspicuously absent over the skies of Ukraine? exactly where it's needed the most by Russian forces. The Su-57 is a Russian multi-role fighter that's Russia's first attempt at a fifth-generation aircraft. It was conceived in 1999 after its predecessor, the Mikoil Project 144, proved to be entirely too expensive to actually put into production. The Project 144 was meant to be an answer to America's own F-22, which was at the time nearing completion and initial operational capability. However, the collapse of the Soviet Union led to an economic crisis and the project struggled to find adequate funding. The MiG-144 would have its maiden flight in February 2000 and then be cancelled shortly after. The Su-57, NATO codenamed Felon, was meant to build upon the successes of the 144 and feel the true fifth-generation fighter. By now, the United States was starting to churn out the F-22 Raptor, and Russia had no answer to this critical threat. But almost inevitably, the Felon ran into its own financial difficulties, and a program that was meant to produce a fleet of fighters by the mid-2000s would only deliver its first operational aircraft in 2020. Russia couldn't afford to produce the Su-57 on its own, though, and troubles began early when Russia and India signed an agreement to co-develop the aircraft in September 2010. As the project evolved, however, Indian engineers voiced serious concerns about the aircraft's capabilities and survivability against American fifth-generation fighters. By 2014, India had lost faith in the Su-57 and formally abandoned the program, leaving Russia to finance it on its own. This immediately put a massive financial strain on Russia, further compounded by sanctions of high-technology goods from the West after its annexation of Crimea. The Su-57 struggled through development, and a fleet once envisioned to consist of over 100 aircraft ended up producing only a dozen or so test models. In 2018, Russia claimed that the Su-57 took part in combat operations in Syria. However, there's no real proof that the jet performed any combat duties in the country. It's very likely, then, that Russia merely deployed the plane there to fly a few non-combat sorties so as to attempt to rouse interest from foreign investors, a very common tactic by the Russian defense industry. With a poorly diversified economy under pressure from sanctions, Russia relies heavily on foreign buyers to fund its weapons development programs. Despite no verifiable proof of the plane's combat record, Russia claims that it partook in combat operations both in Syria and now in Ukraine, where Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu claimed that Su-57s took part in operations to neutralize Ukrainian air defenses, eliminating multiple Ukrainian surface-to-air missile batteries. Since we've all learned that Russia literally never lies ever, this is an impressive feat for an airplane that's technically still in development. What's more impressive about this claim, however, is the fact that the Su-57 is not even believed by Western observers to be a true stealth aircraft, merely one with stealth characteristics. Observers point to difficulties by the Russians in joining panels of the body together tightly enough to reduce radar return, as well as its glaringly non-stealthy engines. The body of the aircraft is also significantly less stealthy than American counterparts, giving off far larger radar returns from the sides and rear. This, however, is in line with the Russian philosophy of operating aircraft only within the safety of ground-based air defenses. The Russians simply couldn't afford to field an all-aspect stealth aircraft and thus focused only on frontal stealth. The aircraft also appears to lack another quality of a fifth-generation fighter, data link capabilities. While tests are underway to have the Su-57 speak with a drone companion, this is far from the capabilities of the US F-35, which can operate as a sort of mini air control platform in place of traditional AWACS, speaking with a variety of friendly aircraft and helping guide weapons and planes to their targets. However, the Su-57 does have some design advantages over real fifth-generation aircraft in America's arsenal. For one, it's far more maneuverable than any US aircraft, and this is a big clue to the fact that the Russians know this is not a peer to an American fifth-generation fighter. 
That's because the super maneuverability is not a design feature of a traditional 5th gen aircraft, which are designed to operate as assassins, not knife fighters. F-35s and F-22s are built to engage enemy targets from beyond visual range with advanced AIM-120D missiles that have ranges in excess of 90 miles. Not only is this missile range outside the range of most other enemy missiles, but the stealth characteristics of an F-22 or F-35 means that an enemy being fired on won't even be able to detect the stealth fighter until it's much, much closer, estimated at about three dozen or so miles. With limited internal payloads of six to eight missiles, stealth aircraft should never be involved in a dogfight. Thus, super maneuverability is only desired if you have reason to believe your aircraft will be forced into dogfights because it's not stealthy enough or has the targeting capabilities to engage in a long-range fight. So while the Su-57 is capable of some truly impressive acrobatic feats, this will be meaningless in over 90% of engagements against an adversary such as the U.S. Air Force. Further giving clues to the fact that the Su-57 is not a true stealth aircraft are its cheek-mounted radars, which allow it to guide missiles to target at far more extreme angles than its American counterparts. This allows the Su-57 to turn further away from its target than an American plane and still maintain a good radar lock. But you only build this capability if you expect your aircraft to have to fight at close ranges where extreme maneuvers are required, or if you expect your aircraft to have to notch or defend against enemy missiles while guiding its own to the target. It's likely the Russian knew from the start the felon would be detectable at far greater range than U.S. aircraft and would need the ability to maneuver away from incoming missiles while maintaining a lock for its own. Despite this, the Russian Ministry of Defense claims the Su-57 is not just a match, but superior to the F-22 and F-35. If that's the case, then where is Russia's premier aircraft when its army needs it the most in the skies over Ukraine? First, if all claims about the Su-57 are true, Russia simply wouldn't be able to field them in large enough numbers to make much of a difference. Currently, there are only about a dozen or so Su-57s in operation, and most of these are test aircraft not meant for combat duty. This likely only leaves just over half a dozen that could carry weapons to target successfully. But there's no evidence outside of Russian claims that this has actually happened. The best the world can manage is a video of an aircraft with a similar shape to the Su-57 captured on video early in the war carrying out an air-to-ground attack. Most experts agree that if the Su-57 is truly engaged in combat with Ukraine, then it's not seeing frontline duty. Rather, the plane is likely only firing standoff attack munitions at long ranges from the safety of Russian airspace. Armed with the right weapons, the Su-57 could potentially stay out of range of Ukrainian air defenses and destroy them, as claimed by Russia. But there's practically no chance that Russia is willing to risk flying its flagship aircraft over the front lines where it could potentially be shot down, causing Russia heaps of international embarrassment, at least more than it's earned so far. This is doubly true when you consider that Russia also fears Western weapons employed by Ukraine and knows for a fact that Western nations are feeding a steady diet of intelligence to Ukraine's armed forces. So why is the Su-57 not in operation over Ukraine? First, there's simply not enough of them to be worth employing. Russia has goals of just under 100 of the fighter by 2027, something that is completely unrealistic given extreme Western sanctions against the nation. If your military is having to strip washers and microwaves from microchips, you're not going to be fielding 100 stealth fighters in five years. Secondly, the plane was almost certainly not nearly as capable as Russia claims it to be. And the last thing Russia wants is the embarrassment of having one shot down by Ukraine. Russia has lost an estimated 144 aircraft in the war, with two dozen of those being frontline manned fighters or ground attack aircraft. The threat environment is too high for Russia to risk the PR disaster that would ensure if a felon was shot down by the Ukrainians. The Soviet-Afghan war raged for 10 years and killed over 15,000 Russian soldiers. It was a devastatingly costly campaign for the Soviet Union that directly led to its downfall and collapse. On February 24, 2022, Putin said, hold my beer, and launched an even worse military disaster. But is Putin's Ukrainian invasion really a failure, or are we all guilty of falling for Western propaganda, as Russia would claim? Getting good intelligence on the ongoing invasion of Ukraine is difficult which makes drawing conclusions equally difficult. Wars are very dynamic things, and what starts off blazingly well can end in disaster or quagmire. Just as the United States after 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. In both cases, U.S. forces utterly decimated the conventional forces of each nation and then spent 20 years fighting an insurgency, only to leave with a strategic defeat that left the situation worse for America than before the invasion. 
But Putin's invasion of Ukraine has had immediate and very large red flags straight from day one that signal this will be one of Russia's worst defeats since the start of World War II. For starters, it's become abundantly clear that Vladimir Putin was operating on very faulty intelligence when he launched the invasion. Shortly before Russian forces moved to staging areas, he tasked his intelligence apparatus with infiltrating Ukraine and bribing or intimidating Ukrainian military and political officials into cooperating with Russia. These intelligence agents were also supposed to take the general temperature of the population in order to gauge whether or not Ukraine could muster the will to fight an invasion. Perhaps unsurprisingly for the Russian dictator, the verdict was exactly what he wanted to hear. Ukraine was not just ready for an invasion, but its population would welcome Russian soldiers with open arms and warm borscht. Well, that's the problem with being a dictator surrounded by yes-men. Nobody is going to tell you the truth. The second problem with running such a regime is that your underlings are no doubt just as murderous and corrupt as you are. So it was of no surprise when rumors began to circulate that the Russian intelligence agents had not just um, borscht their job up, but had actually siphoned off large amounts of funds dedicated to their intelligence operations into private accounts. To be fair, Russia's operatives had succeeded in some ways. For instance, when the invasion reached Kherson, the bridges leading to the vitally important city were supposed to have been mined and prepped for demolition. Somebody, though, had ordered the mines and explosives removed, clearing the way for Russian invaders to cross the bridges. President Zelensky would respond by firing multiple senior political leaders from the region. Yet overwhelmingly, as Russian troops crossed the border into Ukraine, they were met with Molotovs and Kalashnikovs, not borscht and hugs as expected. But this wasn't the only strategic failure on Russia's behalf, even before the fighting started. As planning for the invasion began, Russia failed to account for the current state of Ukraine's armed forces. In 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, it did so with little opposition from Ukraine's armed forces. Overwhelmingly, the Ukrainian military melted away and retreated from the fighting. Eight years later, Russia believed that Ukraine's armed forces would repeat their performance of 2014 but failed to take into account that for the last eight years, the United States had sent hundreds of trainers and senior military personnel to train Ukraine in order to restructure their armed forces. While the process was still ongoing and incomplete as the invasion started, the military that met the Russian invaders was a vastly different machine than what retreated in mass during the 2014 invasion. More mobile, more efficient, and trained in Western doctrine, Ukraine's military did not fall back as expected, but put up stiff resistance that soon slowed Russia's advances to a crawl. The failure to account for both Ukraine's willingness to fight and its military's new capabilities led to immediate disaster at the start of the war. Russia opened its gambit for Ukraine with a deep penetration air assault straight into the political heart of the nation, Kyiv. Its plan was simple. And given its 2014 successes and perceived overwhelming overmatch in firepower, should have worked. Fly Russia's most elite air assault forces to the outskirts of the capital, set up an air bridge, fly in reinforcements, and walk into Kyiv to execute Zelensky and replace him with a pro-Kremlin figure. The stubborn and uncooperative former Soviet Republic soon once more would be back in the fold. Except that's not how things turned out. For starters, the air assault into Kyiv was terribly prepared and executed even worse. The linchpin of the entire operation was the Anatov Airport, which was the primary target of Russia's air assault on Kyiv. Located just 10 miles from the heart of the capital, this airport had large enough runways to accommodate Russia's heavy lift airplanes. A successful assault here would allow Russia to simply fly in heavy equipment and rapidly move into Kyiv itself. But Ukrainian resistance was not just stiffer than anticipated, but better equipped. As two to three dozen Russian helicopters approached the airport, they were met with manpad fire. Regular air defenses had been successfully neutralized, but Ukrainian defenders were armed with manpads provided by the West. Multiple helicopters were either destroyed or forced to land, disrupting the flow of the assault. Eventually, the defenders were overwhelmed, but Ukraine had been warned by the American CIA of an assault on the airport and was already mustering response forces. Without any heavy vehicles of their own, Russia's paratroopers were dependent on Russian aircraft for support. But these were met by Ukrainian fighters and were limited in their effectiveness. Ukrainian ground attack aircraft such as the Su-24s also pounded Russian positions. By the end of the first day of fighting, Russia's elite paratroopers had been defeated and forced to retreat into the forest outside the airport. There, they linked up with the Russian ground assault coming from Belarus and eventually wrestled control of the airport away from the Ukrainians. However, by then the airport had been so badly damaged, Russia couldn't use it anymore. Russia's failure to account for Ukrainian anti-tank weapons meant that the Belarus assault force was greatly delayed in linking up with the air assault. Left relying on spotty air cover, the lightly armed paratroopers were defeated and forced to retreat, while the heavy fighting and Ukrainian sabotage destroyed runways and made the airport impossible to use as an air bridge. 
This type of extremely shoddy strategic thinking quickly became a hallmark of the entire invasion. It very soon became apparent that Russia was either incompetent, was entirely too confident of its own abilities, or had severely underestimated Ukrainian will and capabilities. Truth is, all three of those things are true to a degree. Russian incompetence is evident in the entire invasion plan. As many Western observers noted, Russia made the completely unprecedented and confounding decision to launch a full-scale invasion without first conducting an air and missile campaign inside Ukraine. Modern military doctrine states that before using ground forces, one first uses strike aircraft and missile assaults to soften up a nation's defenses. This includes strikes against air defenses, command and control nodes, supply and logistics hubs, and radar installations. When the US and coalition forces launched Desert Storm, air power was used to dismantle Iraq's ability to effectively control its own forces before a single tank crossed into Kuwait. Attacks against Iraqi air bases and radar sites also allowed coalition aircraft to rule the skies and denied Iraqi forces air support. Russia did none of this and instead launched its air campaign at the same time as its troops were crossing the border into Ukraine. What's more, it's become clear that its intelligence and recon capabilities were not up to par, as a significant number of its strikes failed to neutralize intended targets. This left Ukraine with a fully operational air force and air defense network that took a heavy toll on the Russians, while allowing Ukrainian aircraft to provide fire support for ground forces. Given that Russia operates the second largest air fleet in the world, it's absolutely baffling that the Russian aerospace forces, whose budget is larger than all of Ukraine's military budget combined, could not and still haven't won the war for Ukraine's skies. As the war continued, Russian basic military competency came into serious question. Everywhere you looked, it seemed as if Russian's military planners simply weren't up to the task, though this analysis might be skewed by the staggering amount of corruption within the Russian military. Things like bad tires leading to dozens of perfectly operational vehicles being abandoned can be blamed on corruption, with the unit commander skimming the maintenance and acquisition budget and buying cheap Chinese tires for their vehicles instead of the military-grade tires they require. But the fact that abandoned vehicles showed clear signs of sun rot in their tires on only one side of the tire is evidence that Russian maintenance personnel are either poorly trained or its military is criminally inept. When kept in storage, vehicles must be rotated on a set schedule in order to avoid sun damage on only one side of the vehicle. It was clear that Russia had not done this, and the simple mistake cost them tens of millions in lost vehicles that Ukraine happily put to use. The US military has a saying, Amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. Russia, it seems, has maintained its Soviet-era doctrine of under-equipping its units with logistics personnel and vehicles. Compared to an American unit, Russia assigns on average half as many logistics personnel and vehicles, meaning that its ability to project power far from its own borders is very limited. This was no clearer than in the suburbs of Kyiv, where the infamous 40-mile-long convoy of military vehicles would have its day in military infamy. Starved of fuel, ammo, and even food, Russian personnel either abandoned the vehicles or were forced to come to a dead standstill. The rapid advance on Kyiv, which was the linchpin of Russia's entire war strategy, failed because of its own doctrinal incompetence, and Ukraine took full advantage ruthlessly attacking Russian supply lines. Rather than kill tanks, Ukrainian special forces went hunting for Russian trucks. To great effect, each truck lost meant another 2-3 to three tons less food, ammo, and fuel, which meant an even slower and more vulnerable advance. Russia inevitably was forced to retreat from Kyiv and instead focused on its more successful operations in the east of Ukraine. Here it was steadily gaining ground, but the arrival of Western smart weapons such as US HIMARS rapidly changed the strategic picture for Russia. Failing to take into account the use of smart weapons, Russia suffered staggering losses of command personnel and supplies. This wasn't the only way that Russia failed to take into account how 21st century war was waged. As horrible electronic and signals intelligence discipline directly led to the assassination of dozens of senior military officers and the destruction of dozens of strategically important targets, Russian military personnel and reporters were freely streaming from near or adjacent to sensitive military sites, and its leaders were often using unsecured communication methods. All of this intelligence was very quickly scooped up by the West and directly fed to the frontline Ukrainian units armed with smart munitions, with predictable results for the Russians. In six months of fighting, Russia has lost more senior officers than the US lost in all of its conflicts since World War II, and it all comes down to a basic failure to understand 21st century warfare, as well as gross incompetence. Despite all this, however, Russia was winning the war for Ukraine, even if it was at an incredibly unsustainable win rate. However, in early September, Ukraine launched a massive counteroffensive that changed this and exposed yet another strategic failure from Russia. 
For well over a month, Ukraine had very loudly broadcast its plans to launch an invasion in the south with the goal of retaking Kherson. Russia took the bait and moved many of its best fighting forces from the north to the south. When the attack was launched, Ukrainian shaping operations using long-range precision HIMARS strikes led to some modest gains around the city. However, Russian forces were completely blindsided by a massive Ukrainian counteroffensive in the north, where its forces were weakest. While Ukraine had exercised strict operational security to keep the offensive a secret, even Russian military bloggers had made note of the buildup of Ukrainian forces in the north. Russian intelligence, however, completely missed the clues, and its forces were utterly overwhelmed, leading to a massive defeat and panicked withdrawal from the region. Russian apologists were quick to point out that the units in the north were some of Russia's least effective, and thus Ukraine's win is only temporary, as the moment that Russia's regular forces return to the area, Ukraine will be on the back foot once more. Yet this does not ring true at all, as a growing body of evidence shows that units such as Russia's vaunted First Guards tank army was present at Kharkiv and had not only been defeated but forced to flee in a panic, leaving behind many of its tanks for the Ukrainians. This is a clear indication that even Russia's best forces are having great difficulty inside Ukraine. The First Guards tank army was the very vanguard of Russia's ground forces. This was the force that was meant to smash into the teeth of NATO's best defenses in case of war and win. But what's perhaps even more telling for Russia's difficulties is the fact that even with Ukraine launching an offensive only miles from its own border, Russia's air force appeared to be mostly MIA from the fight. When you can't project air power literally miles from your own border, your military is in seriously bad shape. So is Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine a failure? Well, after the Kharkiv offensive and the panicked retreat of its military, Russia has the dubious distinction of becoming Ukraine's number one supplier of military vehicles. Directly supplying your enemy with more heavy vehicles than they had before you started fighting is not the best way to win a war. But Russia remains a massive military power, even if it seems incapable of using that power with any great amount of precision or aptitude. Reports from the Kharkiv offensive clearly show that the Russian military is suffering from serious morale problems, and there's even reports of one artillery unit not undertaking a single fire mission during one day of fighting because the entire crew was drunk. This would seem incredible in a Western military, but it's frighteningly commonplace inside of the Russian military where discipline is incredibly low even during peacetime. Such incidents were commonplace during both Chechen conflicts. Russia has not lost the battle for Ukraine, and the war is almost inevitably to drag on for another six months or longer. But strategically, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a definite failure, even if it were to magically win overnight for some reason. For its aggression, Russia has become a pariah state, and unprecedented Western sanctions, bordering on what it might face in case of a real war against the West, have left the Russian economy in a seriously perilous state. For the moment, the worst of the damage is being contained, thanks to a large war chest Putin had accumulated before the war. But that money will run out sooner rather than later, given that half of that money is in Western bank accounts that are now frozen. Sanctions will soon bite into the Russian economy even harder than they have been, and the ruble is seen as a Potemkin currency that's only being propped up by extreme measures that simply can't last. But the real problem for Russia is that many of its best and brightest professionals and artists have fled the nation in droves, weakening its ability to compete in a 21st century global economy. For its military, sanctions have been especially painful. Cut off from advanced Western technological components, Russia's military has nearly exhausted its supply of precision weapons. It's also having great difficulty manufacturing things such as air defense missiles, with one plant shut down and its workers told they could either go on unpaid leave or get paid to go and fight in Ukraine. When you're sending trained engineers to go fight and die in a trench, you're not doing your future self any favors. Even if Russia were to win in Ukraine, it would do so at a cost so steep that some in the West wonder if the nation isn't even now under the threat of breaking up. What would be left of Russia is a shadow of a power with a military that would take a decade or more to rebuild, and forced to rebuild with 20th century technology as it remains cut off from Western imports. Reduced to a shadow of itself, Russia's only real clout internationally would be its formidable nuclear arsenal. However, the clearest sign that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a massive strategic failure is that its very goal was to prevent the strengthening of the West against Russia. Yet the result is that Vladimir Putin is the only Russian leader who ever set out to weaken NATO and accidentally made it even stronger, thanks to Sweden and Finland's ascension into the alliance. At this point, Vladimir Putin has so thoroughly crippled his own nation that the American CIA should be naming buildings in his honor for his hard work in weakening the US's chief rival. Its influence is floundering overseas as part of the world it formerly held in its iron grip turns its back on the once mighty nation.
As it's increasingly isolated on the world stage, the West only grows stronger. Its military expedition into a neighboring nation has gone catastrophically wrong, proving to the world that the military of the once-feared superpower is a largely hollow, poorly led, and poorly trained force. Now thousands of casualties and even more wounded veterans are adding to the growing voices of dissent from within. But this isn't Russia today, this is the Soviet Union in 1989, just two years before its official collapse. The question is, will modern Russia collapse as its predecessor did, and what would it take to collapse this once mighty nation? The question of collapse is a difficult and tricky one to discuss in relation to Russia. It is almost impossible that the Russian state will simply dissolve, as while there are regions who would make a bid for independence if given the chance, internal cohesion is strong amongst most of the republics that remained within Russia after the end of the Cold War. A collapse of Russia is thus more likely to mean significant economic crash, along with the end of the Putin regime and any possible successor that he might support. So, how do we get there? For Russians, a possible collapse is a lot more terrifyingly close than the state media would ever let it be known. Firstly, the war in Ukraine is going to be the chief catalyst in any possible collapse of the current Russian regime. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan led to a decade-long quagmire that sucked up resources and men. Unlike the United States and its own follies in the Middle East, the Soviet Union didn't have the benefit of an incredibly deep pocket and partner nations to fund and support failed military adventurism for years on end. Today, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is increasingly looking like another Soviet Afghanistan, but only much worse. In the Soviet invasion, the United States helped provide training and light weapons to Mujahideen fighters fending off Soviet troops. This resulted in a stalemate, where the Soviets controlled the cities while the Mujahideen controlled the countryside. But there are several fundamental differences between the Afghani Mujahideen and modern Ukraine. The first is that Ukraine already had an organized Western-style national military when the war began in February 2022. By comparison, the Mujahideen were an asymmetric, decentralized force that was largely impossible to coordinate. While this had its strengths in combating the superior Soviet war machine, Ukraine's ability to field a professional military allows it to fight in a coordinated national campaign that has been incredibly successful so far in stopping and even reversing the Russian offensive. It's exactly because Ukraine fields a professional military that heavy weapon assistance can be provided to its armed forces, something that would have been impossible or impractical in Afghanistan. At the start of the war, it was feared that Russia's superior military would quickly overwhelm Ukraine's defenses. This would have made supplying the country with modern military weapons a futile act, as they'd simply be surrendered or destroyed, and not even reach the battlefield in time to matter. However, as Ukraine scores tactical defeat after tactical defeat on Russian forces and even launches counterattacks to reclaim territory, it's become clear to the West that Ukraine has the expertise and numbers to actually stand up to Russia long enough for heavy weapons to make an impact. At first, this meant supplying Ukraine with Cold War systems sourced from unaligned parties or stockpiles of some NATO members. But now, the floodgates are increasingly opening on the supply of modern Western firepower. U.S. HIMARS, Harpoon anti-ship missiles, and counter-battery radars, for instance, have all inflicted disasters upon the Russian military. As other nations join in providing modern equipment to Ukraine, Russia is going to face an increasing number of modern weapon systems. This is something it is woefully unprepared for, both because its military training is woefully inadequate for modern war, and because as the war drags on, it's increasingly relying on Cold War-era weapon systems that simply cannot compete versus Western weapons. But new Western arms isn't Russia's only strategic problem, because it's also facing a morale crisis amongst its troops. As casualties mount and progress on the battlefield is measured in meters, Russian troops, many of which are conscripts, are becoming increasingly difficult to manage, at times even to the point of outright sedition. This has forced senior officers to the front lines as their troops are no longer trusted to operate without direct and immediate supervision. And in turn, this has led to staggering numbers of casualties amongst its senior officer corps, with as many as 14 generals and 56 colonels killed since the war began. As senior military echelons are thinned out, Russia's military loses what little expertise it had to begin with, leading to increased breakdown in command and control and increasingly deficient performance. It's difficult to get unbiased polling from Russia, as the nation has banned nearly all independent media when the war began to turn for the worse. But while the majority of Russian people seem to support the war right now, as it continues to drag on and military disasters pile on, their support will only last so long. Vladimir Putin will also soon have to deal with thousands upon thousands of returning veterans, many of them wounded and maimed, who are deeply unhappy with the war. This should sound like a familiar scenario to Putin, as it is exactly how the Bolsheviks helped launch their own revolution, which saw the imperial government ousted from power. 
But if there is a silver lining to the scenario for Putin, it's that there is no major dissenting political power within Russia. A student of history, Putin has purged any would-be opponents and dismantled any political opposition to his rule for over two decades. What remains is a small movement for true democracy, but without an influential leader to help coordinate it and fan the flames of revolution. By murdering and imprisoning his opposition without mercy, Putin might have helped avert his own overthrow from power. Yet, Russia remains a pressure cooker, and the pressure is only piling up. Even as you watch this episode, Ukrainian troops are being trained in the West to use modern weapon systems being provided to them in increasing numbers. The US has even helped finance the training of new Ukrainian soldiers in Western nations, where they can receive expert Western training and complete safety from Russian attack. As the war drags on, Ukraine's proficiency only increases, while it's obvious that Russia's own is in continuous decline. Even its stockpiles of smart weapons are all but depleted, with only those held in reserve in case of war against NATO remaining. To punctuate the point, it's been reported that Russia has been using S-300 air defense missiles in ground attack mode, a move of sheer desperation. If mounting casualties isn't enough to collapse the public support for the war, then a military defeat is sure to. Ukraine is currently incapable of inflicting such a defeat on Russia, but if the war continues for years, as many predict it will, the probability of Ukrainian victory becomes ever greater. If Putin's war machine suffers a humiliating defeat and forced retreat in Ukraine, it'll mean the political end of Putin and his regime. And he knows this, which is why some fear that he might resort to weapons of mass destruction if such a defeat seems likely. But using a nuclear weapon or large numbers of chemical weapons in Ukraine may mean a collapse of the Putin regime anyway. If Russia were to launch such an attack, the nation will be completely isolated internationally, as it becomes a pariah state. As damaging as current sanctions are, they will pale in comparison with the economic and political price to be paid for using weapons of mass destruction. On the topic of sanctions, these too might pave the way for a political collapse of the Russian government. To date, Russia has seen some of the toughest sanctions placed on a nation in recent history. Yet, the Russian economy seems to be weathering these sanctions very well. In fact, in July, the Russian ruble hit its strongest level since May 2015 when it hit a high of 52.3 versus the dollar. This resurgence after the collapse prompted by sanctions actually led to the central Russian bank to try to weaken the ruble on purpose so as to keep their exports competitively priced. As Russian President Vladimir Putin said, the idea was clear, crush the Russian economy violently. They did not succeed. But is that true? Are sanctions failing and Russia is actually flourishing? Russia's largest source of revenue is its exports of energy, including oil, gas, and coal. With oil prices at historic highs, Russia's exports to the very people trying to sanction it are leaving the country flush with cash. In just the first 100 days of the war in Ukraine, Russia raked in $98 billion in revenue from energy exports, with $60 billion coming from the European Union. Russia is raking in the money hand over fist, giving it the ability to artificially prop up its economy. For the time being, because the EU is dedicated to curbing its imports of Russian energy, in 2020 the EU relied on Russia for 41% of gas imports and 36% of oil imports. But these figures are set to plummet dramatically, as the bloc passed a sanctions package in May aimed at massively cutting imports from Russia by the end of 2022. The United States is helping the European Union wean off Russian energy by finding alternative sources, and even began the process of lifting sanctions from oil superstate Venezuela to encourage diplomatic talks aimed at fully lifting sanctions. The US has also worked with OPEC members to increase oil production and help relieve pressure on the EU. As the world moves away from Russian energy and into alternate sources, including renewables, its ability to bring in foreign money is going to drop year over year. If this war lasts for years, as it seems set to, Russia could see a major source of foreign revenue dry up over time and this will be particularly harmful to the Russian economy, because the unprecedented sanctions levied against Russia leave it largely unable to conduct international trade. Further damning Russia is the fact that its economy has never been well diversified, relying on the energy sector for the majority of its GDP. The enactment of strict capital controls also help limit damage to the ruble from Western sanctions. By limiting the ability for Russian money or foreign reserves to leave the country, the ruble has remained artificially propped up. Yet this is a temporary measure at best, as it literally strangles an economy and cuts it off from global markets. There is also the matter of Russia's currency reserves, which number at over 600 billion when the war started, though approximately half of that was frozen in overseas accounts in retaliation for the invasion of Ukraine. This war chest has been built up over the years from profits made by the energy trade and been held in strategic reserve for exactly the situation Russia finds itself in today. Now the money left in its reserves is helping prop up the economy artificially and continue to help pay for the war in Ukraine. Yet these reserves will eventually run out, and when they do, Russia will find itself in dire straits. All of these factors have led many to call the ruble a Potemkin currency. 
Named for the fake villages made to create the illusion of prosperity for Russian Empress Catherine the Great, a Potemkin currency is one whose real value is being artificially propped up and which will inevitably collapse when those supports are no longer available. But the ruble's value is not a good indicator of economic health anyway, as Russia faces unemployment rising to 7% this year. With thousands of international companies pulling out of the country, foreign investment in the nation has plummeted to the lowest level since the end of the Cold War. This has left many Russians without jobs and struggling to find one amidst a stagnant economy. This pullout of international companies, however, comes with even greater repercussions, as Russia now faces a massive shortage of many goods and services that modern life relies on. Boeing and other commercial jet aircraft manufacturers like Airbus have stopped supplies of spare parts to the nation's air fleets and canceled maintenance contracts. This is quickly leading to the collapse of Russia's airline industry, as it's forced to cannibalize planes for parts in order to keep an ever-shrinking fleet in the air. It's also creating a massive safety hazard that could soon see Russian air travel the most dangerous in the world, because it's not just cut off from critical replacement parts, it also lacks the ability to manufacture them itself. Russia's poorly diversified economy is its own worst enemy, and as the nation has been cut off from international markets for high-technology products, it's struggling to maintain modern tools and equipment. We already have reports from Ukraine that Russian missiles are being equipped with scavenged microprocessors from civilian appliances due to an embargo by Taiwan, the world's largest manufacturer of electronic components. Just two months into the war, Russia was forced to close down the Ulyanovsk mechanical plant, a facility responsible for producing surface-to-air missiles. Because Russia imported nearly all of the electronic components required, production ground to a halt as supplies ran out. Its workers were given a choice – go home on unpaid indefinite leave or join the Russian war in Ukraine at a salary of $600 US a month. This is typically quickly followed by a permanent retirement. It's a story playing out all over Russia in both the military and civilian sectors. We know that supplies of Western-sourced medicines are at critical levels and in some places completely out. Some Russian families have been forced to accept that there is no treatment available for life-threatening conditions due to sanctions. Consumer prices on the whole have risen nearly 20%, with inflation expected to hit as high as 23% as estimated by Russia's central bank. There will likely be some stabilization in certain segments of the Russian economy as the shock of sanctions is absorbed and markets readjust, but Russia's economy is doomed to shrink significantly. As it stands, the economy is expected to shrink by a whopping 15% this year, wiping out 15 years of growth, with a further 3% reduction in 2023. Eventually, it'll stabilize, but without a doubt, Russia will be a shadow of its former self as a result. Perhaps one of the most difficult effects to measure in the near term, however, is Russia's demographic problem. The first part of this problem is Russia's ongoing brain drain, intensified in the last few months by its invasion of Ukraine and the exodus from Russia of intellectuals, artists, professionals, and youth. By mid-March, an estimated 200,000 Russians had left the country due to fear of reprisals for not supporting the war or of how bad the domestic situation would get in the long term. Since then, an accurate number is difficult to source, but some estimate that as many as a million might have left the country, and that exodus continues. Russia's problem is that many of those fleeing the Putin regime are exactly the people that a modern economy relies on. In the first month of the war, an estimated 50,000 to 70,000 IT professionals left the nation, and up to 100,000 followed soon after according to Russian IT industry trade groups. Hospitality, legal, consulting, and real estate professionals are also leaving the nation in droves, causing an unexpected brain drain that will make it increasingly difficult for Russia's economy to remain competitive. And if that wasn't bad enough, it's expected that 15,000 millionaires will leave Russia by the end of the year, taking their investment capital with them. So will the Russian government collapse? It's quite possible given the way that die has been cast so far. Vladimir Putin has spent two decades preparing the Russian people for a confrontation with the West and so far spun all the consequences for his own actions as attacks by the West against Russia and Russophobia. In the end, as the situation deteriorates in Russia, it might end up only consolidating his power base and ensuring the survival of his regime. Putin may end up a dictator over a backwater second world nation that's broke, internationally irrelevant, and politically isolated, but at least he'll remain in power. Francis Brighton crashes through the doors and into the war room, where a group of generals sit. He is a NATO intelligence officer and has come across something truly horrifying. The military leaders turn in their seats to look at him. Sir, you need to see this, Francis says, holding out a manila folder containing images taken by a spy satellite. The general slowly reaches for the folder, opens it, and begins flipping through the pages. His brow furrows in concern. The general shakes his head and passes the folder to the person sitting next to him. God save us, he whispers, as the photographs circulate around the table. Francis waits patiently in a corner of the room while each member of the NATO alliance looks at the photos he brought with him. 
The last general examines the images, closes the folder, and hands it back to Francis. He turns to the rest of the men in the room. What should we do, he asks. There's discussion about launching a counterattack. Some NATO members want to keep the status quo the way it is. Putin is clearly insane, and like any wild animal that's backed into a corner and feels threatened, he is more than willing to lash out in the most deadly way possible. Others in the room believe now is the time to act. They advocate for the deployment of more troops along the Russian border. I'm going to say what everyone else is thinking, one of the general states as he stands up from the table. We need to arm the nukes currently stationed in France and Britain. An eerie silence envelops the room. Francis shifts back and forth on his heels. He's remained quiet until now. If I may, sir, he says, the images clearly show that Russia's moving tactical nukes from this Object S site to their naval base on the Black Sea. However, we do not know if this is just a posturing gesture or if Putin means to use them. The generals around the room grumble. They all know this could be the first step toward nuclear war. Until this point, Vladimir Putin's only threatened to use tactical nukes in his war against Ukraine. Now he actually has taken steps to put those words into action. The deployment of several tactical nukes, each with an estimated payload of one kiloton or 1,000 sticks of dynamite, could change the world forever. The generals continue to deliberate. Commander Brighton, one of them says, we need you back at your post. Keep your eyes on the Russian nukes and update us of any further movements. Francis salutes the general and runs out of the room. He sprints down the hallways of the intelligence building back to the command center. Screens flash different images, TVs play live feeds from news outlets around the world. No one knows about the very real threat that he has uncovered except for the NATO generals. Francis types vigorously on the keys of his keyboard. He glances at the picture next to his screen. It's a photo of his wife holding their newborn daughter. She smiles as if nothing could ever get in the way of their happiness. Unfortunately, Putin seems hell-bent on doing just that, by throwing Europe into a nuclear war. Francis taps back into the satellite feed that he initially spotted the tactical nukes from. He zooms in on the road leading from the Russian nuclear base to the Black Sea coast. The trucks carrying the tactical nukes have made significant progress. They're only miles away from the naval base. Hours pass, Francis periodically sends updates to the NATO generals regarding the movement of the Russian tactical nukes. Putin had promised to use them for several weeks, but many thought this was an empty threat. Now it looks like he's about to make good on what he's been saying all along. There's been little movement on the Russian naval base where the nukes were dropped off. Francis has a hunch the warheads have been mounted onto SSN-38 caliber missiles and loaded onto Russian subs, but without proof there is very little he can do. It seems like the only way that Russia could secretly deploy the nukes and get them within range of targets in Ukraine is by submarine. Francis's eyes are exhausted from looking at computer monitors non-stop for days. Every time he blinks, it stings. The intelligence officer stands up and stretches. He walks to the break room where a fresh pot of coffee has just finished brewing. As he pours himself a cup, he watches live coverage of the battle raging on the outskirts of Kyiv. Suddenly, the camera tilts upward. For a moment, a missile can be seen screaming across the sky. It arcs down and slams into the ground near a group of Ukrainian forces. For a moment, nothing happens. Then, there's a bright flash and the feed cuts off. Francis stares wide-eyed at the static on the television. The coffee mug falls from his hands and shatters on the floor. For a moment, Francis is paralyzed with fear. It is very clear what he just witnessed. Russia launched a tactical nuke and wiped out everything in a quarter-mile radius. Francis sprints back to the control room and begins gathering as much intel as possible. He needs to figure out how much damage was done and in which direction the fallout is heading. By looking at satellite feeds, Francis can just make out the distinctive mushroom cloud rising up over the landscape. The wind seems to be blowing smoke further into Ukraine. Once again, Russia has caused a nuclear catastrophe on Ukrainian soil. Later that day, Francis gives a report to the NATO generals. It appears Russia used a one kiloton tactical nuke to destroy an entire Ukrainian tank battalion. Reports have been coming in across the world that countries are condemning Russia's actions. Everyone knows that if nuclear war breaks out, there will be no winners. Russia and the US alone have enough nukes to wipe humanity off the face of the planet, and that's not accounting for the nuclear warheads located in Britain and France. After the blast was confirmed to be from a tactical nuke, NATO armed several missiles at sites across Europe. They have not fired yet, but it seems that'll only be a matter of time before someone has to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Trying to reason with the homicidal maniac doesn't seem to be working. Even China, Russia's most powerful ally, has turned on them. China has a strict no-first-use nuclear doctrine, which Russia has just broken. In the eyes of China, nukes should only be used to defend one's own country, not as a weapon for offensive purposes. This is how much of the world feels, and it's the reason why almost every country on the planet has turned against Vladimir Putin. But as far as Francis can tell, this doesn't seem to be deterring the leader of the Russian Federation. Russia used the tactical nuke to show just how serious they were taking NATO's constant resupplying of Ukraine with weapons and supplies. 
Putin also wanted to make it clear he had no problem taking things to the next level and engaging in nuclear warfare. Europe is now in an even more tenuous position. In briefings that Francis has been a part of, all options were put on the table. Many leaders believed that NATO needs to launch a nuke at Russia to show they will not just back down. The flip side of this is that Putin could escalate things further and start firing larger strategic nukes at targets across Europe. If this happens, the entire continent could be decimated by fireballs and nuclear fallout. The tactical nuke that Putin fired obliterated everything within a quarter mile, and although the radiation from the blast will travel further, it's nothing compared to the much larger nukes that both Russia and NATO have at their disposal. These bombs can be a thousand times more powerful than the tactical nuke that Russia used, and each one could wipe out entire cities and cause millions of casualties. This is obviously what Europe is trying to avoid, but they also can't let Putin get away with unleashing a nuke on the people of Ukraine. Francis listens to the other options being suggested by the military leaders in the room. Some of the generals think that NATO should send forces into Russia and use conventional weapons to bring Putin to his knees. The counter-argument is obvious. If forces from Europe invade Russia, Putin will almost certainly launch more nukes to defend his homeland, resulting in the annihilation of much of Europe. Another option is to tighten the economic sanctions already placed on Russia. Unfortunately, these didn't seem to stop Putin the first time around, and it's unlikely they'll cause him to back down now. Economic sanctions also won't help deter Putin from using more nuclear bombs. It's determined that this could actually cause him to escalate things further as more countries turn against him. Even though China and most other countries are upset with Putin's actions, Russia still supplies a massive amount of oil and gas to the rest of the world. This includes Europe. And if Russia completely cuts off fossil fuel supplies to the EU, everyone within its borders will suffer. Utility prices across Europe have already skyrocketed to unprecedented levels as Russia continues to cut off its supply of oil and many European families can no longer afford to heat their homes during the cold winter months. Then, one of the generals comes up with an idea so crazy, it might just work. Francis sits at his computer station staring blankly at his screen. He can't believe the decision the generals came to. He closes his eyes and rubs the bridge of his nose. Forgive us, he whispers, and then focuses on the task at hand. Francis moves several satellites into optimal viewing positions, which will allow them to collect analytics for what is about to happen. The satellites align and begin transmitting data. They're pointed at a military base in Belarus. A digital clock has begun countdown. The generals are now in the control room with Francis so they can witness the aftermath of their choices. Belarus is not at war with Europe. The country is controlled by Alexander Lukashenko, a power-hungry dictator who allied himself closely with Putin. There's no doubt that Belarus supports Russia in its endeavors, but the Belarusian military is not actively slaughtering people in Ukraine like Russia is, nor do they have any nuclear weapons. Francis and the generals watch as the countdown reaches zero. On one of the side monitors, a video feed of a missile launching from a British battleship in the Baltic Sea is being played. The satellites track the missile as it arcs through the sky and descends upon a Belarusian military base. Unknowing soldiers carry out their daily routines. The seconds tick by. Everyone in the room holds their breath. Then, confirmation comes through that the tactical nuke launched by NATO has detonated and destroyed its target. Francis feels sick to his stomach. The men on the base had no idea what was coming or that they were even in any danger. Now they've been vaporized by a nuclear blast. One of the generals claps his hands together. Someone get me the Kremlin on the phone. Maybe now Putin will talk, but he doesn't. The plan was to show that NATO was not afraid to use its own nuclear weapons. Military leaders knew they could not launch a nuke at Russia to demonstrate their resolve, but it was determined that by blowing up a target in Belarus, they could still send a clear message to Vladimir Putin that NATO would retaliate with nukes if necessary. There's no doubt that Alexander Lukashenko is a terrible man who's done terrible things to the people in his country, but many feel like NATO took things a step too far. Belarus was sided already with Russia and has given them support in their fight against Ukraine, but now the Eastern European country has declared war on the rest of Europe. They do not have the military forces to back up the threats they're making, but Russia's made it clear that it will stand with Belarus and aid them in their war against the other countries in Europe. NATO leaders knew this would be inevitable, but hoped their show of force would cause Putin to back down slightly. However, this plan hinged on the belief that Putin, like everyone else around the world, wouldn't want to risk all-out nuclear war. But Vladimir Putin is not a sane human being, and therefore his actions following the show of force by NATO are not rational. Both Russia's decision to use a tactical nuke in Ukraine and NATO's choice to fire their own nuclear missile at Belarus have put the continent in a very tumultuous position. Countries around the world are condemning both sides and begging for everyone to come to the table and discuss what's happening before things escalate to levels from which the world might never return. Francis never agreed with the decision to show that Europe would also use nukes if Putin didn't back down. However, his intel has proved invaluable to the generals of NATO 
When Vladimir Putin sent a communication that he wanted to sit down for peace talks, everyone was ecstatic. A delegation was sent to the Ukrainian border, where NATO ambassadors would meet with top officials from Russia. Francis was asked to come along to provide the latest intel about where Russian troops were located. Hopefully this information could be used as leverage to show Russia that they were always being closely watched. It would also serve as proof that NATO knew about key military installations. He was not afraid to target them if Russia failed to cooperate. Francis is reluctant to go, but he knows it's his duty, and hopefully the intel he provides can help the two sides come to an agreement. Before he leaves his station, Francis pulls the picture of his wife and baby off the side of his screen and puts it in his pocket. Francis and the delegation of NATO diplomats head to the Ukrainian border. They land on a military airfield in Poland and are escorted to the border by NATO forces. As they cross over to Ukraine and enter the small town where the talks are supposed to take place, something seems off. The convoy comes to a stop. The delegates step out to look around. It's quiet. There's no sign of the Russian representatives. Maybe they're just running late, someone suggests. The group heads to the town hall where Russia initially agreed to begin peace talks. They enter the building. It's cold and empty. Cobwebs hang from the ceiling. It's clear no one has been here for a very long time. Something is very wrong. I suggest we get back to the airbase, one of the soldiers says. Francis looks around. He closes his eyes and tightly grips the picture of his wife and daughter in his pocket. He should have seen this coming. He should have kept a closer eye on the movements of the Russian troops in the area. Initially, when Francis noticed that the Russian forces were pulling back, he thought it was a sign of good faith. He just presumed the Russians didn't want to seem threatening, especially during peace talks. Now he realizes how stupid that train of thought was. Just like everyone else, Francis wanted this conflict to end without nuclear war. The Russian forces were not pulling back as a sign of their willingness to engage in peace talks. They were retreating because of what was about to happen next. Suddenly, an intelligence officer stationed back at the airbase begins shouting over the comms. Missile incoming! Get out of there! The voice yells. A tear rolls down Francis' cheek. A moment later, there's a bright flash. A massive explosion erupts out of the nuclear warhead as it detonates, vaporizing the NATO delegation and ending the peace talks. At the same moment as the nuke on the Ukrainian border detonates, Russia launches several more tactical nukes into Kyiv. Although this will destroy most of the city and irradiate the surrounding area, the Russians need to eliminate the Ukrainian resistance once and for all to prove their dominance. They do not send troops or tanks across the border into Europe as they had a hard enough time fighting against Ukraine and would never succeed in capturing the rest of Europe using conventional warfare. EU's leaders watch in horror as Russia launches nuke after nuke. They have not targeted any of Europe's major cities yet. Instead, their targets all seem to be Ukrainian military installations. Russia is showing the world they have escalated their wartime tactics to use tactical nukes. Regular missiles are now all but obsolete. The benefit of using these smaller nuclear weapons is that there's less destruction and fallout, but they still decimate any enemy force in the vicinity. Putin makes it known that if Europe or any NATO nations try to invade his country or launch a counterattack, he's not afraid to unleash his whole nuclear arsenal on Europe. NATO leaders scramble to decide what to do next. Do they launch their own nukes and engage in an all-out nuclear war with no winner? Or do they increase sanctions and mobilize forces to keep Russia from expanding any further into Europe? France and Germany launch ground forces and set up heavy defensive positions along the Ukrainian border. Poland asks for reinforcements as Belarusian military forces cross their border and attack any soldiers or civilians in sight as retaliation for NATO launching a nuke at their country. A major fear is that Russia will sell or gift tactical nukes to Belarus, who will then launch them against NATO forces in Europe. At this point, they could make a strong case to justify such an action. Nuclear war seems all but inevitable. For several weeks, Russia does not seem interested in an invasion of Europe. European countries and their allies struggle to figure out the best way to de-escalate the situation with Putin and his loose trigger finger. Thus far, all of the nuclear warheads fired by Russia have been around a kiloton, meaning that no strategic or megaton nukes have been launched yet. It seems like Europe continues to let Putin get away with murder, but NATO is trying its best to avoid a catastrophic war that will lead to nuclear winter. European leaders have been thrown into an unwinnable situation. They either roll over and let Vladimir Putin get away with his egregious atrocities, or they launch their own offensive and deal with the inevitable nuclear consequences. Europe has completely stopped purchasing oil, gas, and goods from Russia. This has hurt the people and the economies of the nations in the EU, but it was a necessary step. Russia's economy has all but collapsed, yet they still have a large influence over oil exports. Not only do they control where their own fossil fuels go, but they also have influence over the other OPEC countries in the Middle East. And even though China condemned the actions of Russia, they rely too heavily on their natural resources to cut ties completely. The suffering in Europe is exacerbated by the fact that every country must ramp up military production and recruitment. Without its main supply of oil and gas, there are not enough resources to go around. Europe has been moving away from fossil fuels and toward using renewable energy, but at this point, it's too little too late. 
Things become desperate as Germany's economy goes into a depression and the British pound becomes worthless. European nations decide it's time to fight back against the evil dictator of Russia. France and Germany launch air raids across the border. The British Navy fires cannons at Russian naval bases and blockade major ports. Infantry and armor units amass along main strategic points, and when the signal's given, cross into Russian territory. There's carnage and chaos across the continent. As Russian forces are defeated and pushed back, Putin makes the decision that everyone was afraid of but knew was coming. He fires tactical nukes at NATO forces. Nuclear bombs detonate on land and in sea. The British Navy in the Baltic is decimated. In a day, millions of lives are lost, but eventually Putin knows he will either run out of tactical nukes or soldiers, so he does the unthinkable. Warning lights flash across every surveillance center in Europe. Russia has launched hundreds of nukes from its arsenals. These are not the low-yield tactical nukes. Each one is over a megaton. When the warheads explode, they will demolish entire cities and wipe out military forces across Europe. There's no other choice but to fight back. Britain and France launch their own nukes at Moscow and other Russian targets. The rest of the world watches in horror as Europe is consumed by fireballs and covered in radiation. Most of Russia's forces are destroyed when the nukes from Europe explode on Russian soil. For the next several decades, most of Europe will be uninhabitable as the fallout spreads across the continent on shifting winds. The end of Vladimir Putin's reign comes at a cost of an irradiated European continent. It all started with a single tactical nuke launched from a Russian sub at Ukrainian forces. It's a grim outlook for the future of Europe if Putin ever does decide to use nuclear weapons. If this happens, decisions about what to do will be difficult to make. There will likely be mistakes, and many people will die as a result of Vladimir Putin's cavalier use of tactical nukes. There are no good options when it comes to nuclear warfare. This is why no one has used a nuke in combat since 1945, when the United States dropped the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The situation in Ukraine might be the closest we've been to nuclear destruction since the Cuban Missile Crisis, except in the current situation it's not the Soviet Union and the United States who have to come to some sort of agreement, but the leaders of Europe and Vladimir Putin. Hopefully just as the crisis in 1962 was averted, we can avoid a nuclear holocaust in the coming months. Russia, the world's second most powerful military, versus Ukraine, ranked at the number 22 spot. It's a military of 850,000 versus Ukraine's 200,000, a force overmatch that should spell easy victory for Russia. So why is the Russian invasion of Ukraine going so poorly? First, what does Russia even want in Ukraine to begin with? It's important to understand that this is not Russia's war, it's Vladimir Putin's war. For Putin, restoring the old Soviet bloc has been a dream since he saw the Soviet Union crumble around him in the late 80s and early 90s. It's not just a matter of pride, though. Putin sees relation with the West as a zero-sum game. In other words, there can only be one winner, and in his mind, it must be him and Russia. Initially, Putin drew closer to the West as Russia signed cooperation agreements with NATO. For a while, it looked like the old hostilities between NATO and Russia were over, and a new future together was possible. However, as he was cozying up to the West, he was busy undermining it by using his intelligence services to influence Western democracies, as we saw during the 2016 US presidential election, where US security services confirmed that Russia was attempting to influence American voters. Ukraine's wish to join NATO, though, would place yet another NATO country on his doorstep, something that amounts to a strategic disaster for Russia. Having been the victim of many invasions throughout history, Russia's worked hard to create a buffer between itself and the West for decades after World War II. Today, most of that work has been undone, and Russia's potential adversaries now sit on its northwestern flank. In case of war, if Ukraine joined the alliance, it would allow NATO access straight into the soft underbelly of Russia. Ukraine joining NATO is simply unacceptable to Putin, and in his mind, it's vital for Russia's national security that Ukraine be friendly to Russia, or at least unfriendly to the West. Ukraine's growing desire for NATO membership thus represented a significant threat to Putin's goals of keeping NATO away, and its perceived weakness gave him a chance to put the former Soviet Republic back into Russia's sphere of influence. He just needed to topple the national government and install a new one friendly to his interests. The seeds of today's invasion began with protests launched in 2013, after the Ukraine national government rejected the signing of the European Union-Ukraine Association Agreement, which was meant to establish a pathway to EU membership, in favor of closer ties with Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union. Many in Ukraine saw this as Moscow influencing Ukrainian policy and a revolution swept across the nation. However, not all of Ukraine wanted closer ties to the West, leading to the breakaway republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. In response for a call for help from the Ukrainian president shortly after he was removed from power, Russia annexed Crimea, 
and sent aid to separatists fighting Ukrainian national forces. Rather than deter the new Ukrainian government from joining NATO and the EU, though, this only created a sense of urgency for Ukraine. Joining the EU and NATO was seen as a matter of national security, and given Russia's invasion, the fear was well-grounded. After rebuffing his threats if they should draw closer to the West, Putin saw an invasion as his only option. So what's gone wrong with the Russian invasion? Any good military operation starts with clearly defined goals. And here's where Putin's invasion met with its first strategic disaster. In multiple speeches, Putin made it clear that this was a special military operation tasked with denazifying Ukraine and ending a genocide of Russian-speaking people. This is not just blatantly false, as the thought of a Jew whose family died in the Holocaust leading a Nazi government is ridiculous in the extreme, but also not valid strategic goals. Generals need clear objectives so they can make plans to achieve them. By all accounts, Russia's invasion lacked set objectives. While removing Volodymyr the Iron Joker Zelensky from power was always a goal for Russia's armed forces, how exactly to do that and when was not clearly delineated. Should Zelensky be simply toppled, his government neutralized and rendered ineffective via exile, or should Zelensky and any supporters be arrested or killed? While it's still difficult to get an accurate picture of what has been going on behind the scenes in the Kremlin, we know that the Russian army seemed unclear of these two questions. At the start of the invasion, forces from Belarus began a march toward Kiev, while a full assault in the east aimed to push Ukraine's defenders back. Yet significant air power was not given to these forces advancing on Kiev, slowing the advance down to a crawl. Meanwhile, Russian forces elsewhere seem set on a strategy of conquering Ukraine piece by piece by defeating enemy forces in place and securing territory as they advance. This was not a war with the goal of removing Ukraine's government, but rather a war of conquest. The lack of clear well-defined objectives led to the Russian military getting bogged down early and quickly, as it seemed to fight anywhere it discovered Ukrainian troops, as opposed to quickly moving to secure strategic objectives. This type of war heavily favors the defender, as it leaves them in complete control of when and where battles take place. However, it cost Russia something even more important – time. The longer that Zelensky remained safely out of Russian hands, the longer he had to influence the world, something he did with stunning effectiveness. Each day that passed, Zelensky was able to rally more and more supporters from across the international community, leading to the fastest and most severe sanctions imposed on a nation in modern history. Zelensky's defiance of Putin also emboldened NATO and other countries to provide direct military aid to Ukraine even leading to such unbelievable moves as the EU supplying the Ukrainian Air Force with fighter jets. Before the invasion, the US and its partners believed that shipping of such significant war material would only serve to provoke Russia into greater aggression and was unthinkable. However, as Zelensky managed to turn global opinion against Putin and the Russian military mired itself in pointless fighting, opinion amongst the US and partners quickly changed. Eventually, Putin realized his grave error, and at last clear instructions seemed to be given to his commanders to neutralize Zelensky and seize major cities at all costs. Suddenly, Russian forces changed tactics, and they were no longer bogging themselves down fighting Ukrainian defenders where they encountered them. Now they were bypassing entire Ukrainian positions to rush to secure major cities. Even more importantly, the push for Kiev began in earnest, with hundreds of vehicles and thousands of troops in reserve poured straight into the fight for Kiev in a bid to overwhelm the city's defenders. As of the writing of this script, the massive Russian advance on Kiev seems to be halted due to supply problems, though. Not relying on conventional forces, though, there's evidence that Putin has dispatched special forces kill squads to eliminate Zelensky, and Kiev has been locked down as the hunt for infiltrators continues. Russian electronic warfare assets sniff through signals coming in and out of the Ukrainian capital, with the goal of pinpointing Zelensky's exact location for an airstrike. Zelensky is finally a wanted man, but killing him now will not undo Putin's major strategic blunder. Russian troops called Zelensky a clown before the invasion, but now his own troops call him the Iron Joker and the Iron Joker has already defeated Putin on the world stage by rallying it against him. Killing Zelensky now will only turn him into a martyr and a rallying point for Ukraine's defenders. Had Russia acted swiftly to take Kiev and neutralize Zelensky, something its conventional forces should have been capable of within days of the invasion, Putin may not have suffered as badly on the global stage as he had. The longer this invasion drags on, the worse it gets for Putin's Russia, as the world turns its back on every facet of Russian business and culture. As new intelligence has revealed, though, Putin didn't just fail at setting strategic goals for his military, he actually didn't even let most of his military leadership know about the invasion beforehand. While they were certainly aware of the buildup of troops along the border with Ukraine, even his most senior generals were blindsided by the order to invade. Putin had kept his plan to invade Ukraine so close to his chest that only a small group of individuals very close to him ever knew. Without foreknowledge of the coming invasion, Russia's generals had no way of drawing up battle plans and being prepared to prosecute Putin's orders. Instead, they were forced to improvise on the run, 
a recipe for disaster. The fact that most of the invasion troops were pulled from across the entire Russian nation also meant that once hostilities began, there was no time to coordinate and integrate chains of command. We've seen plenty of evidence that Russian military has been infighting amongst itself, and even engaging in full-blown arguments over radio. With no overarching strategy or chain of command, Putin's army is disorganized and ineffective. Putin's second invasion disaster was a stunning intelligence failure that ranks amongst the worst in world history. Putin told his troops they'd be greeted as liberators by Ukraine's large number of Russian speakers. In fact, his entire battle plan relied on his troops being seen as the liberating country, not the invading one. Thus, Russia's invasion force was by design smaller than required, even with all of his reserves committed. Putin's forces in Ukraine are simply not enough to pacify a country that does not want Russians on their soil. As Russian troops poured into Ukraine, they weren't met with flowers as promised, they were met with javelins and Molotov cocktails. Even in the most pro-Russian parts of Ukraine's east, the people have continued to rise up against what they see as occupiers and invaders. This has not just severely slowed the advance, but bogged Russian troops down in pacification operations. Troop to task analysis, or the analysis of how many troops are required to achieve a certain task, is notoriously unreliable. But even by the most optimistic of estimates, Putin's invasion force was not up for the task of pacifying a nation that did not welcome them as liberators. American analysts estimate that a successful counterinsurgency requires at minimum a 20 to 1,000 ratio of troops, 20 troops for every 1,000 civilians. This is merely an estimate, but even by this number, the Russians would need 340,000 troops to successfully neutralize a Ukraine insurgency. Russia, though, has poured 150,000 troops in its attempt to seize Ukraine, roughly a third of the total Russian ground combatants. While it will almost certainly prove to be sufficient for neutralizing Ukraine's military and installing a puppet regime, it's completely insufficient for actually controlling the country. Without immediately pouring more troops into the conflict, all Russia has succeeded in doing is ensuring that Ukraine becomes its own version of America's and the Soviet Union's Afghanistan, only much deadlier for its interest in troops both. There are signs that Russia is looking to fix this mistake, and by the time you see this video, those plans might have been put into effect. As of the writing of this script, rumors amongst the global intelligence community is that Russia is planning on instituting a draft to draw up the necessary troop numbers to neutralize Ukraine. Whether this is true or not, what is true is that as Russia's forces currently stand, achieving any sort of strategic success in Ukraine is currently impossible. Russia's next biggest pre-invasion failure was a logistical one. Before the invasion actually took place, Putin famously said that he was drawing down some of his forces to de-escalate tensions. The world breathed a collective sigh of relief. Maybe there wouldn't be an invasion after all. But just days later, Putin ordered his forces into action. Was he simply trying to lower Ukraine's and the world's guard? Not quite. According to Western intelligence, Putin's claim of drawing down forces was actually so his forces could do something that should have warned him the Russian military wasn't ready for invasion. As Putin moved his timetable for invasion along, an estimated up to 20% of his combat vehicles were in disrepair. The claim of drawing down forces was instead a ruse to allow his military to tow broken down vehicles away from staging areas for repairs. This has been substantiated by media, who have visited both the Russian-Ukraine and Belarus-Ukraine border since the invasion, and discovered dozens of broken down vehicles left behind in the process of being towed or repaired. With the Russian military suffering from sanctions for years and a stagnant economy back home, it's no surprise that so much Russian firepower was inoperable, but the sheer scale of broken down equipment on the eve of full combat is shocking compared to a modern military such as the United States, which the Russian military theoretically is supposed to fight and win against. But this isn't where Russia's logistics problems end. As the invasion unfolded, Russian troops made slow but steady progress into Ukraine, and then suddenly stopped altogether for a few days. To the world's surprise, entire units had simply run out of fuel, ammunition, or food and vehicles were abandoned by the dozens across Ukraine. How could this happen? As has been famously noted before, the Russian military has always had a problem with logistics. Compared to the United States, Russian units operate with up to 75% fewer logistics personnel, perhaps reflecting Cold War-era mentality that units were not believed to be survivable in a nuclear battlefield and would thus be destroyed or rendered combat ineffective long before significant resupply was necessary. It may also be simply due to poor military planning and a completely unrealistic expectation that heavy fighting would be sporadic and rare. Whatever the reason, Russian units began to run into supply problems by the third day of the invasion, further setting back their ability to make quick strategic gains necessary to circumvent mounting international outrage. Even worse, it left them at the mercy of Ukrainian air attack and lightning raids, with hundreds of Russian vehicles destroyed. 
bottlenecks caused by stuck vehicles also gave the Ukrainian armed forces an opportunity to launch devastating raids and resupply themselves by pillaging the remains. But even as supply problems began to sort themselves out, a lack of Russian logistics led to massive traffic jams and further delay of critical objectives such as the taking of Kiev. The famous column of vehicles attacking Kiev stretched for up to 60 kilometers at one point, snarled up in the world's largest traffic jam. Meanwhile, Kiev's defenders used the time to equip civilians and build defenses. Logistics might not be as glamorous as infantry, artillery, or tanks, but without good logistics, a modern army can't win. Force structure, though, was yet another of Russia's biggest mistakes. Details on the composition of the Russian military units are hard to discern, given that such things are valuable military secrets. It's been widely reported, however, that a large number of Russian soldiers invading Ukraine are conscripts, and we know that approximately 200,000 of Russia's nearly 1 million strong military are conscripts. Conscription in Russia is a mandatory 12-month service period for males aged 18 to 27. While Russia has made great strides in creating a professional all-volunteer fighting force, such as the US, it still relies heavily on conscripts, and even one-fourth of its elite Spetsnaz units are made of conscripts. But the problem with conscripts, as Ukraine has highlighted, are numerous. First, conscripts are short service terms, meant that they'll lack the skills and training of a professional soldier with multiple years under his or her belt. Pitting Russia's conscript force against Ukraine's mostly professional force is a bad idea with predictable results. Secondly, though, conscripts have notoriously low morale and will to fight, as opposed to a professional soldier who has chosen to take up arms. This has never been clearer than in the way Russia's army has faced massive insubordination, surrender, and outright sabotage of their own equipment to avoid fighting. While the Russian army remains intact, many units of soldiers have surrendered themselves, even to unarmed civilians, in order to avoid fighting and U.S. intelligence reports that Russian soldiers have taken to punching holes in their own gas tanks to avoid having to move to the front. Intercepted radio communications have shown Russian soldiers refusing orders from Central Command, and even outright arguments and insults between units have been logged. Russian forces are increasingly showing themselves to be unprofessional, poorly trained, and with cripplingly low morale. Such low morale has made Russian units highly susceptible to Ukrainian influence campaigns, which have had great results in inducing Russian soldiers to surrender outright or fight poorly. Morale may be the reason why it appears that Ukraine's military is punching way above its weight class in defense of their nation. As opposed to most Russian troops, Ukrainian forces are highly motivated to defend their country, something the Kremlin severely underestimated. Fueling Russia's morale problems is not just conscription, though, but two other key factors. The first is the fact that many soldiers have claimed they had no idea they were invading until hours before the invasion began. Kept in the dark by their commanders, young Russian soldiers are increasingly reporting after being captured that they believe they were out on maneuvers or at most being sent for peacekeeping operations with their separatist regions. Then, right as the invasion began, the truth was revealed, resulting in shock and fear. The second reason, though, is because many Russian troops invading Ukraine today simply don't see the Ukrainians as enemies. Sharing a common heritage, Ukrainians and Russians have traditionally been brothers and sisters, and waging war against Ukraine has been hugely unpopular, not just back home in Russia, but amongst its own military. Russian morale has been at critical levels for days now, but supply problems have only made it worse. The failure of high-profile operations such as the dual airborne assaults against Kiev in the first days of the war have only made morale problems worse. Russia's next mistakes begin with the invasion itself. Ukraine is waging an influence war directly against the Russian military and civilian population both. Russia, long feared as a master of hybrid warfare which combines military operations with information manipulation, has proven to be absolutely inept in managing this conflict. The Kremlin has ceded the entire narrative of the conflict to Ukraine, which has exploited social media in ways Russia never could have dreamt of. For years, Russian disinformation lowered Ukrainian morale in regions bordering the separatist enclaves. And now Ukraine has turned this tactic back around on Russia and taken it 10 steps further. Quickly connecting to the world via multiple social media apps, Ukraine has flooded the world with images of the invasion, often taken from the front lines themselves. The images have revealed the brutality of Russia's assault and quickly turned global anchor against it. Russia, meanwhile, has proven completely inept at managing the narrative of the conflict and today has zero influence over how the conflict is perceived by the world, granting Ukraine an incalculable strategic victory that has resulted in the outpouring of support in the form of combat arms, humanitarian aid, intelligence sharing, and all the resulting economic punitive measures taken against Russia, its companies, leadership, military, and oligarchs. Unable to shape a global narrative, Russia has instead attempted to control the narrative at home. Russia state media has banned independent reporting on Ukraine, claiming that outlets such as Echo of Moscow are disseminating dangerous disinformation to attack public morale. 
On Russian state TV, the conflict is still being portrayed as a special military operation and not an invasion. Casualty figures have also been carefully released slowly over time so as not to make the Russian people aware of the scale of this military disaster. To raise support at home, Russian media instead paints the crippling economic sanctions against it as aggression from the West, led naturally by the great Satan itself, the United States. But many Russian people still get their news independently, leading to massive protests that as of one week into the war, number at thousands across every city in Russia. Older generations, though, who get their news primarily from their televisions and radios, still believe the Kremlin narrative about anti-Nazi operations and Western belligerence. Sadly, recent reports coming from Russia suggest that the Kremlin has begun massive efforts to block internet access to outside news sources. But the Kremlin can't stop Ukrainian forces from giving captured Russian soldiers a chance to call home. Not just a humanitarian measure, but a carefully calculated ploy to destroy Russian morale back home. News of the invasion is now reaching directly into Russian homes through the calls of loved ones, and Ukrainian influence campaigns have been so devastating to Russia's war effort that now Russian combat troops are having their smartphones confiscated before going into battle. Russia's next opening day mistake was failing to properly utilize its massive advantage in striking power. Before the United States initiated a coalition invasion of Iraq into the first Gulf War, it undertook a shock and awe 100-hour air campaign with round-the-clock attacks on the Iraqi radar, air defenses, communication nodes, government buildings, and other militarily important targets. The US's air campaign was so incredibly effective that ground forces took only four days to defeat the Iraqi army. While the US enjoyed the benefit of having a large coalition of nations to assist it, it was still facing one of the world's most formidable militaries at the time, with one of the world's best air defense networks. By comparison, Russia is facing an opponent with an air force a fraction of the size of Russia's own and largely Cold War era air defenses. There is simply no excuse for the shockingly poor performance of Russian strike forces except a lack of commitment. Rather than commit overwhelming air power, Russia instead chose to limit its use of air and missile strikes, likely to reduce public outrage. This is because unlike the United States, Russia has a relatively small inventory of smart weapons and sanctions have severely hurt its ability to procure more. As one Russian general famously said, we have great firepower, we just don't always know what we're shooting at. With a lack of precision weapons, Russia was unable to neutralize Ukraine's air defenses and command and control networks with the few number of planes and attack helicopters it allotted to the task at the opening of the conflict. This is puzzling because many predicted this channel included that Russia would initially commit large amounts of its air force in the softening up of Ukraine's defenses before returning most of that air power to its regional security requirements. However, one explanation might be Putin's attempt to frame this both to his citizens and the world as a small-scale military action, not a full-scale invasion. Rather than destroy Ukraine's ability to defend itself from air attack and communicate with its forces, Russia instead undertook only limited strikes and sent its forces in to fight a ground war against an enemy still able to communicate and conduct long-range surveillance. Incredibly, Ukraine's air force wasn't just outright destroyed at the start of the fighting, but has continued to undertake limited sorties even a week after hostilities started. It seems, though, that as the ground war becomes a painful grind, Russia's rethinking its limited use of air power and missile strikes, and over the last 48 hours as of the writing of this script, has intensified attacks against both military and civilian targets. Putin's next invasion mistake was failing to utilize the various arms of his military properly. It can be tempting to look at the shockingly poor performance of Russia's military today and claim that Russia is an inept and weak military power. But while the invasion has shown that there does in fact exist a rotten core within the Russian military machine, it's also important to understand that to date, the Russian military has not been fighting the way it trains. Russia has made little use of its combined arms capabilities in fighting the war in Ukraine, likely because Putin still hopes to sell this invasion to his own people, now that the world isn't buying it as a small-scale military action and not a full-blown war, which is exactly what it's turned into. Moving large amounts of aircraft and other support platforms to the front will break any illusion about this invasion being nothing more than a fast, clean, small-scale operation rather than an actual war. However, Putin's military has still made critical strategic errors that ended in a disastrous opening day for the invasion. Russia's much-vaunted airborne infantry, allegedly the most elite of Russia's military forces, met with immediate disaster as they failed to take two different airfields outside of Kiev on the opening day of the conflict. After successfully dropping on their objectives, they repelled an initial assault to recapture the airfields but were completely unprepared to hold it out against Ukraine's mechanized forces. Details are still sketchy, 
but it appears that Russia made the same mistake the Allies made in Operation Market Garden back in World War II, as they deployed airborne assaults too deep behind enemy lines. As happened to the Allies in World War II, Russian ground forces today were unable to break through Ukraine's defenses to link up with the lightly armed airborne assaults and reinforce them with heavy combat vehicles. Incredibly, it seemed that Russia believed that it could simply fly reinforcements straight into the airfields after they were captured, using its logistics fleet to move heavy armor and artillery directly to the site of their air assaults. Whether this was pure hubris from Russia as it severely underestimated Ukraine's military capabilities, or a critical lack of intelligence which led the Russians to believe that the Ukrainians didn't have the firepower around Kiev to retake the LZs remains unknown. What is known is that without proper support, not even Russia's famous paratroopers, the pride and joy of its armed forces, could hold against Ukrainian defenders and were eliminated in a massive opening day disaster for Russia. Perhaps Russia's greatest mistake in this entire campaign, though, was severely underestimating the world's resolve. In preparation for the conflict, Russia had built up over $600 billion in reserves to be used specifically to counteract the effects of sanctions against the economy. However, Russia never dreamt that the world would move so quickly and thoroughly to punish it over its invasion of Ukraine. The removal of most of Russia's banks from the SWIFT international payment system has already caused one bank to file for insolvency, and the banning of Russian aircraft from most European and North America's airspace is threatening the survival of its airlines. Punishing sanctions have also been targeting Putin, his oligarch supporters, and his cabinet members directly, with Russian billionaires losing an estimated $80 billion in wealth one week into the invasion. The blocking of Russian state-run propaganda outlets Russia Today and Sputnik across Europe and North America have led these two massive media outlets to shutter their doors in the affected regions, with thousands laid off here in the US and Canada alone. The infamous Nord Stream 2 pipeline has also been formally axed for good, killing one of Russia's most lucrative energy deals with Europe. But what's shocking about the extreme measures undertaken by the world is that they hurt not just Russia, but the very nations and companies exacting them. And yet the West has shown it's willing to hurt itself to shut down Russian aggression, something Vladimir Putin could have never predicted. German energy prices are set to dramatically increase as it cuts off its deals with Russia, and yet the German government has been willing to shoulder the costs in order to punish Putin. Whereas once the West was fragmented and beset by infighting over how to handle its relations with Russia, this invasion of Ukraine has unified the world to a point no one could have foreseen. Putin's invasion has even led to calls from within Finland and Sweden for membership in NATO, a stunning turn of events from two nations who have maintained traditional neutrality between NATO and Russia. The Finns themselves likely remember the infamous Winter War of 1939, when the Soviet Union invaded and the neutral nation found itself fighting alone against a superior power. With such an upset of the status quo, it's not surprising the two traditionally neutral powers have seriously discussed joining NATO, and Putin's threats warning them against the idea is likely only to further encourage them to join. Russia, it seems, is only capable of one failed invasion at a time, and invading Finland or Sweden is indubitably going to trigger a military response from the West. About the only way that the invasion has been to Russia's advantage has been in its relationship with China, as China has opened trade with Russia to make up for the impact of sanctions. The two pariah states have been drawing closer ties, though at best they still remain frenemies. China's unwillingness to condemn the invasion of Ukraine, however, is costing even it, as it finds itself increasingly isolated on the international stage. The fact that China has not been shy about its ambitions to conduct its own invasion of Taiwan has placed extra scrutiny on the Chinese Communist Party. With deepened ties to Russia, its neighbors are now themselves eagerly eyeing closer ties to the United States, fearful of Chinese aggression despite its claims that it respects all nations' sovereignty. It's hard to imagine a worst planned military campaign, and Putin's invasion of Ukraine will surely go down as one of the greatest military fiascos in history. As it stands, Russia has just launched a war that it'll take years to resolve if it chooses to continue prosecuting it, as the Ukrainian people prove themselves capable and willing of waging an ongoing war against their occupiers. As the Russian economy continues to be savaged by international sanctions and Putin finds himself increasingly isolated politically within his own country, his decision to invade Ukraine might spell the end of his political reign and the end of Russia as a major economic and military power. February 24th, 2022, 5.30 a.m. local. Russian President Vladimir Putin is going live to millions of people around the world announcing a special military operation to denazify Ukraine. Even as Putin announces the beginning of his invasion, two dozen Mi-8s are already penetrating Ukrainian airspace. The transport helicopters are carrying over a hundred of Russia's most elite air assault troops, the very cream of the crop of the Russian military. Accompanying them is a flight of Ka-52 attack helicopters to provide escort, security, and fire support once they arrive at their intended target. The trip is 250 kilometers from their starting bases in Belarus, 
and the helicopters have been in flight for half an hour by the time the news of the invasion is being broadcast around the world. The entire formation is hot on the heels of a massive missile assault on Ukraine in preparation for the invasion. Caliber cruise missiles rain down on strategic targets across the nation, prioritizing known air defense sites. Many air defense radars are destroyed. Many more, however, survive. Yet, under intense missile and electronic warfare attack, Russia achieves the only true victory of the war by completely disrupting Ukraine's extremely dense air defense network. It'll take days for the network to reform itself, but for now Russia has near uncontested dominance of the airspace above the nation. But such a long-reaching air assault comes with risk. It would only take one battery of Ukrainian air defenses to destroy the entire assault team. So the helicopters fly fast and low, skimming over the treetops. The Vozdushno Desantny Voiska Rossi, the Russian name for the airborne force. They rely on speed, surprise, and more than a fair bit of bravery to seize victory, and if they accomplish their objective today, the war for Ukraine will be over by the end of the week. Hostomel Airport, also known as Antonov Airport, will allow Russia to fly in thousands of troops right on Kyiv's doorstep for a decapitation strike on President Zelensky's regime. As the helicopters penetrate deep into Ukraine, though, the mission planners have made one fatal mistake. Russian troops are not as well equipped as their Western counterparts, and even these elite aviators and paratroopers lack enough night vision equipment to undertake such a risky operation in the dark. Thus, the assault begins right before sunup. But this also gives Ukrainian defenders a clear view of the approaching helicopters. As the choppers near the Dnipro River, they're no longer obscured by tree cover or buildings giving Ukrainian troops clear lines of fire at the approaching formation. Caught out in the open with no possible means of defending themselves, the helicopter assault immediately comes under fire from heavy machine guns. One of the Mi-8 helicopters is brought under withering cannon fire as bullets riddle the belly of the aircraft and cockpit. Seconds later, it drops out of the sky, smashing into the far riverbank. A Ka-52 attack helicopter tries to suppress the enemy defenders and unleashes a rocket barrage on a heavy machine gun position. However, as it banks away, a soldier using a shoulder-fired Stinger missile lets loose, the missile striking true and blowing the Ka-52 out of the sky. A few hundred meters away, another soldier inserts a battery coolant unit into the grip stock of his Stinger system. The unit immediately releases high-pressure argon gas, the pressure causing the gas to become super-chilled. The gas is routed straight to the seeker of the missile, chilling it to sub-zero temperatures. Now ultra-sensitive to heat, the seeker is easily capable of spotting the telltale thermal signature of Russian helicopter engines even from a thousand meters away. Squeezing a trigger, the rocket motor is ignited and the missile leaps into the air. The missile is smart enough to tell the difference between a helicopter's engine and the rapidly cooling exhaust, and course corrects to strike an Mi-8 directly below the gearbox. The helicopter immediately begins to spin out of control crashing into the water at over 150 kilometers an hour seconds later. A cheer erupts from the defenders. Not a single Russian is seen escaping the rapidly sinking wreck. The air assault, however, continues unabated and two dozen helicopters weather the sporadic defensive fire. The Ukrainians have been taken by surprise, despite the CIA's warning that an invasion was imminent. However, not all warnings went unheeded, and the airport has had multiple defenses installed over the last two weeks. But a traitor has already given away the location of these defenses to Russian intelligence, and the assault nears the airfield. The Ka-52s take the lead. Each attack chopper knows exactly what target to hit and quickly move to neutralize heavy machine guns and troop emplacements with cannon and rocket fire. The Ukrainian defenders manning these positions are taken completely by surprise by the speed of the attack and don't stand a chance. Not all defensive positions are surprised like this, though, and soon the sound of helicopters and explosions have put the garrison troops into action. These aren't Ukrainian regulars, though. These men are mostly reservists, who did not expect to be bearing the brunt of an attack by Russia's most elite troops. They're initially overwhelmed, but soon the attacking helicopters come under withering ground fire. The Ka-52s wheel over the airfield and launch a fresh volley of rockets and cannon fire, ripping into defenders. In the distance, the sound of the approaching Mi-8s can be heard and the Ukrainian defenders realize they're about to be overwhelmed. Serhiy Falatyuk, however, refuses to break and run, and brings his 9K-38 Igla to his shoulder, lining up a shot on an attacking Ka-52. The missile strikes true and the marauding helicopter is sent plummeting to the ground. The defenders cheer and are rallied. They won't give this airfield up so easily after all. The Russians were told ground fire would be light and sporadic, but as the main air assault begins to enter the airfield, they're met with fire that is anything but light and sporadic. Captain Ivan Bolodirov is in one of the lead helicopters when suddenly it's strafed by heavy machine gun fire. The helicopter sputters and stalls in the sky, 
forcing the pilots to bring it to a very hard and unpleasant stop on the grass below. The men inside are thrown about and jarred in their seat harnesses, but all survive the emergency landing. The attack helos have brought enough breathing room for the MI-8s to set down, disgorging their complement of paratroopers. The men rush to create a defensive perimeter around their choppers, then squad leaders coordinate with unit commanders to expand the perimeter to nearby buildings. They're surrounded by Ukrainians, but the reservists and draftees that make up the defending garrison are no match for the attack helicopters and the elite paratroopers. To drive the point home, a series of explosions follows the roar of jet engines as a pair of Russian Su-25s lay waste to another Ukrainian position. The jets don't hang around for long, though. Already Ukrainian fighters are on their way. They've done their job, and the majority of the air assault has successfully landed. The defending troops have been pushed out of the airport in a bloody assault that leaves many of the poorly trained and equipped defenders dead. The Russians take only light casualties. All is going well. And back in Russia, infantry and heavy vehicles are being loaded onto massive Ilyushin IL-76 airlifters. Within hours, the airport will see the first of these big planes land and disgorge hundreds of troops. With 18 in total on their way to bring troops and equipment, by the end of the day, several thousand crack Russian troops will be sitting outside Kyiv. The perimeter is quiet for a short time. An American news crew from CNN is covering the air assault within meters of the Russians. The commander of the air assault even takes time to pass off a few comments. The airport is secure, he says. However, shots soon ring out along the edge of the airport and the news crew quickly flees. The troops along the perimeter are coming under fire from Ukrainian civilians hiding amongst the trees that ring the airport. Hearing of the air assault, local militias have taken upon themselves to quickly respond and lend their aid, only to discover that the defenders had already been overrun. Help is coming, though, as the 3rd Special Purpose Regiment, an elite unit of Ukrainian Special Operations Forces, is rapidly moving to counterattack. These special operators are equipped and trained to NATO standards. Having learned directly from American, British, Polish, and French instructors the hard lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan, they're practically chomping at the bit to go after the Russian invaders, but more importantly, they know they have to act quickly. Once the first airlifter lands, their efforts would be too little too late. Ukrainian General Valery Zelushny realizes this fact as well and immediately tasks a nearby artillery unit to begin bombardment of the airport. He also swiftly dispatches the 72nd Mechanized Brigade in a counterattack on the airport. The Russian defenders are soon once more engaged, this time by a well-organized counterattack involving Ukrainian regulars and special forces. The Ukrainians operate under the cover of artillery, with two brave helicopter pilots conducting attack runs on the airfields. But the Russians manage to repel the attack with portable anti-tank weapons which tear into the armored vehicles. Automatic grenade launchers further wreak havoc amongst the attacking troops. The Russian defensive perimeter buckles at points, and they're forced to fall back in order to consolidate their position. But they're holding the airport. The time on the arrival of the first Ilyushin is ticking. All the Russians have to do is hold long enough for it to land safely. The Ukrainian forces running into extremely stiff resistance, and without a good fix on enemy positions, the artillery is proving ineffective. They're running out of time, and they know it. If they don't push the Russians out in the next few hours, it'll all be over. The 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade of the Ukrainian National Guard has been quickly assembled and dispatched in their armored vehicles, going full speed toward the airport. Police block off civilian roads and make a clear lane for the armored vehicles. An hour later, the 1st Infantry Fighting Vehicles and tanks of the 4th are arriving at the airport, throwing their weight into the battle. The Russian paratroopers have little heavy equipment to counter this armored threat with, and rely on air cover to deal with the heavy tanks and IFVs of the 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade. Nearly out of anti-tank missiles, the Ka-52 attack helicopters and a pair of Russian bombers are all that stands between the defenders and annihilation under the treads of the Ukrainian tanks. More helicopters are destroyed, but under intense cannon and rocket fire, the 4th's tanks and IFVs take heavy losses. Russian air cover can't stick around forever, though, as the aircraft are quickly running out of fuel and ordnance. To make matters worse, Ukraine's air force is scrambling to overcome the shock of the attack and the effects of missile strikes against its airfields and hangars. A MiG-29 is screaming toward the airport, and it spells doom for any Russian helicopter or bomber left in the area. Forced to retreat, the paratroopers are now on their own. By now, their defensive perimeter has shrunk even more. The commander of the airborne assault has to make a fateful decision. He cannot possibly guarantee the security of landing aircraft, knowing that it might spell the doom of him and his men. He radios the information via satellite comms back to headquarters. The Ilyushins are turned around and head back to Russia. Ukrainian defenders have no idea they've just won the battle for the airport, but the fighting is far from over. The Georgian National Legion has been fighting in Ukraine since 2014 and in 2016 officially made part of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. 
Legionnaires now rush to reinforce the attack on the airport. A fresh assault bears down on the Russians. They're now out of anti-tank missiles and are running dangerously low on ammunition. Cannon and machine gun fire strafes the buildings of the airport, and the Russians realize they're about to be overrun. There's only one way to avert an even bigger disaster, and that's to retreat to the safety of the woods to the north of the airfield. As the sun begins to set, the paratroopers are ordered to retreat, the men making a mad dash for the safety of the forest outside the airport. Out of ammunition, Georgian Legion Commander Mamuka Mamulashvili hops into his civilian vehicle and runs over retreating paratroopers. As the night falls, the airport finally goes quiet, but the battle for the heart of Ukraine is not over. North of the airport, a giant Russian armored thrust south out of Belarus has run into unexpectedly stiff resistance at Ivankiv, a key river crossing held by the Ukrainians. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Ukrainians are forced to destroy the bridge, but many tanks and IFVs have already crossed the river. Despite being under strength, they're ordered to immediately make for Antonov Airport. The column of armored vehicles comes under attack from Ukrainian special forces and partisans, who spring several ambushes along the road to the airport. Nonetheless, the vehicles push through the ambushes, knowing that victory lies in taking and holding the airfield. The Russian paratroopers have had a sleepless few hours to rest after their retreat from the airport. On alert for Ukrainian partisans and special forces who might be on the hunt for them, they had been told Ukraine wouldn't put up much of a fight, but they had never expected such fierce resistance. The sound of approaching friendly vehicles lifts their battered spirits though. Refitted and re-equipped, the Russians organize an assault on the airport. Preempting the attack, Russian bombers conduct several preparatory strikes, inflicting serious damage to the defenders. Ukrainian air defense networks are only now starting to come back online after being forced to disperse from pre-war positions or face destruction. Russia still enjoys the ability to use close air support and takes full advantage of the fact, bringing withering fire down on the airport's defenders. The assault breaks on the airport with renewed vigor, and a fresh wave of paratroopers skirts Ukrainian positions to land more troops. The tide is turning and the Ukrainian defenders can't hold under the intense pressure of the assault. Forced to retreat, Ukraine once more calls on its artillery, but this time not to attack the Russians, but to pound the runways of the airport. The big guns belch out heavy shells that smash the concrete runways to pieces, and after an hour of bombardment, the runways are a mess of craters and debris. The Ukrainians are forced to cede the airport to the overwhelming Russian assault, but they have won the battle for Antonov by default. With the runways out of commission, no troops can be ferried here making the operation to create the air bridge and quickly win the war a failed one. A parallel assault on nearby Vasilkiv airfield also ends in frustration for the Russians and leaves them with no hope of flying troops and resupply in. The greater battle for Kyiv has now begun and will rage for the next month, but by the end of it, Ukraine will emerge victorious. The war will be decided in the east in the coming months, maybe years, but not within days as Russia foolishly believed it could be. On February 24, 2022, Russia brought war back to Europe after almost eight decades of peace. Its invasion of Ukraine has shattered all expectations of modern European powers resolving their problems peacefully and brought NATO itself to the brink of full-blown war against Russia. But this is only one of four possible ways this war ends, and the other three may surprise you. To date, Russia has lost an estimated 30,000 men either killed, captured, or wounded in action. That amounts to roughly 25% of the initial invasion force's ground combat troops in just over two months of fighting. By comparison, the United States lost 58,222 killed in action over the course of the entire Vietnam War. To put it simply, such incredible casualty rates are not only unprecedented, but completely unsustainable. Already, Russian losses are severe enough that it's estimated it'll take roughly two years to replace its tank losses alone. And that's only if international sanctions are lifted from the nation so it once again has access to the high-tech electronic components it doesn't produce at home. If not, Russia will be back to building Cold War-era tanks, which as we've already seen can't even stand up to manned portable NATO firepower, let alone a fully equipped NATO armored brigade. While there's currently a lot of talk about mobilization, Russian military leaders admit that mobilization will do little to help Russia win this war. It would take 90 days to fully mobilize a replacement tank regiment, and even then, they would only be equipped with Cold War leftover tanks from Russia's vast reserves of very obsolete equipment. These tanks and their completely green conscript crews would perform even worse in Ukraine than Russia's current tank forces. Replenishing Russia's dwindling air power assets is simply untenable until sanctions are lifted or Russia takes the years necessary to retool its economy to provide high-tech electronics at home and build new aircraft. That's why the first possible way that the war in Ukraine ends is with a whimper rather than a bang. At some point, the flow of equipment reaching Ukraine from the west will simply outweigh the flow of obsolete equipment 
flowing into the nation from Russia. NATO military tech overpowers Russia's obsolete Cold War era equipment, and Russian losses continue to mount, trying to break stiff Ukrainian defenses. To offset combat losses and personnel, Russia enacts mobilization and floods the conflict with additional conscripts. These conscripts are undertrained and poorly equipped, as well as suffering from extremely poor morale. They've been thrown into a war against a brother nation that none of them wanted to fight, while the professional volunteer soldiers, whose morale is also starting to slip, force them into combat under threats of punishment, in some cases under threat of death, as it's been reported that Chechen Katerovites have shot Russian soldiers who refuse to fight. The influx of manpower has the reverse effect in the fighting that Russia is hoping for. The tens of thousands of conscripts set loose across the front requires intense resupply at a time when Russia is already struggling to resupply the forces it already had in country. The weak morale and poor training work against Russia by leading to massive casualties and surrenders and engagements across Ukraine. Eventually, the bad morale becomes extremely infectious, leading to very serious breakdowns in discipline. We've already seen how one Russian tank commander had his legs crushed by a subordinate in anger at the extreme losses the unit took. Inevitably, a further Russian advance into Ukraine simply becomes impossible, and the offensive stops. Putin declares victory by saying that he has taken the Donbas region and secured the vital seaport of Mariupol and the all-important waterways leading to Crimea that Ukraine had previously dammed off after Russia seized the peninsula illegally in 2014. This falls way short of Putin's original goals of toppling the Ukrainian government and installing a puppet government, but it still leaves Russia in control of very strategically and economically important areas of Ukraine, while choking off about half of Ukraine's ability to export goods. The situation is not great for Russia, but it's not awful either, and if one overlooks the staggering casualties it took to get there, one might even consider it a win. However, the Ukrainians would have to accept the situation, and it's unlikely they're willing to simply give a quarter of their country over to Russians, especially if they're winning, and while certainly Ukraine isn't winning, it's definitely not losing either. There's every sign that despite Putin's earlier assurances that he wasn't interested in physically occupying Ukraine, that this is no longer the case. Though given Putin's laundry list of lies to date, it's likely this too was a pre-planned act of deception. In Russian-occupied areas, the Russian government is now guaranteeing pensions for Ukrainian citizens living there, as well as introducing the ruble as an official currency and even replacing street signs with those written in the Russian language. A massive effort to russify the occupied territories is underway, with frightening speed, and perhaps most worryingly of all is the fact that one of the first things being brought into occupied territories is Russian television. This means that for citizens in occupied Ukraine, their only news source is now Russian state-run news and its non-stop blitzkrieg of propaganda. Putin is clearly not planning on ceding occupied territories back to Ukraine, but what if Ukraine fights back? Across the modern eastern front in Ukraine, Ukrainian forces are pushing back against Russian positions and liberating villages. However, they're also losing ground in the south. The entire front has become a back and forth reminiscent of 20th century wars, but the all important here is that Ukraine was not supposed to be able to push back against Russian forces at all. Ukrainian forces were supposed to be completely overwhelmed by superior Russian firepower, and yet we've discovered that Russia is almost as big a threat to itself due to incompetence, bad morale, and bad equipment, and worse training as it is to Ukraine. Ukraine could simply refuse to accept Russian occupation and continue fighting. The United States of America has already pledged to continue supporting Ukraine militarily until, as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi put it, the fighting is done. Europe may not be so eager to support an ongoing war in Ukraine, but they don't have to be. In terms of overall contributions to Ukraine, Europe's contributions are a little above symbolic, with the lion's share of support coming from the United States. In recent meetings with America's defense industry leaders, President Joe Biden worked to create a strategy for the ongoing resupply of Ukraine, even if the war lasts for years. As long as Ukraine is willing to fight, the US looks willing to continue supporting it, and the longer Ukraine wants to fight, the worse it might get for the Russians. Already the initial stance on not supporting Ukraine with heavy equipment has shifted. This was due to the stunning performance of Ukrainian troops and the equally stunning incompetence of Russian troops. Western analysts predicted Ukraine would fall within three days, and nobody believed that Ukraine's military could survive, let alone beat back the Russian assault to Kyiv and beyond. Now that the US believes Ukraine can fight for months, even years, it opens up the door for providing Ukraine with heavier equipment. Already, the US has provided Soviet-built helicopters it sourced from other nations, as well as other equipment that Ukrainians are already familiar with. However, if Ukraine is committed to fighting for years and the stalemate in the East holds, there's reason to believe the United States would begin arming Ukraine with modern American equipment. This would require months of training for its crews, but after which Ukraine would be fielding capabilities far superior to Russia's own. This is only possible if Ukraine continues this fight for years. 
as it would take that long to train Ukrainian troops and create the logistical networks required for repairing and replenishing sophisticated equipment such as the M1 Abrams. Yet if Ukraine has to date held against the Russian onslaught, there's little reason to believe the nation couldn't hold a status quo for the necessary time to rearm itself with Western equipment. Under assault from a Western-armed Ukraine, Russia would lose badly in the east and be forced to retreat. At this point, there's only two ways this war ends. The first is with a humiliating admission of defeat by Russia and a general withdrawal. This is extremely unlikely. But as the war costs continue to add up for Russia, Ukraine may be able to force this defeat condition even with current equipment. However, this would be an admission of catastrophic failure to be remembered for all of Russian history and is an unlikely move to be made by any Russian public official. The second way this could end is with the use of weapons of mass destruction against Ukrainian forces. This includes nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. Currently, Russia has nothing to fear from Ukrainian retaliation over the use of WMDs, as the nation has none in its arsenal. Most worryingly, Russia has already planted the seeds for the justification of WMD use by creating propaganda that claims Ukraine itself has been working on chemical and biological weapons, under the supervision of Russia's favorite boogeyman, the US. This is, of course, a blatant lie, as Ukraine has no WMDs. And if it did, surely it would have used them in the initial desperate hours of the war when it seemed as if Russian troops would take Kyiv. Even without Ukraine overpowering Russian troops after years of armament by the West, Putin might still turn to the use of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. President Joe Biden has declared this a line in the sand that would be met with an appropriate response. What this means is anyone's guess, but it's feared this would mean retaliation by the United States itself, proportional to the attack carried out by Russia. If Russia uses chemical weapons, the US might launch a chemical attack against Russian troops inside Ukraine. The US would be unlikely to use such weapons inside Russia itself, for fear of escalating the situation and the only type of attack it might respond tit-for-tat for, for might be a nuclear one. The only thing Ukraine needs less than one nuclear attack on its own soil is two nuclear attacks on its territory. This brings us to yet another way that war in Ukraine could end. If Russia were to turn to the use of WMDs and the United States responded in kind, it could lead to that of which the world has been most fearing a full-blown confrontation between NATO and Russia. And yet, this is a nightmare scenario for Russia given how extremely poor its troops have performed against Ukraine's military, which is largely armed with Cold War weapons. Taking on NATO's professionally trained and well-equipped militaries would be a catastrophe of the highest order for Russian forces. And while before the West feared Russia's growing military might, the war in Ukraine has proven that Russia was a paper tiger all along. This is why, despite Putin's tough rhetoric against the West, the very last thing he wants to see is NATO tanks gathering outside Kaliningrad. Putin might speak tough, but he really has to ask himself just how many wars he wants to be losing at once. Our final way that the war in Ukraine might end is one that seems unlikely at first glance, but is frighteningly possible if several key facts about the conflict change. Currently, Russia is bombing civilians in their homes, and even going to great lengths to specifically target civilian shelters. Russia is also destroying civilian infrastructure not just in the east where the heaviest fighting is taking place, but all the way as far west as Lviv, which had its power plant bombed by Russia. Despite having no military value, these random civilian targets are in fact far from random because they have great terror value. Putin's strategy is simple. It follows the same strategy that Russia used in Syria. By targeting civilians, he hopes to create mass panic and fear across the country, eventually prodding the people to sue for peace. In Syria, terrorized civilians refused to support rebel forces. In Ukraine, a terrorized population could demand that its military stop fighting. With no political will to fight, Ukraine could surrender to Russia without Russia ever needing to completely dominate it. It's likely this campaign of terror would backfire against Russia, seeing as how the nation doesn't enjoy the military superiority it enjoyed in Syria. However, should it work, Russia would end up installing a pro-Kremlin leader into power in Ukraine, given the fact that today Russia seems to have no intention on returning occupied territories and is even going so far as to russify them, a puppet leader could call for a referendum on Ukraine, rejoining Russia in the style of a former Soviet republic. It's even possible that Russia would actually rebrand itself as the Soviet Union again, something that is likely extremely appealing to a Cold War diehard like Vladimir Putin. A new Iron Curtain could fall across Europe and the Cold War 2.0 would begin anew. With Ukraine pacified, Putin would inevitably invade Moldova. Recently, a Russian general accidentally let slip what seemed to be Putin's real goals in Ukraine. His efforts focused on creating a land corridor across southern Ukraine that would not only cut off Ukraine from the sea and choke its economy, but also allow access to the Moldovan breakaway region of Transnistria. 
From there, Russian forces could pour into Moldova as well, all under the guise of protecting Russian native speakers. Putin would be two steps closer to restoring the former Soviet Union in its full glory, with eyes indubitably turning west toward Latvia, Lithuania, and Slovakia. These three nations are currently NATO members, which makes it doubtful Putin would seriously try to invade them, especially after President Biden's declaration that the United States would fight for every inch of NATO territory. The wording of this proclamation wasn't an accident either, as the United States has been aware of internal Russian brainstorming that involved launching a tiny incursion into a Baltic state, just enough to take a single village or a few miles of border territory, and then digging in defensively. This would force NATO to go to war against the entrenched Russian defense force over an insignificant border incursion. Seeing as some current NATO members didn't even want the Baltic states to join the alliance in the first place due to their vulnerability to Russia, it's possible NATO would splinter internally over the invocation of Article 5. This would destroy confidence in the alliance, especially from its most vulnerable members in the East, and could lead to a collapse of NATO on the whole. This would leave the United States and perhaps a few other European countries fighting an extremely unpopular war that a significant portion of Europe doesn't even want. In such a scenario, it's possible Russia wins this confrontation with the West and is allowed to take as much of the Baltics as it really wants. Vladimir Putin would have finally succeeded in restoring the Soviet Union in whole and greatly escalating the potential for a devastating nuclear conflict. Crimea, the flashpoint for the ongoing invasion of Ukraine. But how did a gesture that was meant to show the quote, boundless trust and love the Russian people feel toward the Ukrainian people end up as the catalyst for the slaughter of Ukrainians at Russian hands? The stage for today's war between Ukraine and Russia was set in the late 1700s. The Crimean Peninsula had been under the rule of the Crimean Khanate for 300 years and was the longest surviving splinter of Genghis Khan's once powerful Golden Horde. The peninsula was bordered by both Russia and the Ottoman Empires, but the presence of a significant number of Turkic Crimean Tatars brought the peninsula under the influence of the Ottomans. In 1768, Western Europe was experiencing a period of weakness after the Seven Years' War, and an increasingly powerful Russia took advantage of the situation to impose its influence on Poland. Guerrilla war soon broke out, though Russian troops managed to suppress most of the uprisings. One group managed to slip away from the Russian troops by crossing over the border into the Ottoman Empire. The Cossacks pursuing them paid no heed to the borders and followed to the town of Balta, where they massacred everyone. Shortly after, war broke out between Russia and the Ottomans. The Ottoman Empire was beset by infighting though, and while technically the superior force with a superior tactical position thanks to their control of the Black Sea, Russia would end up the victor six years later. This marked the rise of Russia as a major European power, and in the peace negotiations that followed, Western Europe states worked to limit the terms of the peace treaty so as to prevent Russia from gaining too much influence in the East. Crimea, however, was annexed by Russia and soon heavily colonized by both Russians and Ukrainians, though with a population that was ultimately mostly Russian. In 1853, Russia once more went to war with the declining Ottoman Empire. Britain and France joined in on the side of the Ottomans to prevent Russia from gaining too much influence over breakaway states of the ever-declining Ottoman Empire. Much of the fighting would take place in Crimea, hence the war earning the name the Crimean War, and it would leave the peninsula devastated economically. Russian persecution of Crimean Tatars led to many being killed or forced to flee the Ottoman Empire, with the Russians ending the practice only because too much farmland was being left unattended. Despite being the focus of much of the fighting, the peninsula remained in Russian hands though. Having lost the war, the Russian Empire went into a decades-long period of decline during which it sought to reinvent itself so as to remain its former status as a major European power. For Crimea though, life would remain largely the same until the Russian Civil War of 1917. Prompted by increasing dissatisfaction over the domestic condition in Russia and a disastrous involvement in World War I, the Russian Revolution began with the Tsar stepping down from power, believing that his removal would calm the ever-increasing social unrest. In his place, the Russian Duma was formed, which was made up of prominent capitalists as well as the Russian nobility and aristocracy. This, however, did not sit well with many people. Though liberated from serfdoms decades before, their liberation had come with vast stipulations that heavily favored the nobility that once lorded over them. The common people thus distrusted the Duma and banded together into Soviets, grassroots community assemblies that sought to bring political power to the lower classes through unity. For a time, the Duma ruled alongside the Soviets, with the Duma in control of the military and international affairs and the Soviets wielding great influence over domestic affairs. With the allegiance of much of the working class and middle classes, the Soviets were too powerful for the Duma to simply disband by force or ignore. 
Amongst the Soviets was the quickly growing Bolshevik faction, headed by Vladimir Lenin, who campaigned on the slogan of peace, land, and bread. He wished to end the disastrous war against Germany, give land belonging to the nobles to the peasantry, and end the famine caused by Russia's losing war. With thousands of demoralized soldiers coming home from the Eastern Front, the Bolsheviks quickly grew in popularity, and support for the war dwindled. Finally, tensions exploded with the October Revolution, during which the Bolshevik forces stormed Petrograd and overthrew the provisional government, leaving them in power over all of Russia. However, not everyone in Russia accepted Bolshevik rule, prompting the Russian Civil War. Russia split into whites and reds, with the white factions consisting of capitalists, imperialists, wishing to see the Tsar restored to power, and various other political factions all supported by the West, who hoped that a white victory would return Russia to the war and continue to put pressure on Germany. Crimea became a stronghold for the White Army thanks to its access to the Black Sea, which allowed for easy resupply from Western allies. The peninsula would swap hands multiple times, though, as the bloody war progressed, making it one of the bloodiest places in all of Russia at the time. However, as the war turned against the Whites, Crimea would be where they'd make their last stand in 1920. After being defeated, any surviving Whites fled to Istanbul and beyond. 50,000 White prisoners of war and civilians would end up massacred after the defeat of the White Army. In 1921, the Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was created and officially joined with the Soviet Union. Despite claimed autonomy, though, Crimea remained very much in control of the Soviet Union, and autonomy did not protect its population from Joseph Stalin's repressions. With tensions rising in the peninsula, Stalin took advantage of the natural famine and worsened it on purpose so as to starve millions of rebellious Ukrainians, including many in Crimea. Crimea would once more become the site of atrocities during the German invasion of the Soviet Union in the Second World War. Crimea was highly sought after by the Germans due to its beauty and fertility, and was seen as a crown jewel to be seized and handed over to the German colonists after the war. Thus, it became the site of many of the war's bloodiest battles, until finally falling to the Germans. Despite brutal reprisals, though, the Germans were never able to secure the mountainous areas from a partisan movement that lasted until they themselves were finally expelled by Russian forces. Stalin, however, had his own plans for the ethnic cleansing of Crimea and followed German persecutions of locals and especially Jews with its forced deportation of Crimean Tatars. The Tatars had their land seized from them and forcibly deported to Central Asia in a bid to destroy them culturally. The Armenians, Bulgarians, and Greeks would follow suit, leaving mostly Russians and Ukrainians behind. The Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was also abolished in 1945, with the peninsula being made officially a part of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. In 1954, though the Crimean Peninsula was officially returned to the Ukrainian Republic via a decree from the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. In a front-page announcement on the official newspaper of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Pravda, the decree read, On April 26, 1954, the decree of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet transferring the Crimean Oblast from the Russian SFSR to the Ukrainian SSR. Taking into account the integral character of the economy, the territorial proximity, and the close economic and cultural ties between the Crimean province and the Ukrainian SSR, the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet decrees to approve the joint presentation of the Presidium of the Russian SFSR Supreme Soviet and the Presidium of the Ukrainian SSR Supreme Soviet on the transfer of the Crimean province from the Russian SFSR to the Ukrainian SSR. The reason for the transfer of the strategically important peninsula to Ukraine was described as a symbolic gesture, marking the 300th anniversary of the 1654 Treaty of Pereyaslav. However, this doesn't hold up to scrutiny as Pereyaslav is in central Ukraine and nowhere near Crimea, and neither did the treaty affect the peninsula itself. Symbolically, the Communist Party was trying to portray the treaty as the unification between Ukrainians and Russians. But while the treaty was a major step in that direction, plenty of violence remained before Ukrainians and Russians would consider themselves brothers. The real reasons are numerous. Nina Khrushcheva, political scientist and great-granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, believed that the transfer of the peninsula to the Ukrainian people was partially symbolic, partially an effort to reshuffle the centralized political system, and also because Khrushchev had always been fond of Ukraine. She believed that it was a gesture from her great-grandfather to what was his favorite republic. However, Sergei Khrushchev, son of Nikita Khrushchev, claimed that the decision was due to the building of a hydroelectric dam on the Dnieper River and a desire for the administration of the Ukrainian territory to be under a single body. Thus, ceding the peninsula back to the Ukrainian Republic was a measure of convenience. Other reasons, though, include the integration of the Ukrainian and Crimean economies and the belief that Crimea was a natural extension of the Ukrainian steppes. There was even some desire to repopulate Crimea with Slavs after the expulsions of the Crimean Tatars by Stalin in 1944. 
war. One effect of the transfer, however, was the unifying of the Ukrainian and Russian people. Savatopol in Crimea was the home of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet and an all-important naval base for the Soviets, through which they could influence the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and beyond. By transferring the peninsula, it bound Ukraine closer to Russia and even the 1954 posters announcing the event ran with the slogan, Eternally Together. Whatever the reasons, the transferring of the peninsula did indeed bring the Russian and Ukrainian people closer together, resulting in great benefit to both. However, as the Soviet Union began to disintegrate in 1989, Ukraine declared its independence shortly after, taking Crimea along with it. This suddenly put the Russian Navy in a very disadvantageous position in the Black Sea, further impacting its ability to influence the Mediterranean. Vladimir Putin vowed to resolve that situation and took advantage of a political strife in Ukraine in 2014 to forcibly annex the peninsula. Putin claimed that he was merely responding to the request of a majority Russian population to be part of the Russian Federation. Crimea would end up emboldening Putin, however, and fueling his support for breakaway republics in eastern Ukraine. Claims were made that these republics too contained a majority of citizens who wanted to rejoin Russia, and public referendums were held that showed support in favor of leaving Ukraine. Though these results were immediately disputed since no independent sources were allowed to verify the voting and the results weren't recognized by either the Ukrainian government or any UN member countries. This only added to the tension of the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war, which has now lasted until at least 2022, and following Putin's decision to invade all of Ukraine, it doesn't appear to be ending anytime soon. What happens next in Ukraine is anyone's guess, though the current invasion is going disastrously for Russia. And in just the first two weeks of fighting, Russia lost more men and equipment than the United States did in 20 years of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Even if Russia succeeds in defeating the Ukrainian military, it's impossible for its army to secure the entire country against a raging insurgency hell-bent on expelling Russian troops from their native soil. With so much political goodwill destroyed between Russia and Ukraine, and with the blacklisting of Russia internationally, along with the staggering losses in lives and equipment, even if Russia wins in Ukraine, it will still have lost the war. In 1991, Ukraine declared itself independent as the Soviet Union collapsed around it. For years after, the new Russian Federation struggled to find its footing, and for a small time there were hopes that the Cold War could be left in the past and Russia would find its way to embracing better relationships with the West. However, those hopes were dashed with the election of President Vladimir Putin, a Cold War-era Soviet spy who was still stuck with a Cold War mentality. For Putin, the Soviet Union might have collapsed, but the dream of Soviet greatness wasn't dead, and the one thing standing between his dream and the new Russian Federation was the West. In Putin's eyes, Russia was forever locked in a zero-sum game with the West, and there could only be one victor. As the Soviet Union disintegrated, newly freed Soviet republics and former client states immediately sought out membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. For those former republics and client states, it was the only way to guarantee their newfound independence after decades of brutal rule and oppression by the Kremlin. The Soviet Union might be gone, but nobody had any illusions about the Russian Federation suddenly wanting to be BFFs with the world and the election of Vladimir Putin only reinforced a growing need for NATO membership. In 1990, NATO had promised that the alliance would not expand an inch to the east, yet this was before the collapse of the Soviet Union and clearly meant that the alliance wouldn't seek to expand into East Germany while the nation was divided. There had never been any discussions about NATO not expanding eastward toward Russia's borders after the collapse, as confirmed by Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev. That doesn't mean that Russia didn't warn NATO about expanding, it's just that there was no formal agreement against expansion. For Russia, NATO expanding eastward triggered fears of past historical invasions of Russia by foreign powers. The nation has suffered greatly from foreign invaders, and thus after World War II, Stalin worked hard to ensure that Eastern Europe remained under his influence. Europe was thus divided along Germany, with the Soviet Union controlling everything in Europe east of Germany and using it as a security buffer between itself and the West. The buffer served two purposes. First, it was a physical barrier to invasion. After both German invasions and the invasion of the French during the Napoleonic War, Russia suffered great loss of life and damage to its economy. Eastern Europe was now a shield that protected the motherland, with any would-be invader having to pass through the entire Soviet bloc to reach Russian lands. Even better, millions of Eastern Europeans would themselves be thrown into war to protect the Soviet Union, placing the nation in the strongest position it's enjoyed since the heights of the Russian Empire. But this barrier was also an ideological one, meant to keep Western capitalist influence away from the Soviet homeland. The power of the Communist Party depended on keeping Stalinist ideology alive inside the Soviet Union, 
liberal Western values and democracies threatened this. This has never been more true than it was post 2000s. After Vladimir Putin's rise to power, liberal Western values are now seen as an infection in Russia because they threaten President Putin's absolute power on the Russian government. For Putin, Russia today is under assault by Western culture, and he spent great efforts in waging a propaganda war both within and outside its borders. The last thing Putin or his elites want is a free, democratic Russia, and the only way they can prevent the ever-brewing political unrest amongst the population is by creating boogeymen out of the West to unite the Russians against. Starting in the early 2010s, Ukraine now wished to draw itself closer economically and politically with the West, much to Putin's dissatisfaction. At first, there was a wish to be more economically tied to the West to ensure Ukraine's prosperity. But as Russia exerted more pressure on Ukraine, a growing movement to formally join NATO grew inside Ukraine. Putin attempted to suppress this desire through intimidation and by using propaganda inside of Ukraine, even by infiltrating its government. In 2014, the situation came to a crisis point when President Viktor Yanukovych of Putin's stooge refused to sign a free trade agreement with the European Union which would have drawn Ukraine deeper into the West's fold both economically and politically. Instead, President Yanukovych ignored the Ukrainian parliament's overwhelming desire to sign this agreement and chose to draw closer to Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union, headed by the Russian Federation and made up of former Soviet states. The result was immediate, as protesters took to the streets and a full-blown civil insurrection threw Kyiv into chaos. The Ukrainian people had freed themselves from Russian rule and had no wish to go back to being a mere client state, and brutal clashes took place between protesters and police. The revolution of dignity, as it came to be known, resulted in the occupation of the government buildings across Ukraine and the expulsion of President Viktor Yanukovych from power. Soon after, Yanukovych went into exile in Russia, and Russia responded to the coup by taking Crimea and supporting the breakaway provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk. Russia orchestrated pro-Russian demonstrations in Sevastopol, and four days later, Russian troops without insignia stormed into the parliament of Crimea and seized it, while other Russian troops took key strategic sites along the peninsula. With the peninsula secure, the Russian Federation installed the pro-Russian Sergei Askinov into power. Shortly after, there was a referendum that resulted in 97% of voters choosing for Crimea to be absorbed by the Russian Federation. Perhaps unsurprisingly, those votes were never verified by any independent agency, and the United Nations voted overwhelmingly to consider the referendum illegal. Thus, to this day, internationally, Crimea is still considered as belonging to Ukraine. But with Vladimir Putin threatening to use nuclear weapons, nobody sought to use military force to liberate the occupied peninsula. At the same time that Russian forces were seizing Crimea, Russia's infamous Little Green Men, so-called for their green insignia-less uniforms, moved into the separatist regions of Luhansk and Donetsk, working alongside separatists and even engaging in fighting themselves. Russia denied allegations that its military was in the separatist regions, but the ruse was all but given up over time, as even Russian armor joined the fighting against Ukrainian forces. The Donbass War, as it came to be known, would rage until 2022, culminating in Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The real question is, though, what does President Vladimir Putin really want to do with Ukraine when the war is all over? The answer depends on how the war ends. The least likely way that this war ends is with a full occupation of Ukraine by Russian forces. Initially, Putin claimed that he had no intention of occupying any part of Ukrainian territory, and that his advance on Kyiv was merely meant to remove what he called pro-Western Nazi government from power. In the early stages of war, this might have been true. Putin may truly have not wished to physically occupy Ukraine, and instead settled for installing a puppet government. This would turn Ukraine into a client state, much like Belarus, without the hassle of having to pacify an inevitable insurrection by physically occupying it. It would also achieve its grand aim of weakening NATO by denying it yet another member, especially one situated right on Russia's soft southern belly. However, as the Russian advance into Kyiv faltered and then failed entirely, Putin's strategy seemed to radically change as well. Accepting that he would be unable to take Kyiv and topple the government, Russian forces instead focused on breaking out of the separatist regions and seizing the all-important Ukrainian southern coast along the Sea of Azov. With this coastline firmly under Russia's control, Vladimir Putin now has a land corridor from Russia straight to Crimea, and Crimea's water supply can no longer be threatened by Ukrainian dams as it happened after the annexation when Ukraine blocked Crimea's drinking water in retaliation to the invasion. This land corridor, however, also gives Russia complete control over the Sea of Azov, essentially turning it into a Russian lake. Putin's forces now try to push north and west out of the land corridor and seem to want to take as large a chunk of Ukraine as possible. What's more important, however, is extending a corridor to the west all the way to Odessa 
and the Moldovian border. This would give Russia complete control over Ukraine's shipping ports and thus allow it to choke off Ukraine economically, but also allow it to link up with its forces inside the Moldovan breakaway region of Transnistria. Russia currently has 1,500 personnel there, and it's greatly feared that linking a land corridor across southern Ukraine will allow it to move more forces into the region and eventually take all of Moldova. This will give Russia control over half of the Black Sea and extend a security buffer out from Russia's vulnerable southern regions in case of a war with NATO. It's now certain that Putin wishes to completely annex occupied territories inside of Ukraine, as starting May 1st, the ruble was introduced as the official currency in the occupied areas that remain relatively stable and in Russian hands. Street and building signs were also all taken down and replaced with their Russian equivalent, and Russia guaranteed the pension payments of Ukrainian pensioners living in the territories. Even more importantly, Russian state TV was brought to the occupied territories, allowing Russia to feed those living under occupation a steady stream of Russian propaganda. Putin's goal is now territorial expansion, and it seems as if his plans for Ukraine hinge on what happens next in the war. Russian forces seem incapable of truly taking the whole of Ukraine, and the commitment by the West, especially the United States, to arm the Ukrainians makes it a complete impossibility that Russia will be able to take over the entire country. However, Russian forces may be able to seize that all-important land corridor to Moldova and take Odessa. Even though this is in question, seeing as three months into the war, Russia is yet to bring Mariupol under its full control. Further west, Kherson is a critically important city to capture, and as of the writing of this video, Ukrainian forces are launching successful counterstrikes against Russian forces around the city. This makes a breakout to Odessa extremely unlikely, but this isn't Russia's only problem. Corruption and incompetence across all levels of the Russian military have resulted in massive casualties and great loss of equipment in the invasion. The effects of these losses on Russia's ability to continue fighting are only compounded by the astounding amount of sanctions levied against Russia by the international community. Of greatest importance, though, are those targeting Russia's foreign reserves, which fund the war, and of which half have been frozen by Western governments. Of second most importance is the complete ban on selling electronic components to Russia, which are desperately needed by its military to rearm itself with 21st century weapons. Already, Russian drones and other advanced weapons are being discovered with computer chips ripped out of coffee makers and dishwashers, and Russian jet fighters have been discovered with commercial GPS devices taped to the dash. With the West feeding Ukraine a steady diet of high-tech Western weapons, and with Russia's own stockpile of advanced equipment drying up, it's becoming increasingly impossible for Russia to truly win inside Ukraine. As Europe is committed to an incremental ban on Russian energy imports over the next year or so, Russia's economic situation will only grow more desperate, and its ability to continue this conflict will be in serious jeopardy. Russia is thus likely to attempt to settle the war by holding onto territories it's managed to secure, adding them to the Russian Federation, and weakening Ukraine. Ukraine itself has been willing to compromise by becoming a neutral nation, with neutrality enshrined in its constitution and thus seeking no closer ties to the West. However, Ukraine wishes to have guarantor states sign this neutrality agreement with nations legally bound to come to Ukraine's defense in case of another Russian invasion. Yet, as reports of Russian brutality against civilians continue to surface from occupied areas, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has stated that he is less and less interested in such a deal. Ultimately, unless Russia achieves some miraculous battlefield reversals, Putin's future plans for Ukraine may not matter at all. It's no secret the world is largely united against Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. But it might surprise you just how the Russian people feel about this invasion. To understand the Russian people and their support for Vladimir Putin, first you have to understand Russian culture and society. Unlike many countries who experienced a great evil in the past, Russians never truly came to terms with the abuses of the Soviet Union. In fact, most Russians today still believe that Joseph Stalin was a great man, despite the fact that he imprisoned and killed millions of his own people. In 2016, the dead dictator's approval rating was 54%, in a poll conducted by the Moscow Times. In 2019, though, 70% of Russians polled by the independent Levada Center said that Stalin played a favorable role for Russia. Over half of those surveyed even said that they personally viewed Stalin favorably. In May of 2021, a new poll showed that 56% of Russians viewed Stalin as a great leader. South Africa actively strode for racial reconciliation after apartheid. The United States has made civil rights for people of color and other minorities a front and center issue in domestic politics for decades, and Germany has completely denounced its Nazi past and actively works to educate its own children on the horrors of the regime, convinced that such a thing should never happen again. All of these countries and more have acknowledged their past and taken responsibility for it. 
while taking steps to rehabilitate their societies from the ill effects of said past. It may be an ongoing process in some cases, but the fact that it's happening at all is what's important. Russia has never experienced a collective reconciliation over the brutality of the Soviet regime, and this explains much about the current attitudes on Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Rather than acknowledge all the evils of leaders like Stalin and the great economic and physical harm caused by the Soviet Union, the Russian people have shifted the blame to various groups. A common sentiment in response to the evils of the Soviets is that it was the Bolsheviks. Bafflingly, sometimes Russia's favorite bogeyman, the United States, is to blame. Culpability is constantly deflected from one group to another, and the Russian people aren't completely to blame for this lack of self-accountability. Since 2021, it's been illegal in Russia to deny that the Soviet Union played a decisive role in overcoming fascism in World War II. And it's likewise illegal to equate the war crimes of the Soviet Union, of which there were many, with those committed by Nazi Germany. In Russian schools, history is taught selectively, with many of the Soviet regime's worst abuses either played down or simply not taught. Vladimir Putin even went to great lengths to spin the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany as a diplomatic victory. This pact outlined how Eastern Europe would be carved out by the two world powers, and was so shameful even to Soviet leaders that Mikhail Gorbachev publicly denied it and attempted to rewrite the history behind the pact. This time of historical rewriting by Vladimir Putin's administration helps us to understand why so many Russians support the war in Ukraine today. In 2005, just a few years after Putin's ascension to power, 40% of those polled agreed that Stalin had absolutely decimated the Red Army's leadership prior to World War II with his paranoid purges. This is, of course, a matter of historical fact, and the reason why the Soviets performed so astonishingly poorly during the Winter War against a much smaller Finland. Yet in 2021, only 17% of respondents agreed on the 2005 question. Putin has spent considerable resources to rewrite Russia's understanding of their own history, fully in preparation for his orchestration of a return to a repressive Soviet time, under his firm leadership, of course. Anyone who tries to bring up real history of the Soviet Union is painted as a foreign agent, probably American ones at that, as Putin has turned the US into a national boogeyman who's hiding under every bed and in every closet. His total information control doesn't just extend to the past, though, but also to the present, as media in Russia now is the least free it's been since the strictest days of censorship during the Soviet Union. Journalists who dug too deep into issues the Kremlin did not want exposed, or who wrote articles the Kremlin didn't like, were often discovered dead or missing. For a while, Russia was officially one of the most dangerous places to be a reporter in, and this included places like active war zones in Africa or in the Middle East. After the invasion of Ukraine, Putin's control over the media has only tightened to the point that the average Russian receives a steady diet of pure propaganda. It's now illegal in Russia to refer to the war in Ukraine as anything other than a special military operation, and this law is enforced with steep fines and as many as 15 years in prison. Putin has also passed a law that is in essence the widest sweeping form of censorship that Russia has seen in decades. It's not just illegal to call the war anything other than a special military operation, but it's also illegal to write, post, or say anything meant to hurt Russian morale or spread misinformation. What actually counts as hurting Russian morale or misinformation is, of course, left up to the Kremlin. This gives Putin and his administration incredible power to shape narratives on the war in Ukraine any way they wish. So, how do Russians feel about the war? Given Russia's lack of free speech and government interference in most media, getting accurate data is rather difficult. However, polls conducted by independent and not-so-independent agencies across Russia since the start of the invasion all clearly show overwhelming support for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. One survey showed 65% were in favor of the invasion, while a second showed 71. Independent polls routinely show figures above 50% approval. How can so many Russians support one of the most horrific conflicts in Europe since World War II? There's a reason why Putin has insisted the war be called a special military operation. It's careful phrasing that's meant to encourage the Russian people that there is no war, just a low-grade military operation. This is no different than a military operation the US might undertake to eliminate a new Al-Qaeda cell in a remote corner of Africa. Military operations are routine and even more importantly not very wide-sweeping. This is important because despite the two nations having taken wildly different paths since the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine is still seen as a brother nation to most Russians. The two share much of the same history and culture, and large amounts of the population speak the same language. 
The kinship was so close that before the war, Russian troops in the first few weeks of fighting were genuinely shocked that they'd been greeted not as liberators, but as invaders and occupiers. Putin admitting to the Russian people that he was launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine would be like President Biden announcing that the United States was going to invade Britain. It's an unthinkable proposition for the American people to see themselves at war with a nation they consider to be a true brother nation. And likewise, the Russian people would be shocked to find out the truth about the brutality of Russian actions inside Ukraine. The careful language allows Putin to minimize this outrage, but also allows him to craft the narrative that he needs to continue gaining Russian support. By framing the invasion as a special military operation, Putin has convinced many of the Russian people that this war is actually about securing the safety of the Russian-speaking population of Donbas. But Putin still needed a boogeyman, someone that the Russian people would see as an enemy. And that's why he tapped into history. Putin's public justification for the invasion was that he was cleansing Ukraine of the threat of neo-Nazism. To the world, this is a ridiculous proposition, but to many Russians, it's an issue near and dear to their hearts. Their nation, after all, suffered more than any other at the hands of the Nazis during the Second World War. Thus, by painting this as a conflict against a resurgence of Nazism that threatened fellow Russian speakers, Putin was able to portray this as a heroic and moral war. The fact that these imaginary Nazis are right outside Russia's border only helps those spinning this war as a fight against fascism. Even the fact that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is Jewish has been spun by Russian propagandists who point out that Hitler also had Jewish blood in him. When Russia immediately ran into trouble inside Ukraine, not even the tightest of information control could stop the slow realization that this was no small-scale military operation. Russia was at full-scale war, and its military needed to mobilize as such. The impact of the fighting is so intense that an estimated 20% of all Russian tanks have been destroyed, though this relies only on visual confirmation, and thus the real total is indubitably much higher. 3,342 armored vehicles have been confirmed destroyed, damaged, abandoned, or captured by Ukrainian forces. 115 combat aircraft have also been destroyed, damaged, or captured. Now Putin needed to justify the broadening of the special military operation into full-scale war, and to do this, he once more summoned the favorite Russian boogeyman, the United States of America. The new narrative is that NATO, at the behest of the US, is fighting a proxy war against Russia, while extremists inside of Ukraine pull the strings and force their army and population to fight a war they don't really want to. Casualties are estimated to have reached as high as 20,000 dead, with Ukraine claiming to have confirmed 18,900 as of April 8th via bodies they have personally collected or intercepted intelligence reports. Yet the Kremlin has cleverly spun this as the work of NATO and the US, thus rallying the Russian people against the much-hated West. But not all Russians support the invasion. In fact, 6,500 people were arrested across 53 cities in Russia during February 24th to March 2nd in anti-war protests as tens of thousands took to the streets. However, the passage of new censorship laws have taken the wind out of the sails of any Russians who oppose the invasion, as they live in fear of arrest for their anti-war views. Russian police have even been documented searching vehicles and homes for evidence of anti-war sentiments, and Russia is slowly reverting back to a Soviet-era culture of neighbors snitching on neighbors. One thing is clear, though. While most Russians support the war in Ukraine, young Russians are the demographic most likely to not support the invasion. And since the start of the war, hundreds of thousands of them have left Russia. Turkey has become a hotbed of anti-war, anti-Putin sentiment among Russians who have fled their own country, as the EU will not allow passage for anyone with a Russian passport. While Russia has disconnected much of global social media from itself, young Russians are more likely to be able to know how to bypass national internet blocks via VPNs, and this exposes them to international news where they can see the truth about the consequences of the brutal war in Ukraine. Translating that to the older population, however, has not been as successful, and many young Russians report they no longer speak with parents or grandparents over their difference of views on the war. Putin may have the support of the majority of the population, but he has very little support amongst the two segments of the population that matter the most, young people and military conscripts. With conscripts making up a quarter of Russian forces, by the end of the war there will be tens of thousands of Russian conscripts returning home with their own version of the war to share. Here, it's important to note that the February Revolution of 1917, which overthrew the Tsar, was largely premeditated by the return of thousands of disillusioned troops from their time on the front. As casualties mount, the reality of the war will begin to sink home with average Russians who have lost husbands, brothers, and fathers in Ukraine. 
and Putin won't be able to deflect for long the anger of thousands of families grieving loved ones by blaming the West. Battle for Kyiv was supposed to take a few days, a week at the most. Spearheading the assault was Russia's vaunted paratroopers, forces so revered in Russia that they have their own holiday. Yet within 48 hours it was clear the air assault on Kyiv had failed, with terrible losses amongst Russia's elite troops. And for weeks after, the Russian column attempting to enter the Ukrainian capital suffered devastating counterattack after counterattack as it struggled to meet basic resupply needs. Eventually Russia declared defeat and retreated, using troops aimed at the heart of the Ukrainian nation to instead reinforce the fight in the East. But what if the assault on Kyiv had succeeded? What if the war in the East fails for Ukraine? What will happen if Russia formally annexes the breakaway Soviet Republic and brings it once more back into the fold? The current Russian offensive seems to have dramatically redefined goals. At the start of the war, it was clear that Russia was attempting a decapitation strike on the Ukrainian capital, hoping to subdue the nation in days and install a puppet leader. When the assault on Kyiv failed, the Russian goals were redefined and a settlement of sorts appears to have been reached. Instead of taking the entire nation and turning into a Russian proxy like Belarus, Russia appears to be satisfied with first taking the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Then Russian efforts have been focused on seizing a land corridor to Crimea and securing the Dnipro River. This will allow Russian-occupied Crimea to no longer be at the mercy of Ukraine, which in the past had cut off the peninsula from vital freshwater supplies by building a dam. The move caused Crimea's agricultural industry to shrink dramatically and greatly limited the economic opportunities available to Russian investors there. It's currently questionable if Russia can maintain its hold on these regions though. As of the making of this video, Ukraine is launching a brutal counterattack across the southeastern part of the nation and is within striking distance of Kherson. Taking Kherson would give Ukrainian forces an easy crossing point across the Dnipro River and also allow them to base aircraft and long-range artillery, such as the American HIMARS, to attack against targets inside Crimea. Kherson would also allow the Ukrainian military to threaten Russian ships inside the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov with long-range anti-ship missiles, tech which is still being provided to Ukraine by the West. This counterattack would not have been possible without the aid of U.S. long-range attack platforms such as HIMARS and the TACOM, which allow Ukrainian forces to finally threaten Russian forces with deep strikes. For two months, Ukraine used its Western weapons to destroy supply and movement routes, such as blowing up the bridges outside of Kherson on the eastern side of the city, and to strike at ammunition depots and command posts. The effect was telling, with the Russian military being forced to move its supply centers further away from the front, greatly increasing the time required for resupply of combat troops and slowing any combat operations they might attempt to undertake. The loss of many senior command staff to deep strikes has also had a severe effect on both morale and the Russian military's ability to fight, limiting the scope of its combined arms operations. If Russia was to take the whole of Ukraine, it would first need to cut off the flow of Western weapons into the nation. Yet Russia has little to no political capital left to influence Western powers to cease supplying Ukraine, and its attempts to bully Europe into submission by cutting down on gas supplies has done little to stop the flow of advanced weapons into the Ukrainians. In fact, the supply of Western weapons has only increased in both numbers and scope, with the American Congress approving the training of Ukrainian pilots to fly the F-15 Eagle. In six months' time, it's extremely likely that the Ukrainian air Force will be operating American F-15s armed with advanced medium-range anti-air and anti-radiation missiles, putting Russian control of the skies in serious jeopardy. Meanwhile, Russia's own stockpiles of modern weapons are running out, and with sanctions of high-tech materials such as semiconductors, the Russian defense industry is unable to replace advanced modern weapon systems. To take Ukraine, Russia would somehow have to completely reverse the political and strategic picture, a frankly impossible event. As there is no realistic scenario where Russia succeeds in taking the whole of Ukraine, we still have to suspend disbelief and imagine what would happen if this somehow happened. The very first thing that would happen if Russia took the whole of Ukraine is it would make Moldova incredibly nervous. Transnistria is a breakaway region along Moldova's border with Ukraine that has strong ties to Russia and the old Soviet Union. In fact, Russia maintains a very small contingent of troops there to act as peacekeeping forces after a brief conflict between Moldova and the breakaway region. During the early weeks of the war in Ukraine, it became apparent to many observers that Russia was attempting to push deep through the south of Ukraine to Odessa, even bombarding Odessa in preparation for an assault. But this push wasn't just to take the strategically important port city, but also to facilitate the creation of a Russian-controlled corridor extending all the way to Transnistria, giving the Russians access to Moldova. 
If Ukraine were to fall to Russia, Moldova would inevitably be next. Moldova is technically a neutral state, fearing Russian reprisal if it were to make a bid to join NATO. As such, it's not protected by the organization's defense commitment and would be easy pickings for the Russian military. Taking Moldova would allow Russian forces to create an even larger buffer in the south between itself and NATO in case of war. And from military bases in the country, it could threaten most of the Black Sea with long-range attack munitions, a very important capability for Russia as in any conflict with NATO, the weak Russian Black Sea fleet would be destroyed rather quickly. With so much territory to buffer NATO with in the south, it would allow Russia to concentrate more forces along its border with the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, putting more pressure on those breakaway republics and seriously threatening them in case of war. Of course, now that Sweden and Finland are in the process of joining NATO, being able to reinforce its northern borders is of even greater importance for Russia. Just remember that if you've ever had a bad day, at least you're not the Russian leader who dedicated his life to destroying NATO and ended up making it even stronger. Control over Ukraine would help Russia counter NATO's ability to project air and naval power into the Black Sea. It would in effect leave Russia with full control over the entire northern coastline, and most of its eastern coast as well thanks to the military occupation of regions of Georgia. From bases along the coast, Russia could use its land forces to make up for its relative naval weakness and shut the Black Sea off to NATO fleets under threat of great loss of both life and ships. However, of even greater importance would be Russia's rights to the vast oil and natural gas reserves hiding under the Black Sea, large amounts of which are currently under Ukraine's claimed economic exclusion zone. The taking of Crimea by Russia in 2014 gave it access to a good chunk of those reserves, but taking all of Ukraine's southern coast would place a significant amount of those reserves in Russian hands. Having access to these vast new reserves would make Russia an even greater energy superpower than it currently is, and with energy fueling the majority of the Russian economy, it can be argued that seizing these reserves is not only a goal, but perhaps a matter of national economic survival. What is certain, though, is that the acquisition of approximately half of the Black Sea's energy reserves would give Russia significantly more leverage over the West, while denying it the economic bounty lurking under the waves. The Black Sea isn't the only strategically important water feature that Russia is seeking to control from an invasion of Ukraine. The Sea of Azov has historically been of extreme importance to regional powers because of its economic interests. Control over the Sea of Azov has resulted in conflicts that have raged over a millennia, and the state that has managed to control both sides of the Kirk Straits has reaped great economic rewards from doing so as the sea is a vital trade artery. As the world has discovered in recent months, Ukraine is vitally important for two other reasons. It's one of the largest suppliers of sunflower oil and grain in the world. In fact, it's the biggest supplier of sunflower oil on the planet, and the nation provides a whopping 40% of the World Food Program's wheat supply. Thanks to the war, both of these badly needed foodstuffs have been threatened, leaving populations in developing nations under threat of famine and starvation. The situation had become so serious that eventually Russia was forced to allow the shipping of Ukrainian grain via Turkish proxies bringing much-needed food relief to places such as Africa. If Russia were to control Ukraine, it would be in control of a significant amount of not just the world's energy supply, but also its food supply. This would put Russia in a position of considerable leverage over Western nations it currently sees as rivals by putting pressure on two different critical areas, food and energy. Already, Russia has attempted to deny exports of Ukrainian wheat so as to influence global opinion against the West, having some success in turning public opinion in developing nations against the Western powers and attempting to leverage this pressure to ease sanctions on itself and halt supplies of weapons to Ukraine. To many suffering from food security issues, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a European matter that shouldn't affect them, and the West is seen as making a bad situation worse by leveraging heavy sanctions against Russia and providing weapons to Ukraine, both of which are extending the war and preventing food from being shipped through the Black Sea. Russia's control over the whole of Ukraine would inevitably see the West turn away from its reliance on Russia for not just energy but food as well. While this would be a very good strategic move, helping to erode Russia's own strategic advantages, it would inevitably result in higher food prices as demand for food from elsewhere skyrockets. It would also inevitably lead to the expansion of farmland across the West or in other nations, prompting great amounts of ecological destruction. Perhaps the greatest effect of a Russian annexation of Ukraine, however, would be dramatic reshaping shaping of the strategic picture in Europe itself. Russia would have returned a significant amount of former Soviet territory into the fold, and would be able to deploy forces to threaten NATO across the southern European plain. 
This would give NATO a much broader front to fight Russia on in case of a war and erode NATO's ability to launch deep penetration assaults that seek to end a war with Russia quickly. From bases in Ukraine, Russian forces could threaten a significant number of NATO airfields and military bases with long-range attack munitions as well. The greatest victory, however, would be psychological, as Russia throws off three decades of slow decay and proves to the world that it's once more a formidable global power. This would have immediate ramifications for neighboring states such as the Baltic countries, which Russia has made no secret it wishes were back under its fold. Faced with a dramatically evolved strategic picture, NATO might need to rethink guaranteeing the security of states it's already poorly capable of defending in case of war, granting Russia yet another major geopolitical victory. Now go check out This Is How the Russian War in Ukraine Ends, or click this other video instead.